Honourable members, the speaker. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament, direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Leader of the Opposition. Seek leave to move the following motion. That the Prime Minister be invited to attend in the House forthwith to explain to the House discrepancies that have come to light in relation to statements that he and the Treasurer made during question time yesterday that the financial modelling to substantiate their claim that Labor's $315 billion debt will be paid off in full by 2022 are contained in the budget papers, to explain subsequent reporting in the media of comments attributed to the Treasurer's office which now dispute their statements during question time, to explain to the House why the Australian people should have any confidence in a government that expects them to believe that government debt will be repaid by 2022 without any evidence or foundation for such a claim, to inform the House whether he has confidence in the Treasurer, who has lost control of the nation's finances and will not come clean with the Australian people as to the true state of the government's parlous financial state. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Speaker, I move that so order, much of standing. The leader of the order, the leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker, I move that so much of standing and sessional orders be suspended, as would enable the leader of the opposition to move the following motion forthwith: that the prime minister be invited to attend in the house forthwith to explain to the house discrepancies that have come to light in relation to statements that he and the treasurer made during question time yesterday, that the financial modelling to substantiate their claim that Labor's $315 billion debt will be paid off in full by 2022 are contained in the budget papers, to explain subsequent reporting in the media of comments attributed to the Treasurer's office, which now dispute their statements during question time, to explain to the House why the Australian people should have any confidence in a government that expects them to believe that government debt will be repaid by 2022 without any evidence or foundation for such a claim, yep. to inform the House whether he has confidence in the Treasurer, who has lost control of the nation's finances and will not come clean with the Australian people as to the true state of the government's parlous financial state. Mr Speaker, Order. what the we have seen— the member for Perth. I move the speaker be no longer heard. Order. The question is that the member be no longer heard. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Order. Lock the doors. The question is that the member be no longer heard. The ayes will pass the right of the chair, the nose to the left. Appoint the honourable members for Shortland and Werriwa tellers for the ayes, and the members for Riverina and Ryan tellers for the nose.
Order. The result of the division is I 73, no 62. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Is the motion seconded? The member for North Sydney. Handing the out member for North to Sydney will resume his seat. The member for Perth. The member for the member for North Sydney will resume his seat. The member for Perth. Member for Perth has moved that the member be no longer heard. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Country no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. One minute. <laughs> Members should remain in their seats unless they are leaving the chamber or they did not vote in the previous division or they are changing the vote, in which case they should report to the tellers. Lock the doors. The question is that the member be no longer heard. Members should have remained in their seats unless they had changed their votes. They did not vote in the previous division, in which case they should have reported to the tellers. Order. The result of the division is I 74, no 62. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition suspending standing and sessional orders be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. 
Division required? Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. One minute. The question is that the motion for the suspension of standing and sessional orders be agreed to. The ayes will pass the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Ryan and Riverina tellers for the ayes and the members for Werriwa and Shortland tellers for the noes. Order. The result of the division is I 61, no 75. The question is therefore negative. Would members please resume their seats quickly and quietly, and if they are leaving the chamber, do so quickly and quietly.
The clerk. Government Business Notice No. 1, Higher Education Support Amendment, 2009 Budget Measures Bill 2009. The Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister for Education. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and thank you for your uh, patience as I talk too much uh, to others in the chamber. Uh, Mr Speaker, I present the Higher Education Support Amendment 2009, Budget Measures Bill 2009, and the explanatory memorandum. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to higher education and research funding and for related purposes. The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I move that this bill be now read a second time. Mr Speaker, the government is launching a reform agenda for higher education that will transform the scale, potential and quality of the nation's universities and open the doors of higher education to a new generation of Australians. It's an integrated policy approach an approach that provides for structural change and improves the financial sustainability of our universities, an approach that guarantees quality in a system that delivers funding for growth and participation by students from all walks of life, and recognises the vital importance of research by our best and brightest. The bill amends the Higher Education Support Act 2003 to implement the Australian government's reform to the higher education system as announced in the 2009-10 budget. It responds to the review of Australian higher education, which affirmed that the reach, quality and performance of a nation's higher education system will be the key determinants of its economic and social progress. The bill also amends the Act to give effect to measures to address key findings and recommendations of the review of the national innovation system and the recent House of Representatives inquiry into research, training and workforce issues. It augments the existing Research Infrastructure Block Grant Scheme and introduces new measures to address the gap in funding for the indirect costs of research. This is one of a number of measures designed to provide the sector with certainty, to provide funding for better, both growth and improved quality and to reform an indexation formula that effectively cut public investment in the sector over time. With this bill, a decade of underfunding will come to an end. The national scandal of declining public investment in higher education as a proportion of gross domestic product will come to an end. The era of political interference and micromanagement by ministers and officials will come to an end. A new approach to higher education funded is needed uh, to higher education funding is needed, one that acknowledges the primary importance of students and their learning. The bill introduces the first stage of a new student-centred funding system for higher education, which will have an estimated cost of $491 million over four years. In 2010 and 2011, the cap on over-enrolment for Commonwealth-supported places will be lifted from 5 per cent to 10 per cent in funding terms. The limit on funding under the Commonwealth Grant Scheme for 2012 will be removed to reflect the fact that there will be no overall limit on the number of students that Table A higher education providers will be able to enrol from 2012 onwards. These are crucial steps towards a higher education system with students at the centre, where there is a Commonwealth supported place for every eligible undergraduate student accepted into a course at an eligible higher education provider. The student centred system will include a range of measures to ensure quality, address Australia's skill needs and the broader public interest, and support achievement of our higher education attainment ambition. This ambition is that by 2025, 40 per cent of all 25 to 34 year olds will hold a qualification at bachelor level or above. The bill introduces landmark measures to improve the rate of participation in higher education by students from a disadvantaged background. The bill amends the Act to provide for an increase in funding to address Australia's historically poor record in increasing participation by low SES students. The government has announced a commitment to ensure that by 2020, 
20 per cent of higher education enrolments at the undergraduate level will be, people, will be of people from a low SES background. This goal will be directly supported by the injection of additional funding for universities to support the low SES participation targets. The major barriers to increased higher education participation by students from low socioeconomic backgrounds include previous educational attainment, low awareness of the long-term benefits of higher education, resulting in little aspiration to participate, and the need for financial assistance, academic and personal support once enrolled. International experience shows that interventions or outreach in the early years of secondary schooling are highly effective in increasing the aspirations of students to attend university. The government has therefore allocated $108 million over four years for a new partnerships program to link universities with low SES schools and vocational education and training providers. The intention is to create leading practice and competitive pressures to increase the aspirations of low SES students to higher education. The government is putting in place systemic reasons for universities to be engaged with improving the quality of school education. Funding will provide schools and vocational education and training providers with links to universities, exposing their students to people, places and opportunities beyond the scope of their own experiences, helping teachers raise the aspirations of their students. Programs might include scholarships, mentoring of teachers and students, curriculum and teaching support, or hands-on activities run by university staff in schools. Once students from disadvantaged backgrounds have entered university, the likelihood of them completing their course of study is broadly similar to that of the general higher education population. Often, however, they require higher levels of support to succeed including financial assistance and greater academic support, mentoring and counselling services. The government has therefore allocated $325 million over four years to be provided to universities as a financial incentive to expand their enrolment of low SES students and to fund the intensive support needed to improve their completion and retention rates. The existing higher education equity support program will be replaced and incorporated into these new funding arrangements. Better measures of low socioeconomic status will be developed, which are based on the circumstances of individual students and their families, and performance funding will be based in part on how effective institutions are in attracting these students. The steps to improve low SES student participation will impact on and benefit Indigenous students. They are significantly underrepresented in our universities and face distinct challenges. The government will support a review of the effectiveness of measures to improve the participation of Indigenous students in higher education in consultation with the Indigenous Higher Education Advisory Council. At the same time, the government is also introducing major reforms to student income support to assist the access and retention of low SES students. The bill amends the Act to provide funding for the continuing elements of the Commonwealth Scholarships Program. Existing Commonwealth Education Cost Scholarship recipients will continue to receive the scholarship under current arrangements. Commonwealth Education uh, Cost Scholarships will be replaced by the Student Startup Scholarship of $2,254 in 2010 and indexed thereafter, which will be provided as an entitlement to all university students receiving income support and those under veterans schemes. The new scholarship will be funded under income support arrangements, so funding is not included in this Act. Existing Commonwealth Accommodation Scholarship recipients will continue to receive the scholarships under the current arrangements. Commonwealth Accommodation Scholarships will be replaced by a new relocation scholarship in 2010. This scholarship will assist youth allowance and AB study students at university who are dependents who have to live away from the family home for study, as well as independent students 
who are disadvantaged by personal and relationship circumstances. The relocation scholarship will provide $4,000 for students in their first year at university and $1,000 in each year thereafter and will be indexed. Indigenous students will continue to receive scholarships under the Commonwealth Scholarship Scheme in the future. A central feature of the reform agenda will be an increased focus on quality. This will be especially important in a period of expansion when institutions will need to attract students who have not traditionally considered going to university. The bill reflects the new arrangements for quality and standards which will be initiated during 2009-10, when work to establish a new standards-based quality assurance framework will commence. Funding under the Act for, Australian, for the Australian Universities Quality Agency will be replaced with new arrangements to support the development and establishment of the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency by 2010. Increased indexation will reap significant rewards in terms of participation and quality and will provide a valuable incentive to institutions to invest in their future development. It will also help to improve their financial sustainability. Revised indexation arrangements for all programs under the Act will commence in 2012, including grants for teaching and learning and research, the AusHelp maximum loan amount and the fee help borrowing limit. Maximum student contribution amounts will be subject to revised indexation arrangements from 2011, which will deliver increased revenue to universities. The bill will amend the Act to increase the maximum annual student contribution amount for students studying education and nursing units from the current national priority rate to the band one rate. The increase will apply to commencing students from 1 January 2010. Existing students will continue under existing arrangements. The Act already includes provision for the HECS HELP benefit to reduce eligible graduates' HELP repayments. The HECS HELP guidelines made under the Act will be amended to extend this benefit to graduates of initial teaching and nursing degrees who go on to work as teachers or nurses. This will apply to people who graduate from second semester 2009 onwards. The bill will amend the Act so that from 1 January 2010, students who receive an AusHelp loan will no longer incur a 20 per cent loan fee. The 20 per cent loan fee has limited the effectiveness of the loan program. The removal of the loan fee will assist universities in encouraging students to undertake part of, the part of their studies for their Australian qualification at an overseas institution. This will improve the productivity benefits to Australia of students undertaking overseas study. To ensure that Australia's reputation for quality remains high, this bill introduces new performance funding under the Commonwealth Grant Scheme. In 2011, this will be through conditional funding as they transition to increased indexation and new performance funding in 2012. It will ensure that Australia's reputation for quality teaching and learning remains high by providing universities with real incentive to ensure they are providing the best possible learning opportunities for students. In 2010, the government will work with the higher education sector to develop a robust set of performance indicators. The indicators will include measures of success for equity groups as well as measures of the quality of teaching and learning. Universities will be required to negotiate and agree on specific performance targets that are challenging but appropriate for their circumstances and that will contribute to the achievement of system-wide goals for participation and quality. From 2012, universities will receive performance funding if they meet their targets and agree to new targets for the forthcoming funding period. The Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency will provide an independent assessment of whether universities have met their targets. The bill also includes a new structural adjustment fund to support continuing transformation in the sector. The structural adjustment fund will be available to universities and will enable them to develop diverse missions. This funding will promote long-term sustainability in the sector 
by assisting individual universities in making strategic decisions about their future mission and ways to enhance their place in the new higher education environment. It will replace the existing diversity and structural adjustment fund. In particular, the new fund will lay the groundwork for the provision of more sustainable higher education in regional areas ahead of decisions being taken on a better model of long-term funding for regional delivery. The higher education sector will need to adjust to the new post-Bradley environment. The government will undertake further work to better identify the issues facing regional provision, taking account of changes in the operating environment, including the impact of the move to a demand-driven system. The government will consult with the sector in undertaking this further work. Universities play a pivotal role in the national research and innovation system through generation and dissemination of new knowledge and through the education, training and development of world-class researchers. The government will commit $512 million over four years for a new sustainable research excellence in universities initiative to address the gap in funding for the indirect costs of research. The new measure will augment the existing research infrastructure block grant scheme with the aim of raising the average support for the indirect costs of research to 50 cents per dollar of direct competitive grant funding by 2014. A second measure, joint research engagement, will complement the additional funding for the indirect costs of competitive grant funded research by transforming the existing institutional grant scheme into a funding stream more closely focused on collaboration between universities, industries and other end users. The bill will also, also amends the Act to increase funding for the Australian Postgraduate Awards and other research grants. The government has acknowledged the importance of supporting our best and brightest postgraduate students through its commitment to double the number of Australian Postgraduate Awards by 2012. Building on this commitment, the value of the Australian Postgraduate Awards stipend will be increased by more than 10 per cent, from $20,427 in 2009 to $22,500 in 2010. The bill moves funds currently delivered through the Improving the Practical Component of Teacher Education program to the Commonwealth Grants Scheme. This will increase the Commonwealth contribution amount for education units of study and remove unnecessary and time-consuming reporting requirements. The bill also moves from the workplace reform program, also moves funds from the workplace reform program into the Commonwealth Grant Scheme base grant. This will increase the Commonwealth contribution amount for all funding clusters. The bill amends the Act to account for the secession of the Learning and Teaching Performance Fund and the Workplace Productivity Program, which are being replaced by new funding arrangements. Measures in this bill are complemented by additional investments of $2.1 billion from the Education Investment Fund for Education and Research Infrastructure and $1.1 billion for the Super Science Initiative. These reforms are designed to support high quality teaching and learning, improve access and outcomes for students from low socioeconomic backgrounds, reward institutions for meeting agreed quality and equity outcomes, improve resourcing for research and investment in world-class tertiary education infrastructure. These investments are a strategy for future prosperity, educational excellence and social inclusion for the nation. I commend the bill to the House. <coughs> the debate must now be adjourned. I call the member for Parks to I, adjourn the debate. I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Government Business Notice Number Two: Social Security and Other Legislation Amendment, Australian Apprentice, Apprentices Bill, 2009. The Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I present the Social Security and Other Legislation Amendment, Australian Apprentices Bill 2009, and the explanatory memorandum. Call the clerk to read the title.
first reading a bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation, social security and veterans entitlements and for related purposes. Deputy Prime Minister. Okay. Uh, I move that this bill be now read a second time. Uh, the Social Security and Other Legislation Amendment Australian Apprentices Bill 2009 seeks to benefit Australian apprentices who are eligible to receive payments under two new Australian government programs, Skills for Sustainability for Australian Apprentices and Tools for Your Trade under the Australian Apprenticeships Incentives Program. This bill ensures that eligible Australian apprentices receive the full benefit of the payments without deductions. The bill makes minor adjustments to the Income Tax Assessment Act 1997, the Social Security Act 1991 and the Veterans Entitlements Act 1986 to exempt from taxation and treatment as taxable income payments made to Australian apprentices under the two programs. Tackling climate change and building a more environmentally sustainable base for Australian industry and the Australian economy are among the great challenges facing the nation. The programs that are the subject of this legislation represent significant steps to meet the growing demands for skills in sustainability. In addition, the bill provides essential support for the Australian apprenticeship market in preparation for economic recovery. Skills for Sustainability for Australian Apprentices is an outcome of the Australian 2020 Summit and aims to accelerate industries and the tertiary education sector's response to climate change by providing practical incentives for industry to focus on developing skills for sustainability. The Rudd government is working to transition Australia into one of the world's leading green and sustainable economies. This will mean not just developing new technology, it will also require new ways of learning and applying skills in the obvious fields like energy, building and construction, automotive and engineering, but also in service areas like hospitality and tourism, where even greater effort is needed to minimise environmental costs. The incentives contained in these skills for sustainability measures are designed to encourage employers and Australian apprentices in selected national skills need list occupations to undertake a threshold level of sustainability related training. The goal is to develop an appropriately skilled workforce that can meet the rising demand for sustainable buildings, technologies and industries. The program delivers a personal benefit payment of $1,000 to eligible Australian apprentices in selected occupations following completion of the required level of sustainability related training. The program is an essential investment to develop a workforce ready to implement the energy efficiencies essential to the carbon pollution reduction scheme and to take advantage of the new business opportunities likely to open up as a result of Australia's leadership in meeting the global carbon challenge. The Rudd government is building an environmentally sustainable economy through the CPRS, the man mandatory renewable energy target, the clean energy initiative, solar flagships, investment in green buildings, insulation and solar hot water incentives. These and other measures being taken by governments, businesses and individual households are placing new demands in Australia's vocational education system. The nation's apprentices will need to be skilled in new ways, with new and more integrated knowledge about the environment being required alongside traditional trade skills. This program will add to work currently being undertaken by my department on research into the workplace impacts of climate change policies, the development of training resources in key industries likely to be affected by climate change, a voluntary certification program to recognise registered training organisations that provide vital training in skills for sustainability and the encouragement of excellence through green training awards. The Tools for Your Trade payment within the broader Australian Apprentices Incentives Program combines into the one new payment three administratively complex programs previously available to Australian apprentices the Tools for Your Trade voucher program, the Apprentice Wage Top-Up and the Commonwealth Trade Learning Scholarship. The new payment comprises five cash payments totalling $3,800 over the life of the Australian apprenticeship. 
The new tools for your trade payment represents a substantial improvement on previous arrangements for both Australian apprentices and their employers. Unlike the previous arrangements, Australian apprentices, oh, sorry, under the previous arrangements, Australian apprentices were required to claim the three payments from two different providers. As each of the programs had different eligibility criteria, Australian apprentices in the same occupation may have received different levels of financial support based on criteria outside their control, such as their age or the size of their employer. The new Tools for Your Trade payment addresses these inequities and inefficiencies. The streamlined delivery arrangements also remove unnecessary red tape. The new payment replaces the previous Tools for Your Trade voucher initiative, which provided vouchers to purchase a toolkit worth up to $800 for eligible Australian apprentices. By replacing this program with the new Tools for Your Trade cash payment, Australian apprentices will still be able to acquire the tools needed during their training, but without the limitations imposed by the previous program. They will receive critical financial support across the life of their Australian apprenticeship, assisting apprentices to secure their livelihood and to remain in their trade. For commencements from 13 May 2010, the Tools for Your Trade voucher will cease to exist. Transitional arrangements will be put in place to ensure that Australian apprentices who commenced on or before 12 May 2009 and who have not yet received their toolkit will still be eligible for a toolkit at their three-month point. The new Tools for Your Trade payment program will include agricultural apprentices and trainees and, if in a rural and regional Australia, horticultural apprentices and trainees. The Tools for Your Trade payment is one of a range of measures for Australian apprentices and their employers representing an investment by the Australian Government of $5 billion in apprenticeship and related programs over four years. Ensuring the apprenticeship rates are maintained and that more apprentices complete their training during this time of global recession is a key goal of the Rudd Government. We know that failing to invest in skills today will lead to shortages and lost opportunities tomorrow. The measures in this bill will provide support and stability to the Australian apprenticeships market and ensure that we continue to build a strong national <coughs> skills base as Australia recovers from the global recession. It should be noted that the amendments proposed in this bill are consistent <coughs> with the taxation treatment of previous programs that deliver personal benefit payments to Australian apprentices. This measure, combined with other initiatives that support development of Australia's skills base, represents a significant step in preparation for the economic recovery. I commend the bill to the House. The debate must now be adjourned. The member for Parks. I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I call Lee Clark. Government members notice. Government Business Notice No. 3, Health Insurance Amendment Extended Medicare Safety Net Bill 2009. I call the Minister for Health and Ageing. I present the Health Insurance amended, Amendment Extended Medicare Safety Net Bill 2009 and the explanatory memorandum. The clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the Health Insurance Act 1973 and for related purposes. The Minister for Health and Ageing. I move that this bill now be read a second time. This bill amends the Health Insurance Act 1973 to enable the Minister for Health and Ageing to determine by legislative instrument the maximum benefit payable under the extended Medicare safety net for each Medicare benefits schedule item. This bill will result in savings of more than $450 million over four years. The Medicare safety net provides individuals and families with an additional rebate for their out-of-pocket Medicare, uh, out-of-hospital Medicare services once an annual threshold of out-of-pocket costs is reached. Out-of-hospital services include GP and specialist attendances and services provided in private clinics and private emergency departments. Once the relevant annual threshold has been met, Medicare will pay 80 per cent of any future out-of-pocket costs for out-of-hospital services for the remainder of the calendar year. In 2009, the annual threshold for concession card holders and people who receive Family Tax Benefits Part A is 
um, $5.70. For all other singles and families, the annual threshold is $1,111.60. These thresholds uh, amounts are indexed each year by the Consumer Price Index on 1 January each year. This bill makes an amendment to the safety net program that was introduced through the Health Legislation Amendment Medicare Act 2004. At the time that the Act was introduced to the Parliament, the stated purpose of the safety net was, and I quote, to protect all Australians from high out-of-pocket costs for medical services provided out of hospital. We now have evidence that the safety net is not meeting this purpose in particular cases. As required under that Health Legislation Amendment Medicare Act 2004, I have tabled the Extended Medicare Safety Net Review Report 2009, a review of the operation, effectiveness and implications of the safety net conducted by the Centre for Health Economics Research and Evaluation at the University of Technology in Sydney. The report notes that the safety net has helped patients that have very high costs and has reduced the out-of-pocket costs for some patients with cancer. Nonetheless, the review showed that there are some concerns in areas such as obstetrics, assisted reproductive technology, including IVF, and other Medicare services. The report noted that around 50 per cent of safety net benefits are paid for obstetrics and ART, and that Medicare benefits have more than doubled for both of these groups since the safety net was introduced, and a significant proportion of this increase in expenditure is because of increases in the fees charged. The review noted that between 2003 and 2008, the fees charged by obstetricians for in-hospital services reduced by 6 per cent, whilst the fees charged out of hospital increased by 267 per cent. Similarly, the fees char charged for ART fell by 9 per cent for in-hospital services, whilst the fees charged for out-of-hospital services increased by 62 per cent. This indicates that some doctors are taking advantage of the safety net as their fees for out-of-hospital services have increased far in excess of the fees they are charging for in-hospital patients. Before the introduction of the safety net in 2004, there was a limit on the amount of government contribution for Medicare services, that is the Medicare schedule fee. The safety net fundamentally changed these arrangements by essentially removing this limit by covering 80 per cent of out-of-pocket costs for out-of-hospital services, regardless of the fee charged by the doctor. The unlimited nature of the benefits available through the safety net has led to some doctors taking advantage of the safety net to increase their fees with the knowledge that the majority of the cost would be funded by the government. This has had the effect of increasing the fees being charged to many people for some services, thus increasing the cost for those people who have not qualified for safety nets, as well as the cost to the government. The safety net benefit is for the patient. It's not intended to subsidise the fee increases of doctors. The review identified that for some Medicare services with high out-of-pocket costs, the safety net benefit is not going to its intended purpose. For these services, the review found that for every safety net dollar that is paid, 78 cents was being spent on meeting doctors' higher fees rather than reducing out-of-pocket costs. Services in this category include one type of varicose vein treatment, one type of cataract surgery, injection of a therapeutic substance into an eye and some ART services. This bill will enable the Minister for Health and Ageing to determine the maximum benefit that will be paid under the safety net. The level of the safety net benefit cap for each selected item will be set out in a legislative instrument. It's necessary for the level of the safety net benefit cap to be set out in a legislative instrument to allow the government to be responsive to change in circumstances that impact on the safety net. This instrument will be a disallowable instrument and therefore subject to parliamentary scrutiny. For the benefit of the parliament, I am tabling the draft legislative instrument and the draft explanatory statement that I intend to introduce as, the bill, as soon as the bill is passed, and I'll table that at the end of my speech. It's important to note that the safety net benefit caps for artificial reproductive technology are based on the current MBS item structure. These items, however, will be restructured to align the Medicare items which the phases of treatment um, in an ART cycle and spread the cost for ART across the treatment cycle. Once this restructure is finalised, the new caps will be introduced through a second instrument. The items that will be capped under the measure announced in 2009-10 budget are obstetrics, ART services, hair transplantation, 
the injection of therapeutic substance into an eye, one type of varicose vein treatment and one type of cataract surgery. This measure also includes funding to increase the MBS rebates of 15 obstetrics services at a cost of $157.6 million over four years, which will assist patients with their out-of-pocket costs. The government will also be investing $120.5 million over four years through a maternity services reform package to provide greater choice for women, whilst maintaining Australia's strong record of safe, high-quality maternity services. As part of this package, Medicare items will be introduced for midwifery services. The safety net benefit caps will also apply to uh, midwife services to ensure consistency in the treatment of Medicare-funded maternity care. The safety net benefit cap will apply to the individual MBS items and would be a payable in addition to the standard Medicare rebate. Each person will be eligible to receive up to the safety net benefit cap each time they receive that service. A different level of uh, safety net benefit cap can apply to different MBS items. The safety net benefit cap would be a dollar value. For example, a safety net benefit cap of $100 may apply to one item and a safety net benefit cap of $500 might apply to a different item. The level of the safety net benefit cap will be publicly available. This will ensure that doctors and patients will have certainty in relation to their Medicare entitlements. Every person is still eligible for a safety net benefit. All services currently covered by the extended Medicare safety net will remain covered by the extended Medicare safety net. The total out-of-pocket costs incurred by a person for these services will still count towards the extended Medicare safety net threshold amount. And once a person has reached that safety net threshold, they will continue to be eligible to, see, to receive safety net benefits equal to 80 per cent of their out-of-pocket costs for all other safety net eligible services. This maintains the government commi government's commitment to re retain the extended Medicare safety net for all out-of-hospital Medicare services. In 2008, expenditure on the safety net was $414 million, 30 per cent more than in 2007. Unless we ch make these changes now, this expenditure will continue to grow rapidly and uh, the bill creates a mechanism by which the government can responsibly manage the expenditure of the safety net. This is important for supporting the, su the sustainability of the safety net so that singles and families can continue to receive this additional assistance for their out-of-pocket costs. Um, I present the draft copies of the Health Insurance Extended Medicare Safety Net Determination 2009 an explanatory statement. As I noted during my speech, these are drafts that are being made available for the benefit of the parliament. Member for Parks to adjourn the debate. I move that the debate be adjourned. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Um, Private Health Insurance National Joint Replacement Register Levy Bill 2009. I call the Minister for Health and Ageing. I present the Private Health Insurance National Joint Replacement Register Levy Bill 2009 in the explanatory memorandum. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act to impose levy on sponsors of joint replacement processes. The Minister for Health and Ageing. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I move that this bill now be read a second time. The Private Health Insurance National Joint Replacement Register Levy Bill 2009 will impose a levy on joint replacement prostheses sponsors in order to fund the National Joint Replacement Registry. The registry collects information about joint replacement surgeries, such as hip, knee, ankle, shoulder, wrist and spinal disc replacement procedures, and reports on the safety and quality of these procedures and devices used in the operations. The work of the registry is critical to improving health outcomes for many Australians. Around 70,000 people had joint replacement surgery in the last 12 months. The registry estimates that the information it's provided has improved surgical practice, reducing the number of unnecessary revision surgeries by 1,200 Australians per year. In addition to the improved patient outcomes, the registry estimates that it saved the health sector and consumers around $44.6 million based on reductions in the level of hip and knee revision procedures while the registry has been operating. The average costs for revision procedures are much higher than for standard joint replacements, and the registry helps in minimising revisions by collecting the data indicating which devices are linked to the higher revision rates. 
This assists orthopaedic surgeons in selecting better performing prostheses. Expenditure on hip and knee prostheses represents around 30 per cent of total expenditure by health insurers on prostheses. Insurers paid over $1 billion in benefits for prostheses in 2007-08, out of a total $7.4 billion spent on hospital benefits in that year. This means that the prosthesis expenditure represents around 15 per cent of privately insured hospital benefit outlays. The registry assists in ensuring this funding and pu public hospital expenditure is directed towards better performing products with lower revision rates. Taxpayers have met the operating costs of the registry for over 10 years, which are now around $1.6 million a year. It's appropriate that manufacturers and importers of medical devices used in joint replacement surgery now fund the costs of the registry. The new cost recovery arrangements will be similar to the funding arrangements for the United Kingdom's National Joint Registry, which is funded through a levy on joint replacement products. The Australian Registry provides invaluable post-market surveillance of joint replacement prostheses, and this monitoring of the safety and quality of devices provides considerable benefit to the industry by improving consumer confidence in the safety and efficacy of joint replacement devices, as any devices showing high failure rates can be identified quickly and promptly and removed from the market. The data produced by the registry also assists the industry by informing the development of new prostheses, allowing manufacturers to draw on reliable performance information for existing products and designs. The introduction of cost recovery arrangements will also produce $5 million in budget savings over four years. Legislative cost recovery arrangements will ensure continuing and stable funding for the critical work of the registry and ensure that it can continue to provide data to improve patient outcomes. The proposed arrangements will preserve the independence of the registry, as levies will be imposed under legislation and collected by government on behalf of the registry. There will be no possibility of funding being withdrawn from the registry by medical devices sponsors who are not happy with its findings. The bill imposes a levy on sponsors of um, joint replacement prostheses. A joint pr replacement prosthesis is a prosthesis that is listed on the Commonwealth Prosthesis List. <laughs> and which is used in joint replacement surgery. The person who made the application to have uh, a joint replacement prosthesis list on, listed on the prosthesis list will be the sponsor for the purposes of the new levy. The bill requires that the levy be paid on the days to be specified in the private health insurance national joint replacement register levy rules and on additional days if any are determined by the minister. The bill restricts the number of times a levy can be imposed to a maximum of six levies in any financial year. Sponsors will be levied on each day specified in the rules to be known as a National Joint Replacement Register Levy Day. A maximum of four levy days per, per financial year are permitted by this method. Also, the minister can determine supplementary levy days. A maximum of two supplementary levy days per, per financial year are permitted. Sponsors will be levied according to the number of joint replacement prostheses they sponsor, and the levies will only be used to fund the operating costs of the registry. <coughs> Excuse me. The bill provides that there may be different rates of levy for one or more kinds of joint replacement prostheses, that the levy rate may be set at zero, and that there will be a maximum levy rate of $5,000 per listing. This range of the levies is appropriate. Excuse me. Excuse me. The range of levies is appropriate as there is a very wide range of products included in the registry, from screws and bolts that have a price of less than $50 each to specialised knee replacement systems, which can have prices of more than $67,000. The government will determine the amount of levies through the rules made under the legislation following consultation with the registry and the medical devices industry. And I commend the bill to the House. I call the member for Dunkley to adjourn the debate. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I move that the debate be adjourned. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I will call the clerk. Notice number four, Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme Amendment, Household Assistance Bill 2009. The Minister for Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I present the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme Amendment Household Assistance Bill 2009 and the explanatory memorandum. The clerk.
first reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security, family assistance, veterans affairs, military rehabilitation and compensation and taxation and for related purposes. The Minister for Health and Ageing. Sorry, sorry, the Minister for Families, Housing, <laughs> Community Service and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you. I move that this bill be now read a second time. This bill delivers on the government's commitment to assist low and middle income households with the expected increases in the cost of living arising from the introduction of the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme. Climate change threatens Australia's way of life and our future prosperity. Australians want action on climate change, and that's why the government has moved to introduce the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme. It will allow economic growth without growth in total emissions. However, the introduction of the scheme will have a modest impact on the cost of living for households. That's why the government is providing low- and middle-income households with upfront assistance to adjust to the impacts of the scheme. Through a package of cash assistance, tax offsets and other measures, the government will help these households maintain their standard of living while moving to a low pollution future. This bill delivers on the government's commitments given in the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme white paper that, and, I'll, and uh, I'll now set out the uh, commitments, that pensioners, seniors, carers, veterans, people with disability, the unemployed, students and other allowees will receive additional support above indexation to fully meet the expected overall increase in the cost of living flowing from the scheme. Thank you. Low-income households will receive additional support above indexation to fully meet the expected overall increase in the cost of living flowing from the scheme, and middle-income households will receive additional support above indexation to help meet the expected overall increase in the cost of living flowing from the scheme. The assistance in this bill delivers on these commitments. This bill takes account of changes to the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme announced on 4 May 2009 that introduces an initial $10 per tonne fixed carbon price in 2011-12 and a flexible carbon price in 2012-13. The composition of the household assistance package reflects this staged approach. The bill also takes account of other policy changes in the budget principally the government's secure and sustainable pension reform, which will affect how assistance is paid. The Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme will see a modest increase in the overall cost of living as we start to recognise the costs of carbon pollution in our everyday lives. It's anticipated that the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme will result in, increase in the, increases in the cost of living of 0.4% in 2011-12 and 0.8 per cent in 2012-13, resulting from an, in an initial $10 per tonne fixed carbon price in 2011-12 and a flexible carbon price in 2012-13. For many households, government payments only represent a share of their income. Therefore, increasing payments in line with headline consumer price in 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 index impacts alone will not fully restore their standard of living following the, following the introduction of the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme. To adequate, adequately compensate these households, compensation needs to go beyond the average household consumer price index impact. To ensure fairness, household composition has also been taken into account in designing the assistance. This household assistance will be funded from the sale of carbon pollution permits. The government has committed to use every cent raised from the introduction of the scheme and the, and the sale of carbon pollution permits to help households and businesses adjust to move Australia to the low pollution economy of the future. The measures contained in this bill will increase the amount of certain social security and veterans affairs pension and allowance payments by 2.8 per cent over two years. This includes a 1 per cent increase from 1 July 2011 and a further 1.8 per cent increase 
on 1 July 2012, including upfront inde indexation. These payment increases include the bring forward of the expected consumer price index related indexation increases that will automatically flow from the scheme's introduction. <coughs> These indexation increases are expected to be 0.4 per cent in 2011-12 and 0.8 per cent in 2012-13. The 0.4 per cent expected indexation increase for 2011-12 will be brought forward and paid from 1 July 2011. The 0.8 per cent increase in the expected indexation increase will be brought forward and paid from 1 July 2012. Because assistance for the cost of living increase provided through certain payments will be brought forward, subsequent indexation arrangements will be adjusted to avoid duplicate assistance. These increases will apply to a range of income support payments, including the age pension, carer payment, veteran service pensions, disability support pension, New Start allowance, youth allowance, parenting payments, and the special benefit. A list of affected payments is, include, is included in the bill. <coughs> me. Similar to pension and allowance increases, family tax benefit will be increased to help low and middle income families meet the expected overall increase in the cost of living flowing from the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme. The increases to family tax benefit will include the upfront payment of the expected automatic indexation increases that will flow from the scheme's introduction. These automatic increases are expected to be 0.4 per cent in 2011-12 and 0.8 per cent in 2012-13. Subsequent indexation points for family tax benefit payments will be adjusted to avoid the duplication of assistance. The per child maximum standard rates of family tax benefit part A for under 16 year olds and the family tax benefit part A supplement will be increased by 2.8 per cent over two years in line with changes to pension, pensions and allowances. Per family standard rates of family tax benefit Part B and the Part B supplement will also be increased by 2.8 per cent over two years. Additional increases are also being made to the base rate of family tax benefit Part A to assist recipients of these payments. Adjustments will be made to indexation of family tax benefit Part A and Part B rates on 1 July 2012 and 1 July 2013 and over further indexation points if necessary to prevent duplication of the amounts brought forward on 1 July 2011 and 1 July 2012. A new family tax benefit combined end of year financial supplement will be created for families eligible for, for both family tax benefit part A and part B where the main income earner has income above 60,000 per year. The value of the supplement will be up to $240 per family in 2011-12 and up to $680 per family in 2012-13 and later years. The supplement will phase in at four cents in the dollar when the primary, in primary earner's income reaches $60,000 until the supplement reaches the maximum amount. The entitlement to this supplement will cease when a family's entitlement to family tax benefit Part A or Part B ceases. Assistance is also being provided through the tax system. These measures provide additional assistance to eligible low and middle income households through increases to the low income tax offset and various tax offsets for taxpayers who maintain a dependent. From 1 July 2011, the low income tax offset will increase by $150 to $1500, from $1,500 to $1,650. From 1 July 2012, it will increase a further $280 to $1,930. This will increase the taxable income up to which a taxpayer is entitled to an amount of low income tax offset to $71,250 for the 2011-12 income year 
and to $78,250 for the 2012-13 income year and later income years. These increases in the low-income tax offset will increase, in, will increase the income level above which senior Australians eligible for the senior Australians tax offset begin to pay tax. From 1 July 2011, eligible senior Australians will have no tax liability until their income reaches $31,474 for singles and $27,680 for each member of a couple. From 1 July 2012, eligible senior Australians will have no tax liability until their income reaches $32,948 for singles and $29,547 for each member of a couple. Adjustments will also be made to the Medicare levy thresholds for senior Australians. Measures for households include assistance to eligible adults who maintain a dependent. These increases will apply to the de dependent spouse offset, the child housekeeper offset, the invalid relative offset, the parent parent-in-law offset and the housekeeper offset. From 1 July 2011, these dependency offsets will increase by $60, while from 1 July 2012 they will increase by $105. These increases will be in addition to the annual increases in these offsets that occur due to automatic indexation. A carbon pollution reduction transitional payment will be payable for each of the 2011-12 and 2012-13 income years to independent adults in low-income households who can show that they have not been assisted in line with the government's commitments. The amount of the carbon pollution reduction transitional payment for the 2011-12 income year will be $200 per claimant and $550 per claimant in 2013. The carbon pollution reduction transitional payment will become payable to qualifying individuals for the first year from 1 July 2012 and will be assessed with reference to the individual's income in the 2011-12 financial year. The person will have until 30 June 2014 to lodge a claim for the 2012 Carbon Pollution Reduction Transitional Payment. The second year of Carbon Pollution Reduction Transitional Payment will be assessed with reference to the individual's income in the 2012-13 financial year and will become payable from 1 July 2013. A person will have until 30 June 2015 to lodge a claim to receive the 2013 Carbon Pollution Reduction Transitional Payment. Mr Deputy Speaker, the bill includes several provisions that enable legislative instruments to be made, providing for increases of payment rates and adjustments of subsequent indexation factors beyond those explicitly included in the bill. <coughs> Excuse me. These provisions have been included because of the interaction between this bill and forthcoming amendments to the social security and repra repatriation systems flowing from the government's secure and sustainable pension reform. The government proposes to pay carbon pollution reduction scheme household assistance to pensioners through the new pension supplement announced in the budget as part of the pension reform package. As this supplement does not yet exist in law, this bill cannot preempt its existence. The legislative instrument provisions allow this timing discrepancy to be addressed. In practice, the government intends that the legislative instruments are only a transition measure. It's proposed instead that a bill implementing the pension reforms will make substantive amendments to this current bill when enacted to reflect the structure of the new pension system following the government's pension reforms and pay the household assistance to pensioners via the new pension supplement. In the meantime, the legislative instrument provisions included in this bill will ensure that the government's commitments as set out in the white paper for the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme can be implemented regardless of Parliament's consideration of the pension reform legislation when that is introduced. The government intends the pension reform legislation to remove the relevant powers to create legislative instruments regarding payment amounts 
and mechanisms for pensioners, and these details are to be included in the primary legislation. Any legislative instrument that may possibly be made under these provisions will be subject to full parliamentary scrutiny in accordance with normal arrangements. Through the measures introduced by this bill, the government will provide upfront support to low- and middle-income households to help in adjusting to a low-pollution future. The government will update the household assistance package on the basis of any new information on the estimated carbon price before the scheme starts. Each year, the adequacy of this assistance will be reviewed in the context of, of the budget. I commend the bill to the House. Call the member for Dunkley to adjourn the debate. The debate be adjourned, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Tax Laws Amendment, Medicare Levy and Medicare Levy Surcharge Bill 2009. I call the Assistant Treasurer. Mr Deputy Speaker, I present the Tax Laws Amendment, Medicare Levy and Medicare Surcharge Levy Bill 2009 and the explanatory memorandum. Call the clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. I call the Assistant Treasurer. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move the bill now be read a second time. This bill will increase the Medicare levy low income thresholds for individuals and families in line with the increases in the Consumer Price Index. The low income threshold in the Medicare levy surcharge provisions will be similarly increased. These changes will ensure that low income individuals and families will continue to be exempt from the Medicare levy or the Medicare levy surcharge. The bill will also increase the Medicare levy threshold for pensioners below age pension age to ensure that individuals in this cohort do not have a Medicare liability when they uh, do not have an income tax liability. Those on low incomes are amongst the most vulnerable Australians, particularly in the, in the midst of this global recession, and the Rudd government is determined to make sure that these Australians remain exempt from the Medicare levy. The amendments will apply from the to the 2008-09 year of income and later income years. Full details of the measures in the bill are contained in the explanatory memorandum. I commend this bill to the House. The member for Dunkley to adjourn the debate. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I move that the debate be adjourned. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Call the clerk. Government Business Notice No. 5, International Monetary Agreements Amendment, Financial Assistance Bill 2009. The Assistant Treasurer. Mr Deputy Speaker, I present the International Monetary Agreements Amendment Financial Assistance Bill 2009 and the explanatory memorandum. The clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the International Monetary Agreements Act 1947 and for other purposes. Assistant Treasurer. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the bill now be read a second time. The International Monetary Agreements Act 1947, or the IMA Act, currently enables the Treasurer to lend money or enter into a currency swap with a country in support of an international monetary fund program. These arrangements were put in place by the former government in 1998 through the IMA Amendment Act 1998 with the purpose to establish a framework for the provision of financial assistance by Australia in support of IMF programs. The purpose of this bill is to extend the current arrangements to include support for the World Bank and Asian Development Bank programs. This will also allow Australia to enter into a standby loan agreement with Indonesia, as announced by the Prime Minister, on 10 December 2008. The Indonesian government has approached the World Bank, the, Australia, the Asian Development Bank, as well as Australia and Japan to seek assistance with budget financing. The global financial crisis is impacting on all countries and is having a very significant impact on many emerging economies. Australia's standby loan, which will form part of a World Bank-led package, is a support mechanism in case private capital markets become too costly or effectively closed to Indonesia in 2009 or 2010. The World Bank has worked closely with Indonesia and other development partners, as well as liaised with the IMF throughout the preparation of the loan arrangement. The standby loan would only be drawn upon if certain triggers and criteria are met. The loan, if activated, will be paid back in full at an appropriate rate of interest. There is no certainty that Indonesia will need to draw down on the loan. 
However, it is in Australia's national interest to be able to assist should the situation deteriorate. If drawn on, the loan would be used to help support Indonesia's budget and in doing so support economic growth and stability in Indonesia. Continued growth in emerging and developing economies is important for global recovery and therefore recovery in the Australian economy. Australia has had substantial direct trade and investment with Indonesia and ensuring that Indonesia's continued economic growth and stability will, will benefit Australian exporters and jobs. Supporting stability and economic recovery, particularly in our region, is an issue on which there is an established history of bipartisanship. When the former government introduced the 1998 IMA Amendment Bill, it noted that the government's decisions to provide support reflect the importance of the economic and political stability in the region for Australia and the Australian economy. It's important that governments are able to act swiftly in such circumstances to help mobilise international support to deal with a crisis and provide commitments on our own participation. Consistent with the 1998 IMA Amendment Bill, this bill will allow Australia to continue to play its part in international cooperation efforts when necessary to safeguard and promote Australian national interests. In extending current provisions in the IMA Act to World Bank and ADB programs, this bill also extends the same important conditions currently contained in the IMA Act that currently apply to IMF programs. There must be a request for assistance by the World Bank or ADB to, for Australia's assistance. The agreement must also allow Australia to require repayment if the World Bank or ADB program is suspended or prematurely terminated. This is to ensure that assistance is provided only where a World Bank or ADB program is in place and continues to be adhered to by the recipient country. The Treasurer must be satisfied that other countries or international organisations will also be providing support to the recipient country as part of the World Bank or ADB program. This is to ensure that Australia's assistance under the bill is part of a multilateral effort. Consistent with the IMA Act, the bill provides for the Treasurer to release publicly and table in each House of Parliament a national interest statement relating to an agreement entered into under the bill. Statements will include a description of the nature and terms of an agreement and set out why it's in the national interest, having regard in particular to foreign policy, trade and economic interests. This bill ensures that Australia will be able to contribute to the World Bank and ADB financial assistance programs, and the provisions I've just outlined will ensure that assistance is only offered when it is in Australia's national interest. Further details of the bill are contained in the explanatory memorandum. I commend the bill to the House. The member for Dunkley to adjourn the debate. The, adjourn. the question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that have been say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Government, government business notice number six, Veterans Affairs Legislation and Budget Measures Bill 2009. Call the Minister for Veterans Affairs. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. I present the Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Budget Measures Bill 2009 and the explanatory memorandum. Call the clerk. Thank you. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to veterans' affairs and for other purposes. Call the Minister for Veterans Affairs. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, and I note your ongoing interest in these matters. I move that this bill be now read a second time. I am pleased to present legislation that further improves the operation of Australia's repatriation system. This is in line with the government's election commitment, demonstrated in successive budgets, to deliver better services and benefits to the ex-service community in Australia. Uh, this bill will introduce two budget measures that will assist veterans, members and their dependents and improve the effectiveness of the repatriation pension system. A third measure will assist members of the veteran and defence communities. The first budget measure will provide more convenient payment arrangements for Australian veterans, members and dependents who live permanently overseas. Current, currently, Veterans Affairs beneficiaries who live permanently overseas must have their Veterans Affairs payments paid into an Australian bank account, often incurring relatively high bank fees when transferring money internationally. In comparison, most other Commonwealth beneficiaries who live in overseas countries with reliable banking systems can receive their pension directly into an overseas bank account. In 2008, the Prime Minister made a commitment to review this inequity for members of the Australian veteran community living overseas. This budget measure will deliver on that commitment. The second budget measure will extend eligibility for the Defence Services Homes Insurance Scheme to persons eligible under the Defence Home Ownership Assistance Scheme Act 2008. 
The Defence Service Homes Insurance Scheme currently provides home insurance to eligible Australian veterans and members, peacekeepers and widows and widowers. This measure will extend eligibility for Defence Service Homes Insurance to those serving and former members and reservists eligible under the Defence Home Ownership Assistance Scheme introduced in 2008. This extension will provide eligible persons with access to cost-effective insurance designed specifically for the service and ex-service community. The final budget measure will cease payment of an outdated dependents' pension and will pay existing pension recipients a lump sum payment equivalent to three years of pension. Under previous repatriation legislation, certain dependents of veterans or members on disability pensions were eligible for a dependents' pension at a rate which reflected the rate of disability pension paid to the veteran or member. The maximum fortnightly payments are $8.42 for partners and widows and $2.86 for children. The minimum payments are $0.84 cents and $0.29 cents respectively. This small pension has been virtually frozen for many decades and new grants of the pension ceased in 1985. The purpose of the payment when it was introduced was to provide financial support to the dependents of veterans. Other government programs such as the partner service pension and social security payments now provide this support more effectively. The government will pay a one-off payment equivalent to three years of payments to current recipients. Entitlement to the dependents' pension will cease on 22 September 2009. We anticipate the lump sum payment will be made on 24 September 2009. The lump sum payment will be exempt from income tax. It should be noted that dependents' pensions that were granted on the basis that the person was without adequate means of support are not part of this measure. I also want to make it quite clear that existing war widow and widowers and orphans pensions are not affected by this measure. With a pension of such relatively low amount, the value of which will continue to erode over time, a three-year lump sum payment will be of greater use to many current recipients. The government is committed to maintaining and enhancing services and support to Australia's ex-service community. This legislation continues the progression we have made since coming to government to ensure that the support available through the Veterans Affairs portfolio is effective and equitable. The, the, the debate must now be adjourned. Member Dunkley. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. Move that the debate be adjourned. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Minister. Number seven. Social Security Amendment Training Incentives Bill 2009. I present the Social Security Amendment Training Incentives Bill 2009 and the Explanatory Memorandum. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the Social Security Act 1991 and for related purposes. Minister. I move now that this bill may be now read a second time. The Social Security Amendment Training Incentives Bill 2009 introduces two significant changes to the Social Security law arising out of the 2009-10 budget. These changes will encourage participation in study or training by job seekers with limited formal education and young people who are early school leavers. Early school leaving is of particular concern when we look at how this affects the transition of young people into further education and employment. When we compare the experience of working age Australians without the year 12, or a vocational qualification to people with these qualifications, we find that they are less likely to participate in the labour market and more likely to be unemployed. By age 24, only seven out of 10 young people without a year 12 or certificate three or four qualification were in further training or employment. By contrast, nine out of 10 young people with such a qualification were in further training or employment. In other words, the lack of qualification means a young person is almost three times as likely not to be in further training or employment. There is also a demonstrated link between higher educational attainment and significantly better wages, around $100 a week for each extra year of education for full-time workers. Education clearly delivers better opportunities for individuals and for their families. Early school, school leavers and people with low skills are likely to experience particular disadvantage both during the economic downturn and recovery. In times of economic downturn, we know that youth unemployment tends to rise rapidly and then fall back more slowly during the recovery. In the recession of the early 90s, 
young people without Year 12 were around three times more likely than their counterparts with Year 12 to not be in further education and to be unemployed. In fact, around one in three early school leavers was unemployed. This can result in youth unemployment remaining stubbornly high compared to the broader labour market. We need to act decisively to prevent those with low formal qualifications or skills being left behind. This is why the Council of Australian Governments agreed that governments needed to work together without delay to improve young people's connections to education and training. The initiatives in this bill support the government's commitment to improve the educational attainment level of Australians by encouraging completion of year 12 or equivalent and the commitment to unemployed Australians to provide improved access to education and training opportunities. The first component of the bill will give effect to the government's $83.1 million investment in a training supplement for certain recipients of New Start allowance and parenting payment. The supplement is for recipients who do not have a Year 12 or an equivalent qualification or have a trade or technical qualification that could be enhanced or upgraded. This measure will better equip recipients to find future employment. Job seekers meeting these requirements will receive an extra $41.60 per fortnight if they undertake an approved training or further education course of less than 12 months duration at the certificate level 2, 3 or 4th level. The training supplement will be available for people commencing this training between the 1st of July 2009 and the 30th of June 2011. This is a temporary measure to respond to the global recession. The training supplement will be available until any approved training commenced in this period is completed. It is estimated that over 50,000 low-skilled job seekers will be assisted over this period. The second element of the bill will introduce changes to the participation requirements for youth allowance. This will support the action agreed by the Council of Australian Governments on 30 April this year to increase and improve young people's participation in education and training. All governments signed up to a compact with young Australians. This is a commitment to give young people aged up to 25 years an entitlement to an education or training place for any government subsidised qualification subject to admission requirements and course availability. For 15 to 19 year olds, states and territories have agreed to fully implement this commitment by 1 July 2009. Young people will access this education entitlement through schools, TAFE colleges or registered training organisations. In some cases, they may also be referred to do a course through the Productivity Places program. At the same time, COAG agreed to introduce the National Youth Participation Requirement to commence on 1 January 2010. Under the National Youth Participation Requirement, it will be mandatory for young people to participate in school or equivalent institution until they complete Year 10. It will also be mandatory for young people who have completed Year 10 to participate full-time for 25 hours a week in education, training or employment or combined activities until age 17. Consistent with this, the Council of Australian Governments also agreed to bring forward the 90 per cent Year 12 or equivalent education attainment rate target from 2020 to 2015. To support these initiatives, the Commonwealth Government committed to making education and training a precondition for young people without Year 12 or the equivalent to obtain Youth Allowance Other and Family Tax Benefit Part A. The Social Security Amendment Training Incentives Bill 2009 will give effect to this commitment for Youth Allowance. The changes to Family Tax Benefit will proceed by way of separate legislation later in 2009. The changes in this bill will apply to young people who do not have Year 12 or an equivalent qualification. This is currently agreed by all jurisdictions to be a Certificate Level 2 qualification under the Australian Qualifications Framework. To receive youth allowance, young people will need to learn or earn. If they have not completed Year 12 or an equivalent qualification, they will need to either participate in education and training full-time or participate full-time that is generally for at, at least 25 hours a week in part-time study or training in combination with other approved activities.
They will need to do so until they attain Year 12 or an equivalent Certificate Level 2 qualification. The arrangements will be flexible to young people with complex needs. Young people with multiple barriers such as homelessness or substance abuse issues will have alternative ways in which to meet their participation and qualification requirements. Similarly, young people with a partial capacity to work or young parents will have their hours of participation tailored to their assessed capacity. The present legislative exemptions that deal with any difficulties a young person may be, must be, may be having, for example, alcohol or drug abuse issues or homelessness, will continue. Also, young people or young parents with a partial capacity to undertake study or training will have their hours of participation tailored to their assessed capacity. The amendments will apply to applicants for youth allowance from 1 July 2009. The new requirements will be progressively implemented for existing youth allowance recipients without year 12 or the equivalent between January and July 2010. Past economic downturns have taught us that young people and others with limited education and skills are particularly vulnerable to becoming unemployed over the longer term. The Training Incentives Bill provides too much needed measures to encourage people to continue to train and learn during periods of downturn so they are skilled for the recovery ahead. I commend the bill to the House. The debate must now be adjourned. I call the Honourable Member for Booth. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I move that the debate be adjourned. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Clark. Government Business Notice No. 8, Royal Australian Air Force Base, Edinburgh, Redevelopment, Stage 2. Parliamentary Secretary for Defence Support. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that in accordance with the provisions of the Public Works Committee Act 1969, it is expedient to carry out the following proposed work, which was referred to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works and on which the committee has duly reported. Expediency motion for the proposed RAF Base Edinburgh Redevelopment Stage 2 South Australia. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Department of Defence proposes to undertake Stage 2 redevelopment of RAF Base Edinburgh South Australia at an estimated outturn cost of $99.56 million plus GST. The main role of RAF Base Edinburgh is to provide maritime surveillance operations throughout Australia's airspace and operations related to information warfare. The project will provide improved infrastructure services, upgrade existing security for the base and provide new air side and domestic facilities to improve the overall capability of the base. In its report, the Public Works Committee has recommended that this proposal should proceed. Subject to parliamentary approval, construction will commence in the second half of 2009 and be completed in 2011. On behalf of the government, I would like to thank the committee for its support and I commend the motion to the House. There being no further debate, I'll put the question. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, that's carried. Right. Government business. Order of the day number one. Car dealership financing guarantee appropriation bill 2009. Resumption of debate on the second reading. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the honourable member for Macon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, last night when I was speaking on the car dealership financing guarantee appropriation bill 2009, just prior to the adjournment, I was referring to my understanding that several Mitsubishi dealers around Australia had been provided with temporary financing arrangements by Mitsubishi Motors Australia Limited. Those arrangements expire on the 30th of June this year, and uh, so it is important that this bill is passed and thereby provide those dealers with another financing option. Mr Deputy Speaker, the car dealership financing guarantee is just one of a number of measures that the Rudd government is taking to support the automotive industry. Another measure has been the small business tax break, which provides a 50 per cent tax concession for eligible asset purchases and the extension of that concession until December 2009. That concession provides a substantial incentive for small business owners to um, purchase a new vehicle for their business. In fact, Following the recent budget, 
the chief executive of the Federal Chamber of Automotive Industries, Andrew McKellar, said, and I quote, the tax break will help stimulate the new vehicle market and support jobs in the industry. Every plumber, every painter, every electrician, in fact every small business owner, is encouraged to take advantage of this offer. I encourage small business to bring forward purchasing decisions. It is not only tradespeople who will benefit, but, but um, all small businesses, um, including farmers, farm contractors and suppliers can all benefit and at the same time support their local auto dealer by taking advantage of the 50 per cent tax concession. Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to speak briefly now um, on, ab about General Motors Holden, who have their manufacturing plant in Elizabeth, adjacent to my electorate of Macon. Many of the people who work at General Motors Holdens live in the electorate of Macon. I personally know many of them, and I have visited the plant on several occasions. I understand how important it is to them to ensure that General Motors Holdens remains viable, and obviously, to remain viable, they need to sell cars. And I also understand that General Motors Holdens have announced that they will be building a four-cylinder car as part of their um, response to changes in the market. And with that announcement, it certainly has brought about a great deal more confidence and security for those families who depend very much on the production of those cars. But General Motors Holdens um, at um, Elizabeth is important for, also for another reason. In the northern suburbs of Adelaide, 25 per cent of the economy is based around manufacturing. That manufacturing base is heavily dependent on General Motors Holden being there not simply because they are direct suppliers to General Motors Holdings, because in many cases those operations are not direct suppliers, but indirectly the, the, having General Motors Holdings in the region underpins many of those other manufacturing industries. And so for the, for the benefit of the entire region and the state, it is important that we do what we can to ensure that the automotive industry remains viable in South Australia. In respect to that, I welcome the $6.2 billion announcement by the Rudd government made last year um, in, in support of the, motor vehicle, or the automotive industry around Australia, and in particular the, um, the allowance and support for the greener cars that will be made in the future. In fact, last year when Minister Kim Carr visited the GM plant to talk about the $6.2 billion new car plan for Australia, I accompanied him, as did the member for Wakefield, and we had discussions with employers, the, the heads of GMH, as well as a number of the employees that were on, on the shop floor. And uh, um, it was clear to me that they very much appreciated the support that this government was making to ensure that their jobs were going to be um, supported in whatever way was possible. I was also at the plant last year when the Prime Minister and Minister Carr again went out there to announce the $149 million support for the new four-cylinder car that will be manufactured at the Elizabeth plant. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Australian automotive industry employs around 63,000 people directly, and it is estimated that over 100,000, and probably more, depend directly on the industry for, for their employment. In fact, industries associated with the automotive industry, such as the steel industry, plastics, glasses, the glass industry and others, are all heavily dependent, in many cases, on the automotive industry. It is important to our national economy. The Rudd government understands that and, for that reason, has introduced a number of measures to support the automotive industry um, since coming to office. The Car Dealership Financing Guarantee Special Purpose Vehicle is another example of the Rudd government understanding the importance of that industry and supporting the automotive industry in Australia. Sorry. Have you completed your speech? Okay. Member for Dunkley. Sir, I draw your attention to the state of the House. Quorum required. Yes. Ring the bells.
Quorum present. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. I call the honourable member for Oxley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And, and can I once again just note for people either listening into the debate today or for, and for the Hansard record the disgraceful behaviour of the opposition. The member for Dunkley on a really important bill as, as such as car dealership financing guarantee to disrupt the proper processes of the House. To, you know, it's an abuse of the standing orders uh, and it's completely disgraceful behaviour in terms of the way they're abusing this place, abusing the standing orders of this place and trying to prevent members speaking on what is a really important bill. This bill is about making sure that the Australian economy continues to function properly and efficiently and it's about ensuring that car dealers actually have a business. Now, This is from a mob who claim to be the great supporters of small business. Well, I'm sure they're going to be very thankful to the member for Dunkley and the opposition, the Liberal and National parties, when we're here trying to actually pass legislation to support them, small businesses, car dealerships, and all that the opposition is interested in is disrupting the debate, is disrupting the passage of this bill. I've got plenty of time to get on with it, and I will, but the member for Dunkley and the member for Patterson are more interest in, interested in actually disrupting this debate and not letting us get on with it. Mr Deputy Speaker, car dealers, and, and here we go again, the member for Patterson abusing the, uh, the standing orders of this place. And for Patterson? Mr Speaker, on a point of order, um, the um, member has misrepresented. I haven't disrupted the House, but seeing he wishes me to There's do no so, point I, of order. Uh, the member thought, for no, no, I, uh, Patterson will resume his seat. Order, a further point of order? I draw your attention to the State of the House. Quorum required. Ring the bells. The Honourable Member for Oxley. Okay, Mr Deputy Speaker, can I just quickly do two things? One is commend you on your correct ruling that the, uh, there was no point of order, firstly. I can also uh, thank my colleagues for coming in here and spending the time to hear me speak on this very important bill. Um, the, real, the reality is that the opposition is only interested in disrupting a really important debate on what should be a core constituency for them, and that is supporting small business and, small, and supporting car dealerships not just in the big cities but in the remote and rural communities across Australia, in places uh, in my electorate such as Ipswich, 
uh, whether they be in Brisbane, Victoria, Queensland, wherever they are. These are, are fair income small businesses that are operating under very, very tough conditions, conditions which are no fault of their own. And they've been left uh, in a uh, perilous position, not just by the global financial crisis, but a perilous position by what I think is the unscrupulous behaviour of a number of financiers uh, worldwide and in this country that have refused to continue to provide the sort of liquidity, uh, liquidity that car dealerships need to continue on their business. Uh, and we're not talking about failing businesses, we're talking about businesses that are going concern, that have had long histories and good standing um, balance sheets where they've been more than able, more than capable and more than able to meet all of their liabilities and continue to do so. Uh, and I just find it apprehensive, um, completely, um, in fact, I find it completely outrageous the way that the behaviour um, of companies such as GE Money and GMAC uh, have treated some of their clients, who for some have been their clients for more than 20 years. So um, it, it, left us, it left this government, the Rudd government, in a position where we had to act uh, to fill in that gap and that void, and that's what this bill is about. The, the Oscar SPV, the Special Purpose Vehicle, is designed specifically to provide critical wholesale floor plan finance to eligible car dealerships to ensure that the departure of GE Money Motor Solutions and GMAC uh, and the liquidity challenges that confront also Ford Credit does not result in the closure of hundreds of otherwise viable car dealers across Australia, which would in turn result in thousands of job losses. This is a What's taken place in the past uh, six to 12 months has put an enormous amount of pressure on car dealerships, small businesses in a whole range of communities. Um, it's put a great deal of strain on their business and for some, uh, if action wasn't taken early, could have meant the, uh, the closing of those businesses and putting at risk uh, many, many jobs. The, the SPV initiative will protect jobs, and it's part of a broader strategy that this government's got in terms of supporting the economy, supporting the community and supporting small business uh, in this country. We are determined to meet all of those challenges. We accept the responsibilities uh, that we inherit as government in terms of where we find ourselves economically, uh, given the, the global financial uh, crisis. But you have to act. You have to act locally in terms of dealing with You have to protect jobs, support and maintain jobs. You have to provide the sort of economic stimuluses uh, that people need to ensure that they continue, can continue on with their uh, lives. You have to also provide mechanisms for small business, for medium enterprises and large uh, business through industry support to make sure they can continue to do what they do and in turn supporting jobs. And This is exactly what this uh, guarantee appropriation bill is all about. It is about ensuring, underpinning a vital sector of our economy. Now, you, you've heard uh, the previous speaker, the member for Wakefield, talk about um, talk about the broader industry support we've given to manufacturing, to the automobile industry, the $6.2 billion uh, car plan, the uh, green car uh, initiative that we've put into place. All of those key strategies, along with our economic security strategies, our stimulus packages, uh, what we've done. Uh, for pensioners across the country, what we've done in terms of schools, investing in schools, investing in jobs, investing in communities, uh, investing in manufacturing, training and education. Uh, and there was one sector left or one group of individuals that had been, uh, that had been particularly impacted by the global financial crisis, which wasn't really covered off in any other area, and, and that was the, the car dealers. Now, they fall into a special category. Uh, car dealers may appear on the surface for people looking uh, at them from the outside as though they may be quite wealthy or large businesses that, um, that involve um, massive turnover and make a lot of money for the owners. And look, in, in some cases that is the case, but generally speaking, uh, car dealers are a small business. They're a franchise business. Uh, and um, I've had some involvement now with uh, over a period of time in terms of franchising and understand some of the difficulties that franchisees uh, face on a day-to-day -day operation, uh, and I continue uh, to be out there advocating for franchisees and a fairer go for all people that are involved in franchising. And, and as such, 
uh, car dealers fall exactly into that category. Uh, car dealers are, are often held to ransom by the large auto groups uh, where they're compelled to spend millions of dollars in terms of a uh, showroom, a fancy glass chrome showroom, which is the expectation, and have massive sunken costs um, and find they have either little recourse in terms of a long-term contract or, or little opportunity to, to expand or diversify their business. Um, one of the problems they face is that they're, uh, not only are they uh, limited in their p potential to diversify, but they're also tied in through their financing of their floor plan uh, and often through the specific uh, dealership group that they're involved in or through one particular financing organisation, such as uh, G Money Motor Solutions, GMAC, and, um, uh, and as, as is relevant to this debate, Ford Credit as well. It really did leave car dealerships hanging in the air uh, for a period of time until we put forward our plan uh, the, the Oscar SPV, the special purpose vehicle, to ensure that um, car dealers actually had access to some finance uh, at reasonable rates and that it was possible for them to continue on their business. The government's actually been working with the four leading Australian banks, with the ANZ, the Commonwealth, the National Australia Bank and Westpac, and as well as other financiers, and to put in place an arrangement that can provide that critical wholesale floor plan finance to those eligible car dealers that were left stranded by the result, the exodus, um, and I'd say unprovoked uh, exodus from the Australian market of GE Money and, and GMAC. Um, the, uh, the facility that we're putting in place will be used to provide liquidity support for uh, 12 months to almost 200 Ford car dealerships uh, as a result of the liquidity pressure facing Ford Credit. Uh, and car dealerships generally cannot remain in business without a viable uh, floor plan financing arrangement. That's the bottom line. I don't know if people actually understand how that works, but for, uh, uh, and we are talking about new car uh, floor plans here, but uh, the way it works is that the dealership is compelled to actually purchase the cars to put them on the floor. They've already outlaid the money and they do it through a financing uh, plan. Uh, and it actually means that they carry a lot of costs, not only sunken costs in terms of their um, infrastructure expense, the, the showroom, the dealership itself, uh, they, they're on, they're continuing costs in terms of maintenance and staff, which are often very high numbers, uh, but also the initial purchase, the full purchase of the vehicle, which may sit on the lot for months, uh, hopefully not years, but given the current, uh, the, the current troubles that the auto manufacturing industries and all the, all the car manufacturers are facing globally, um, uh, some real serious issues in terms of um, turnover of vehicles in those particular car dealerships. I've had the good fortune of um, uh, knowing a number of uh, car dealers uh, and being friends with them and understanding their business, uh, not as well as they do obviously, but having some understanding uh, of the way they operate uh, and the tough uh, economic and cyclical circumstances they find themselves in. And while it's true to say that uh, in some good years they did do quite well uh, and they grew their businesses. They also with that grew a lot of jobs, uh, provided a substantial economic base for small communities, uh, particularly if we start talking about country areas and rural areas, uh, where sometimes one of the big employers in a small town will be the car dealership. And you don't, you don't get too much choice. If you travel around this country and, and go to some more remote and rural parts, you'll find that there may be just one if you're lucky, maybe two brands or dealers in a particular town. Uh, and so trying to support them, providing the mechanisms to support their survival, uh, making sure they have access to finance, making sure they continue on their business, I think is critical. Uh, and it's critical to those local community economies as well. We've been responsive to the needs of that particular segment of, of small business, as we have in a whole range of other areas. Uh, responsive uh, in, in how we've dealt with um, housing across the country and I know the Minister uh, is here and uh, very much put on the record my appreciation of the good work she's been doing, her department's been doing, to dealing one of the toughest problems we've got across this country of trying to get people into a home uh, and public housing 
and making some real investments, some real investments for the first time in a very long time that the Commonwealth decided that it was part of our responsibility to front up and do these things. Well, it's very much the same principle that applies to car dealers. And I'm very proud when I go out and talk to my community, talk about the programs we've put in place, about the sort of legislation and the mechanisms that we're providing to ensure that we don't just talk about, we don't just speak about you know, small business and medium enterprises and and talk about those things, we actually support them. We support them with real funding, with real programs, with real strategies, uh, with real things that will make a difference to their survival so they can get over this tough period. Because we will get over this tough period. We'll come out of it at some point soon, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. But we will come out of it at some point and we need to prepare uh, our economy for when that actually takes place. And that's um, what we're doing. Uh, and I've got to say, at this stage too, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I was listening to some debate yesterday from members of the opposition and I heard this so-called plan that they had, which to me sounded like a wish list. And um, I particularly refer to the member uh, for Patterson, who's here, and uh, he talked about a plan, uh, you know, world peace, in essence, you know, uh, goodwill to all men, uh, mankind. Uh, it, there's this grand plan but to me it just sounded like the sort of things you might do if you attended an international beauty pageant when they said, what do you want to achieve in your life? And it was, well, you know, I want world peace, travel the world and, and, and so on and so forth. I think people are pretty familiar with it. But to me it just didn't sound like a plan. It didn't have a, a, a road map. It didn't have a path or a strategy. It didn't have, yeah, and it didn't have a mechanism or some sort of vehicle to actually get there. You know, we all want world peace. We all want world peace, but you actually need a strategy and a plan to get there. You can't just say, my plan is world peace. Uh, so, you know, and, and I know I'm going to be interrupted again, even though Oxley I shouldn't be. will resume his seat. Member for Patterson. Mr uh, Speaker, I would ask you to bring the Speaker back to the actual uh, bill in question. He has no idea what he's talking about, but I think he should actually restrain his marks to the bill. Well, thank you, Member for Patterson. I'll listen very carefully. Thank you for the interruption and the debate which was out of order from the member for Patterson. Um, um, this member special... for Oxley must not reflect upon the chair. Uh, I'm certainly not reflecting on the chair. Was... You certainly were. And I can assure you I wasn't, Mr Deputy Speaker, but I'll accept whatever your ruling is. Thank you. The member for Oxley will resume his seat. Minister. Mr Speaker, the member for Oxley was re referring to the um, Shadow Minister opposite, I'm sure, rather than to you, and I'm sure he would never intend to reflect on the chair. But, um, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I would urge you, um, while uh, calling the member for Oxley to, um, to speak on the legislation, that you take account of the constant interjection that he's had from the other side of the chamber and call the interjectors to order. The minister well. needs to be a bit careful as well. I'm, I'm, I don't understand your comment. You're reflecting on me. Mr Speaker, it was certainly not my intention to reflect on you, and I would offer you an apology if you uh, understood it okay. in that way. I am asking, Mr, Mr Deputy Speaker, Mr. that Minister will resume your... her seat. The Minister will resume her seat. Member for Oxley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the financial impact of um, the, the bill that's before us um, is important to note uh, in this debate. Uh, the overall contingent liability for the Australian government is estimated to be at around $550 million, comprising around 45 per cent of the remaining GE and GMAC loan books and about 85 per cent of the Ford Credit loan book. Uh, it's important to note this. We don't expect that that uh, necessarily be the case, but uh, it is estimated to be at around that amount. Uh, the SPV will only be able to advance funds if it is satisfied that the dealership is a viable business. And I, I, again, I think that's a fair proposition in terms of us providing that security, that guarantee, and making sure we can use the good um, credit rating that the government has in terms of uh, providing assistance and liquidity uh, to car dealerships across the country. Uh, the terms of any loans must also be consistent with the usual commercial lending criteria of recognised finance providers. Uh, and at that point, particularly mentioned uh, the good work that Perpetual and also Credit Suisse will be doing in terms of being the managers of this uh, special purpose vehicle. Uh, in all, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is really good uh, legislation and really good policy. And while we're debating this particular bill today, the introduction of this uh, guarantee appropriation bill, it's probably also worthy to note 
uh, that we actually did move on this quite quickly. In fact, we did last year, 23rd of December 2008, to bring in the actual package. Um, and, uh, and earlier this year, in terms of providing the mechanisms for this to happen, again, this is more evidence of a government that is in touch and responsive to the needs of small and medium enterprise in this country as part of a national suite of measures to ensure that the economy continues to grow and that people have an opportunity uh, to do as best as they can. Uh, my view has always been, as is that of many people, business ought to get on with doing what it's doing time has and government expired. should be there to support. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the honourable member for Paterson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise today to speak to the Car Dealership Financing Guarantee Appropriation Bill of 2009. I'm going to spend a couple of moments reflecting on comments of the member for Oxley and his contribution on this debate. The member, for, the member stated that how uh, expeditiously this government had um, acted on this. Well, Mr Speaker, it is true that this was introduced um, at the, on the 2nd of, uh, January, uh, 1st of January this year. But, Mr Speaker, it is now the 28th of May. It is the 28th of May. So what we've had is this government guarantee of finance, and let's be very sure about this, the government guarantee of taxpayers' money to industry, and yet they've had five months to bring this legislation to the House. So that means that this legislation and the um, actions of this minister have been very, very tardy, tardy indeed. Now, there is no doubt that with the falling volume of sales that have occurred, um, that uh, some financial institutions have got very, very nervous about the motor vehicle market. In particular, the withdrawal of uh, GE Motor, Money Motor Solutions, a subsidiary of GE Money, um, which is a division of GE Capital, um, and uh, GMAC Australia um, from the motor vehicle or automotive and motorcycle finance business in Australia. It created a huge problem, created a massive problem. But, Mr Speaker, this problem, this problem was exacerbated by this government. This came about directly because of actions of the Rudd Labor government. When they rushed in and provided that unlimited deposit guarantee that a lot of money was stripped from financial institutions and locked into the banks. Locked into the banks. So what we've seen is we've seen a um, not market driven per se, but a government driven aspect of finances, readily available finances shifted into the banking sector because people wanted this ironclad, gold-plated uh, guarantee by the government, and by that I mean now the taxpayers, through the banks. This uh, special purpose funding vehicle has come about. It was initially set at $2 billion, and the current estimates are <clears throat> that it, the exposure will be more in the vicinity of $550 million will operate for about 12 months. The aspect of this is it's <clears throat> funded by the big four banks, and it, but it's guaranteed by the Commonwealth to provide finance to dealers unable to secure commercial finance. I should clarify <clears throat> at this point that this finance is not for consumers to buy motor vehicles. This finance is purely restricted to the financing of floor stock. And I've had discussions with motor vehicle dealers in my area, and without going into individual names, one of the most interesting comments came from one of the dealers. He said, well, we're paying too high, far too high an interest rate, which means we're making very little profit. Mr Speaker, this guaranteed um, finance is 2 per cent above the market rate. And he said if they don't sell the car within 30 to 40 days, the interest starts to rack up significantly at a rate we can't afford. As such this year, they have taken to having no new stock on the floor and only order it in when there is a direct request from customers to purchase a vehicle. Now I'm talking about a motor vehicle dealer in a regional and rural area. This is not the magic mile of motors where you have uh, endless streams of motor vehicle dealers and lots of floor stock. 
This is a small country area with a relatively small turnover in motor vehicles, and the cost of providing floor stock for display can be very expensive. But make no bones about it, these motor vehicle dealers need to be extra competitive in their pricing because of the deals that are offered by the magic miles of motors in the major cities. It's important, though, that this funding was put into place because otherwise what we would have had is a collapse of the motor vehicle industry. It would have meant that uh, with the um, failing sales in general and the lower manufacture, and in fact, if I look at some of the figures for motor vehicle sales, um, and I will quote from the uh, Federal Chamber of Automotive Industries, the new vehicle sales figures for April 2009, released on 5 May 2009, showed that 63,965 passenger motor vehicles, SUVs and commercial vehicles were sold in April 2009, a fall of 23.9 per cent when compared with the same month in 2008. The year-to-date total of 276,935 new vehicles have been sold, a fall of 20.3 per cent compared with that same period last year, suggesting annual sales of 840,000 for 209 compared with 1 million 12,164 in 2008. So not only are sales dropping, but it means that floor stock is sitting on the dealer's floor for much longer, and that in turn means greater cost to the dealers. Now, Mr. Speaker, um, this occurred, as I said, in part because of the government's mismanagement of the economy by rushing in to provide unlimited deposit guarantees to the banks. We've already heard that some of the finance institutions, not uh, um, GE Money or GMAC necessarily, but some of the other um, uh, smaller financial institutions, have actually locked up their capital and not allowing people to withdraw or shift their money to the banks because they would have faced a severe liquidity problem. So these are the issues that we have to deal with on this basis. But this is no different in aspect to the Rudd Bank. You see, the Rudd Bank was set up yeah. for failed overseas financial institutions. The Rudd Bank was set up to hold finance for toxic assets, in other words, huge office blocks and facilities in major cities. But this was not available to small to medium enterprises. This was put together with the banks with a government contribution, and again, that government contribution is the taxpayers of Australia. And a lot of those small to medium enterprises that pay their tax and fund the Rudd Bank, that fund this uh, OSCAR, as it's called, Special Purpose Financing Vehicle, do they have access to this sort of money? Well, let me tell you what is happening right now, right now out in the business community. You've got the building and construction industry, and one sector of it is flying along brilliantly because of the uh, the first homeowners grants, and I think that's a worthy um, contribution. But it's one sector. But a lot of the builders can't access the capital to actually enter into that market. So what's happening is you're getting a narrowing confine of people able to actually work in the construction industry because of the access to capital and finance to be able to do it. So where is this government's guarantee of finance to that sector of the industry? The other thing that um, the first homeowner scheme has done is actually inflate the market in a certain sector, in the first homeowner's finance sector, um, for the properties. Mr Speaker, uh, I think the oh. Minister. My apologies. Member for Patterson will resume his seat. Minister. Um, Mr Speaker, I noted earlier that you uh, asked the member for Oxley to um, focus on the content of the legislation before the House. I wonder if you would do the same. I will listen very carefully, Minister. Mr Speaker, I am directly correlating taxpayers' guarantee of financial institutions and the fact that this government has cherry-picked industries but not broadly supported capital requirements. And I'm providing the comparative analysis, and if indeed the minister had been listening, would have actually understood that. And I think she would have, she would have understood that uh, all industries need support, not just some industries. The assistant treasurer. So, 
What I'm saying, and the assistant treasurer, assistant treasurer, the, the assistant treasurer should have known better because actually this is part and parcel of his problem, because he was one of the people that led the charge to make sure that there was unlimited guarantees in the banks, which created a lot of this financial problem. But, Mr. Speaker, the development and building industry is suffering. Their loan facilities are being called in, and they're not being refinanced. Well, that's the equivalent of their floor stock as they deal with people in providing developments, schools, houses, industrial lots, job opportunities, and in particular in regional and rural areas. Where's their guarantee of financing? Where is their taxpayer funded through the four banks' guarantees? It's not there. But you know, these people pay their taxes too. And when this government, the Labor government, provides these guarantees, it's actually their money that they're providing the guarantee with to these other industries, and they just ask for a little bit of equity. And, we've, uh, and, and I'm not against the motor vehicle industry being supported, but I'd also like you to consider the marine industry. They just had the, uh, um, the boat show up at um, um, the Gold Coast. They have the same problem. They have floor stock that they need to put on the floor, and they need finance. Where is their guarantees? Where are their guarantees? They're not there. And it's no different to tourism industry that want to embark on new ventures or buy new equipment. I mean, this government has introduced uh, the original 30 per cent uh, um, accelerated depreciation for investment allowance and now up to 50 per cent of it's a smaller business. But the problem is people can't get the capital. And if you can't get the capital, you can have all the incentives you want, you can't commit with it. And one of the reasons they can't get the capital is because the banks want more and more and more guarantees. Now, constituents of mine say to me, if it's good enough for this government to use taxpayers' money to guarantee the finances of one industry, then why not them? Why do they have to wait until they're down on their knees? I mean, this government talks about how it's being proactive and decisive. Well, proactive and decisive when you're spending taxpayers' money collected from all taxpayers should be looked at supporting all taxpayers in their industry and development. So what I say to you, Mr Speaker, is that um, clearly this government does not understand where it's going in what it's providing here. And it's also no different for engineers and manufacturers. What about the support industries, the indirect industries in the motor vehicle industry, the people that provide the wiring looms, the seats, the panels, the accessories? Why aren't their capital requirements being guaranteed by the government? You see, when you cherry-pick sectors, what happens is you change the structural integrity of the market. And if you prop up one side of the market but not the other, you create a massive imbalance. So it's like being pregnant, to use the analogy. You can't be a little bit pregnant. You've either got to be in for the whole shot or you're not at all. And in the financing, can I say to you, the problem is they've created this imbalance. Now, the coalition has said that we will support this um, because it's important that we find a way through this economic crisis. The one key measure that has been left out of all this and the way the government's dealt with all this financing is it has done absolutely nothing to instil confidence in our economy, instil confidence in our community because the confidence in the leadership of this nation is rapidly diminishing. The government can spend all the money it wants. It can create all the guarantees it wants at the expense of the taxpayer. But unless this government drives confidence in the marketplace, confidence in the community, confidence so they can invest, and confidence in finance companies, you know, what's going to happen is we're going to get into a situation where finance companies are going to keep tightening up, banks are going to keep tightening up because of risk profiles. And they're going to keep tightening up to the extent where the government will have to step in and provide more guarantees. What they have started here is an avalanche of underwriting capital requirements in Australia. An absolute avalanche. And mark my words, we'll be coming back here over the next few months with another industry on its knees that can't get finance, and this government say, well, Let's underwrite this. Let's guarantee this. Let's provide vehicles. And that will continue to distort the market because of that initial step taken by this government when it rushed in, didn't consult with the, uh, 
coalition, didn't sit down and have a consensus opinion, didn't even listen to the people in his 2020 summit, which he made great fanfare about listening to the greatest minds in Australia, but rushed in and created a situation which is now having a downstream avalanche effect on the finance industry. So we'll be back here regularly. There will be many bills providing financial guarantees for many industries through finance, and I think that that is the issue that we need to address. So I say to the government, you're going down this track. How are you going to explain to all those other industries that you're not prepared at this stage to underwrite them? What are you going to say to them? What are you going to say to all those people that become unemployed because you started an avalanche for which now they are paying for? And always remember, as you go down this area of all the guarantees and the cash handouts, that it's not your money in total. It's actually the people up in the galleries, the taxpayers of Australia, the kids that are up in the uh, upper galleries. It's their money and their future money that you're handing out and playing with, and they expect nothing less than for you to be somewhat responsible in the administration of their finances. We've said we'd support the bill, and we'll do that. But I think you need to think long and hard about the direction you're taking the finances of this Patterson country. Would be well, first, sorry. not to use. I, I, the term sorry, I reflected so with often. you through the chair. I obviously meant the uh, the Labor government, Mr. Okay. Speaker. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Assistant Treasurer. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank all honourable members for their contribution in this debate. I must, however, start with the rather bizarre and confused uh, uh, contribution we've just heard from the member for Paterson, who said we support this bill that affects car dealerships, but what's the government doing about the commercial property sector? What's the government doing about other sectors having trouble getting finance? Why won't the government do something about those sectors, the member for Paterson said? He said, it's not your money, it's theirs. Well, I have a response for the member for Paterson. It's not your job, it's theirs. It's the people in the commercial uh, construction industry who are looking for government in action, and they're looking for opposition action, and they're looking for opposition support for a bill in the House called the Australian Business Investment Partnership the that the opposition is opposing will all the way. Member for Canning. Deputy Speaker, I call your attention to the status of the House. Quorum required. Ring the bells. I think you could, uh, on both sides, reduce very considerably the amount of debate that's going across the table.
Quorum present. I call the honourable assistant treasurer. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I was just in the process of pointing out the confused and bizarre contribution from the member for Paterson when the quorum was called. The member for Paterson said the opposition supports the special vehicle for, for uh, car financing, but what else is the government doing? Where is the government's support for the commercial property industry? A member of the party who has opposed to the bitter end the Australian Business Investment Partnership, which is designed to do just that. I mean, talk about inconsistency. I think the member for Paterson must have been present at the party room meeting which decided to oppose the Australian Business Investment Partnership, something which has been called for by business across this country for months, something which business just can't understand the opposition from the Liberal Party. They can't understand the reason why this so-called pro-business party in this country would oppose such a sensible measure. And the member for Paterson, I thought, laid out quite a good case for the Australian Business Investment Partnership. I thought he made quite a compelling re uh, argument to vote for it. This is a man who voted against it, whose colleagues in the other place are threatening it, who are trying to derail it, and who may but very well be successful in derailing the Australian Business Investment Partnership through their opposition. So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if a member of the opposition is going to come in here and say, well, we'll support this, it's as good as far as it goes, it's fine and as much as it achieves, but the government needs to be doing more, it would be helpful if he'd put his vote where his money is and actually support the government's actions in supporting the Australian Business Investment Partnership. So it was a particularly bizarre contribution from the member for Paterson. Mr Deputy Speaker, I wanted to take this opportunity to also respond uh, to another opposition member. This time uh, the contribution wasn't bizarre. It was a, uh, a contribution which was quite uh, um, uh, passionately held by the member. The member for Riverina spoke on, uh, on this debate last night and I watched her contribution. And she clearly is very interested in this topic and she clearly um, uh, feels very strongly about this topic and I welcomed her contribution. Uh, the member for Riverina, if I understood her argument correctly, uh, was concerned that the criteria of the special vehicle uh, may uh, restrict some of her car dealers from applying, and that's certainly not the case. Um, it is the case that this uh, special vehicle won't be operational until the bill has passed both houses of parliament, and certainly uh, we join with the opposition and the member for uh, Riverina in wanting that to happen urgently. But if I interpreted the member for Riverina's concerns correctly, she was concerned that there may be criteria in this bill which would, would require a turnover of half a million dollars a month uh, for the car dealer to have access, and that's certainly not the case. Uh, that is a requirement from some of the private sector providers uh, in place at the moment, but it is certainly not the case for this special vehicle. Uh, and there are some former GE or GMAC financed dealers who have not been able to secure new financing arrangements, particularly in rural and regional Australia. Uh, as the member for Riverina was referring to, and most of these dealerships have now been issued final notices. So that's the reason the government has embarked on this process and would like to see the bill passed swiftly. So uh, I know, I, th I think it's correct to say the member for Riverina has been in contact with the Treasurer's office, and I'd certainly encourage her to continue that dialogue, and we will certainly uh, do everything we can to facilitate those constituents of hers who've raised those issues. So while it's been very pleasing that it has not been necessary to activate the Oscar facility in the last six months uh, since it was launched because of the success of many former GE and GMAC finance car dealers in securing the wholesale floor plan finance from alternative providers, it's now become necessary to activate the facility. The Oscar SPV facility is critical in ensuring that one of the largest providers, the wholesale uh, floor plan of finance in Australia, Ford Credit, is able to remain in Australia and to continue to support its network of around 230 car dealers, about 140 of which are in regional centres. There's little doubt that if Ford Credit is not able to secure liquidity from the Oscar SPV over the next 12 months, a large number of Ford Credit's current dealers in regional New South Wales, Queensland, uh, Victoria and South Australia will fail, uh, resulting in hundreds of job losses in many vulnerable communities. The Oscar SPV is also critical in providing liquidity support to the small number of former GE and GMAC dealers who have not yet secured alternative sources of wholesale floor plan financing. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is, it is often forgotten that the vast majority of car dealerships are small 
family businesses. These businesses have often been developed over many years, involving generations of the same family. This bill will therefore allow a large number of small family businesses to continue to develop and grow at a very difficult and challenging economic period. Uh, the Car Dealership Financing Guarantee Appropriation Bill 2009 simply seeks to enact a standing appropriation to support the Commonwealth Guarantee that will apply to around $550 million of securities issued by the Auscar facility. The Commonwealth Guarantee is necessary so as to provide the four major Australian banks with the legal certainty they need to purchase their respective equal share of Auscar securities. Auscar will raise funds by selling securities to the four major Australian banks. At a time when the debt securitisation market has dried up as a result of the global financial crisis, we welcome the willingness of the four major Australian banks to support this initiative by agreeing to purchase Auscar securities. The overall size of the Auscar facility will not exceed $850 million. It's likely to be much smaller. The contingent liability risks to the Australian government are small. Treasury has entered into a contractual arrangement with Credit Suisse, the Auscar program manager, and a range of service providers on the operation and administration of the Auscar SPV facility. The Treasury will be providing the Treasurer with regular reports on the operation and performance of the Auscar facility and will prepare quarterly reports on the operation of the SPV that will be made available to Parliament. The Auscar SPV is designed to wind down by the 30th of June 2010. Standing appropriation, the standing appropriation this bill puts in place will then wind down. Mr Deputy Speaker, there is no doubt that the Australian car industry is facing some very serious challenges. The next 12 months are expected to be more challenging than the 12 months that have, that, that have just passed for that sector. As throughout the global financial crisis, the government is acting decisively and responsibly to support Australian jobs. Initiatives such as the Auscar SPV are absolutely critical in providing not only real material support to many car dealers, but also providing critical confidence to the entire car industry at this time when it needs it most. So again, Mr Deputy Speaker, I thank honourable members who have contributed. I welcome the opposition's support, despite the bizarre contribution from the member for Paterson, who I thought at one stage had announced the opposition's support for the Australian Business Investment Partnership because he made a very cogent argument for it. I commend the bill to the House. Debate has concluded. I'll put the question. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, that's carried. Clark. Second reading. A bill for an act to provide for an appropriation for the Australian Government guarantee to support interim funding to car dealerships and for related purposes. I have received a message from Her Excellency the Governor General recommending, in accordance with section 56 of the Constitution, an appropriation for the purposes of this bill. Third reading. Good. Um, I'll put the question. All those in. Oh, you're giving leave, sorry. Leave is granted. Yes, is leave granted for third reading? I'll put the question. All those in favour? All those against? That's carried. Clark. Third reading, a bill for an act to provide for an appropriation for the Australian Government guarantee to support interim funding to car dealerships and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Child Care Bill 2009, resumption of debate on the second reading. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the Honourable Member for Indi. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker, as the Shadow Minister for, amongst other things, early childhood education, I rise in this debate to provide the Coalition's general support for this bill. The bill essentially provides for a number of what seem to be general housekeeping amendments to the A New Tax System Family Assistance Administration Act 1999. And the Parliamentary Secretary has already outlined generally the main changes being made by this bill, and the Coalition will support it. I'd like to have a closer look, though, at one specific change being made, and that is the amendment that will enforce the provision in the bill which imposes civil penalties on childcare operators who breach their obligations in relation to when and how they notify their intention to cease operations, specifically breaching the rule that requires 30 days' notice to be given before a centre can close. Mr Speaker, this is an important amendment. 
We've seen over the past few months a situation where a large operator, ABC Learning, collapsed, uh, leaving many thousands of parents, carers and, most importantly, children facing great uncertainty. They faced a situation where they didn't know if their centre would close, change ownership or remain open, and for many families with children in care this type of situation did cause a great deal of stress. And in a very real and personal sense, this stress was brought to me home recently when I was contacted by parents from the ABC Learning Centre at Altona North in the electorate of Jellybrand and located just five minutes from the electoral uh, boundary of the Minister for Education, the member for uh, Laylor's electorate. ABC Altona North was one of the ABC centres which was deemed to be unviable under the ABC learning business model. It became part of the 241 centres in the ABC2 group, which was controlled by the government appointed receivers, PPB, and for which a buyer would hopefully be found. Last month, on 15 April, PPB announced that of the original 241 centres in the ABC2 group, buyers had been found for 210. Altona North was listed as new operator identified negotiations continuing. On 5 May, it was announced that Sydenham Preschool Trust would take over the Altona North Centre and operations would continue as normal. However, on 8 May, parents at the centre were informed that the centre would close as of 15 May. Parents were given seven days' notice to find alternative care arrangements. An email that I received from one of the mothers at the centre sums up her distress. She said, and uh, this isn't uh, a full quote, the closure of this centre and the provision of one week's notice represent an exceedingly unacceptable situation. I fail to understand how it can be allowed to happen in this country. The process that was undertaken to reach this decision has been thoroughly unacceptable. Neither the parents, children, carers nor affected community members that are part of this crash have been involved in this decision or contacted to provide their opinion thought or thoughts. To make a decision about the future of this crash based solely on property value, headcount and financial records is to treat this solely as a business transaction and to ignore the human element. Even in reaching a commercial business decision, operations such as our willingness to pay higher fees or contribute time and other resources have not been canvassed. The centre is fully occupied and recently renovated. I cannot accept that there is no means to profitably sustain its operation. I suspect that it has been decided that it is not sufficiently profitable to continue, which is a level of greed that should not be tolerated in this society. Communication throughout the period has been inadequate. The only means of communication provided has been printed emails left in my son's pigeonhole at Crash. Decisions have been made that have, had a, that have a huge emotional, financial and logistical impact on my family, and not a single person responsible or involved in this process has had the decency to address this issue with me in person. No one has had the integrity or strength of character to talk to me directly. Based on the assurances given in the communications provided to us, we have made decisions that have now put us in a worse position. We have rejected places at other creches where we would be happy to send him, where our waiting list position had finally resulted in an offer for care, and we are no longer on the waiting list. The alternative childcare and support provided during this process have not been adequate. That someone would consider one week's notice sufficient to allow a family to make such a significant change is absurd. To think that I'd be happy to place my child in any childcare centre is unacceptable. Now, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, that um, is just part of the frust an, uh, an expression, Madam Deputy Speaker, my apologies, <laughs> I hadn't noticed the change. Uh, that is just a glimpse of part of the frustration and the distress caused to one mother in one centre that received very, very little notice that um, it would close, it would cease operations. The, the Minister for Education has said publicly on numerous occasions that centres cannot close, cannot close without giving parents uh, 30 days' notice. 
And yet here is an example of a centre which was being assisted by government funds and run by the government appointed receiver, giving parents seven days' notice to find alternative care. And needless to say, the tightening of provisions to impose civil penalties on operators who breach this 30 days' notice requirement is a very good thing and will be welcomed by parents. I wonder, though, what would have happened if Altona North had closed after this legislation was passed by the parliament. Would the civil penalties have been imposed on the minister being the person ultimately responsible for the closure? Mr. Speaker, it's, Madam Speaker, it's my view that this bill should have included a provision to ensure that childcare operators provide 30 days' notice to parents of children attending a centre which, for whatever reason, has to close its doors. We know how these closures affect families. We saw the evidence of it on the news every night for weeks. The children are the reason that these centres exist, and in this industry, more than any other, there needs to be stability and certainty. Over the past few days, I've been working on an amendment to this bill that would specifically provide for notification um, to parents. However, in discussions with the parliamentary secretary last night, I am assured that the department already has the power to specify the form, manner and way in which the childcare service provider must notify that they are ceasing operations. The department has, already, has apparently already trialled a form for such notice, and the parliamentary secretary assures me that the standardised notice of cessation forms will ensure parents receive at least 30 days' notice. I accept her assurances and will therefore not be moving an amendment to that effect. However, it must be noted that the case of Altona North ABC shows that the parliamentary secretary and the minister really haven't been on top of things and they haven't uh, ensured that what they promised to parents has been adhered to. The minister has said time and time again over the past six months that there was a legal requirement for services to provide at least 30 days' notice to parents before closure. But exactly what has been done to ensure that this is um, enforced? Nothing that we know of. While I take the parliamentary secretary at her word on this matter, I will be monitoring very closely the operation of the new notice of cessation forms to ensure that the government's rhetoric matches uh, the outcome, on, at least on this occasion. I have to say the Rudd government has shown a somewhat dismissive attitude to the childcare system, seemingly happy to hide behind the ABC situation rather than provide genuine national leadership on the future direction of the industry. And such a dismissive approach is exemplified by the very quiet binning of the government's promise to build 260 childcare centres around the country. There was, for those who remember, there was uh, such fanfare in 2007 uh, when uh, Labor's affordable childcare plan, they're not my words, um, but the words uh, as described by the policy by the Labor Party, when uh, that uh, plan was announced and we were told that under this plan would be built 260 childcare centres around the country. Well, after 18 months, the government has budgeted at a cost of $114.5 million for 38 centres. Of those 38 centres, only five or six are at any type of planning stage. Not one has yet been completed. The coalition has called repeatedly for the Rudd government to answer the question, who is going to pay for the other 222 centres? Where will they be built? How much will they cost? Will they contribute to the problem of oversupply in some areas? Exactly when will the promise be delivered in full? And these are very valid questions that need to be asked. This government makes the criticism, the very simple criticism, that any questions asked of its policies are negative, they're not helpful, they're un-Australian. That's not so. And I say to members opposite, it is a fundamental responsibility of opposition to scrutinise, to look at the policies, to look at the expenditure of government and to ensure that they are in accordance with the interests of the Australian population, that they are in accordance with what the government has promised and said it would do. To do nothing, to blindly pass 
every single bill, every single decision, without comment, without scrutiny, would be letting the Australian people down. It would be the opposition not doing its job in our system of government, in doing its bit to hold the government accountable. And that's irrespective of which political party is in government. To have a strong, healthy democracy that delivers results and delivers solutions for the Australian people, for Australian families, and, this, and this, in this instance, for Australian families with children in care, the opposition must be on its toes and must be doing its job. And the government needs to accept constructive criticism because that will only help them do their job better. We know anyone without any checks and balances in doing their job is likely to do uh, a, a lesser job than otherwise would be the case. On budget night, Julia Gillard's ministerial statement on education made a quiet two-line reference saying that, quote, the remaining up to 222 early learning and care centres will be considered when the childcare market is settled and based on the experience of priority centres. Now, for an issue which formed such a significant part of the Labor Party's early childhood policy, this is a monumental backflip. The collapse of ABC Learning has raised all sorts of demand and supply issues within the childcare industry. In order to provide some certainty in the childcare market, the industry's main requirement now is to have some idea where the demand hotspots and chronic undersupply are actually located. The government hasn't helped this uncertainty. In fact, they've contributed to it by refusing to release the childcare vacancy data, which the last time this vacancy data was released was under the Howard government in April in 2007. I'll take this opportunity as we canvass a range of childcare issues in this bill to once again implore the Minister and Parliamentary Secretary to do something about providing an indication of vacancy rates in the childcare sector. This is one of the most crucial things the government can do to help with the future planning and viability of the sector. And the sector has effectively been flying blind without these figures since April 2007. And alarmingly, the utilisation rates in long day care in the 2006 childcare census was 74 per cent, down from 85 per cent in the 2004 census. And that's a dramatic drop in just two years. And now it's been three years, and we don't know what the current situation is exactly. And as I understand it, the government will no longer conduct conduct the census as it collects very similar data through the new child care management scheme. And I note that the parliamentary secretary announced on the 5th of this month that the CCMS is now fully operational. Now, if that's the case, surely, surely this means that the government can now provide an accurate indication of utilisation rates within every centre across the country. While I concede this does not present the full story on over and under supply, it's an important and significant indicator. There's growing anecdotal evidence that there's an oversupply in some areas, just as there is a shortage in others. What the industry needs is a clearer picture. And you really have to wonder why the government continues to be so very, very, very reluctant to reveal the data on vacancy rates. They collect it electronically every single week. Every single week. It would seem to some of us that their reluctance is tied in with their promise to build these 260 new childcare centres. So now the government in the budget papers, um, in what uh, they consider to be their very clear and unele uh, unequivocal election promise, have created um, even greater uncertainty. We've, um, we've seen the promise for 260 centres and now we've seen the backflip on this promise. But it's the actions of the government by refusing to release the vacancy data that is contributing to uncertainty and instability. They've said that they'll go, they've indicated that 
they may revisit the issue of the 260 centres when there's greater certainty in the childcare market. But if they don't help in creating greater certainty by releasing vacancy um, data, then they're not helping the industry and they're certainly not helping themselves getting back on track with their election promises. The two-line reference uh, on the budget night seems like a pretty good out clause, um, if you ask me, and I, I don't believe the government has any intention of revisiting that particular election promise. Madam Deputy Speaker, despite the concerns that I have raised today with the government's handling of childcare generally over the past 18 months, the opposition will support this bill because essentially it's a housekeeping bill. And I do thank the parliamentary secretary and her office for making some of the departmental officers available for a briefing and also for the written assurances on the issue of the 30-day notification for parents. And I commend the bill to the House. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The honourable member for Blair has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak in support of the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Childcare Bill 2009. Before I start talking about the substance of the bill, it's interesting that the member for Indi talked about an unacceptable situation. I'll tell you, Deputy Speaker, what an unacceptable situation it was, that one of the first acts of the Howard government was to actually disinvest in childcare and childcare centres in this country. It's a fact that the Howard government spent a fifth of our OECD colleagues when it came to funding for education in the early childhood sector, and that's a fact. They underinvested in the area, and it's also a fact that on their watch, the ABC Learning Centre debacle emerged and grew and grew. They did it. The ABC Centre situation, the catastrophe that the, the Rudd Labor government had to deal with, happened on the watch with the consent, with the approval and the approbation of the Howard Coalition government. We've had to fix that up. And because the member for Indi has mentioned the ABC Learning Centres, I'm going to go through that in the course of this speech to just show how the government has worked in an early, decisive and constructive way with the sector, with the corner-pointed receivers, with the families affected, to ensure good outcomes across the country for the 120,000 children in the 1,000 learning centres across the country which were in jeopardy. And I'm going to give an example of just one in the largest suburb in my electorate where the outcome was favourable, indeed a terrific outcome for the local community. But the legislation before the House um, is a quite technical uh, bill. But it does go towards improving accountability, administration and accessibility in the sector. Now, the parliamentary secretary has, in her second reading speech, said the following in relation to this legislation. That this legislation before the House today marks another step along the government's path to accessible, affordable and high quality childcare all Australian children, their parents and carers. This bill is about the three pillars, administration, accessibility and accountability. It's about ensuring that our children from the cradle to the creche and to the primary schools that they'll attend get the kind of education and care that we believe is appropriate in a fair, just and prosperous country. The changes here are quite technical, as I said, but they're important. For example, the change of the name of the rebate from the childcare tax rebate to the childcare rebate is simply a statement of reality. It's no longer a tax offset but it's a benefit through the Family Assistance Office. And so it's more comprehensible for the public to think it's not a tax rebate, but in fact a benefit. The substitution of the childcare rebate and the death of a parent or guardian is a sensible outcome in all the circumstances. 
On occasions, it's quite sad for children that their guardians or parents would pass on. So it's important to ensure that the individual who assumes the care, control and what we used to call the custody of a child will receive the CCR entitlement to assist them with the basic necessities of life for that child and the circumstances. It's important in the circumstances that we ensure the adequate recovery of debt, a debt owed to the Commonwealth, where there's a CCR overpayment. The provision in the amendments here uh, require that you take into consideration uh, also the fact that we have introduced quarterly CCR payments from July 2008. The civil penalties are appropriate through regulation as well under the Family Assistance Law. Imposing civil penalties and infringement notices are important to ensure uh, rigorous accountability in the sector. Of course, if the matter goes to court, uh, we know that the courts have a discretion to review infringement notices issued and to take into consideration the nature and character of the organisation, the size, for example, in determining whether a penalty should be upheld or imposed or also an alternative penalty in the circumstances. But it's important that there be a civil penalty regime to deal with non-compliance. The amendments with respect to the childcare rebate for the final quarter are also prudent and appropriate in the circumstances. This will allow the final CCR quarterly payment to be withheld until an individual taxpayer knows in reality what their taxable income will be in the circumstances, so that the final payment is made and not really overpaid or underpaid in the circumstances. It's important that those people who deal with Family Assistance Office ensure that they communicate to advise in relation to overpayments and underpayments so that um, they can adequately adjust their income and the government can know what their true situation is for the purpose of the provision of childcare and out-of-pocket expenses. Now, it's important for those who may or may not be listening to understand that we do have uh, two types of benefit in the circumstances. We have a childcare benefit, which is a payment by the Australian government, which helps individuals with, the, with respect to the cost of childcare. It can be taken as a lump sum or as reduced childcare fees. And that's dependent, of course, upon a person's income, the type of care used, approved or registered, the amount of care used, whether they pass the work um, training um, or study tests, and the number of children in their care. And I'd encourage all those people who may be listening to log on to the website www.mychild.gov.au to find out more information in relation to that. The second type of benefit, if I can put it, is of course the child care tax rebate, which we're renaming, of course. It's a payment made to the, to the individual by the Australian government to help the family with the costs of childcare. And of course it's separate from the CCB. Now to be eligible for a, uh, a rebate of this nature, you must have used an approved childcare centre and be eligible for the CCB. Also even entitled at the zero rate. There's no income test of course for this type of rebate. And if you're eligible for the CCB, uh, you can get it as well. Would the honourable member for Blair please take his seat? The member for McPherson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I draw your attention to the State of the House, please. My attention has been drawn to the State of the House. Would you please ring the bells? We don't have a quorum.
27. 26. 27. Quorum's present. I call the honourable member for Blair. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Deputy Speaker. It's interesting that the member for McPherson, who's the shadow spokesperson for ageing, is just simply not interested in children. I mean, that 120,000 children at ABC learning centres across the country whose places were in jeopardy, their, their families' uh, security in terms of finance was in jeopardy, their their arrangements in terms of family life is in jeopardy. And what do we get today? We get quorum calls. If they're just not interested in relation to this topic, uh, the fact that they, have, they simply want to call a quorum call on us on an important bill like this indicates their lack of sensitivity to, on relation to this issue, their lack of understanding of the necessity of certainty in business, uh, and also the certainty that is required for the many people in our community who use uh, childcare centres across the country because they need to, because it's a necessity in family life in this day and age. And I think it's a disgrace to the Australian public that the opposition should engage in these types of juvenile actions that we've seen time and time today. We have fulfilled our election commitment and we will. We will be assiduous in fulfilling our election commitments. And the member for Indi should have a good look at the election commitments we made in relation to the areas of her portfolio if she thinks we're not doing so. Unlike the opposition, we actually tell the people of Australia up front what we're going to do, and we do it. When it comes to childcare tax rebate, we actually made an election commitment that would increase it to 50 per cent to benefit families across the country, and we did it and paid it quarterly. And that's what we've done. We did it. Um, from the 1st of July 2008. That makes an appreciable difference in the financial security and livelihoods of people across the country, and that's important. The opposition failed to do anything of the sort during their tenure. And the member for Indi talked about what we're doing in terms of uh, help for Australian families in the area of childcare. And I think it's important for her to note. I actually had a look around. I thought she was here on budget night, but she mustn't have been, so for her benefit, I'll go through just a few things that we're going to do with respect to childcare. The Rudd government's investing $12.8 billion over the next four years to help 800,000 Australian children in childcare. We're investing $2.5 million to provide a childcare estimator to help families make decisions about this. The childcare tax rebate will provide $4.4 billion over four years to assist working families with childcare costs. The CCB will deliver $8.4 billion over four years to reduce childcare fees. We are committed 100 per cent to quality childcare for the people of Australia. Now, when the childcare problems emerge with respect to the ABC learning centres, we acted in a way that which was necessary in the circumstances. On the 6th of November 2008, ABC Learning, Australia's largest provider of childcare, entered voluntary administration. The government stepped in with a pack support package of $22 million to ensure the centres would continue to operate while the receiver, McGrath Nicol, undertook a review of its operations. And the government's childcare industry task force met with the receivers and assisted in terms of the review of the operational data of each centre. The government immediately set up an information, a dedicated information hotline to provide basic information to parents and employees about the announcement and provide information which was necessary on the website, mychild.gov.au. This provided invaluable assistance to parents in all the circumstances. In December, the receiver announced results that 720 Centres would continue to operate as ABC1. 55 would close, with children be accommodated in neighbouring centres. 
and 262, including 21 defence centres, were unviable. The government provided a further package of $34 million for these unviable centres, known as ABC2 Group, which became the subject of an expression of interest being run by the court-appointed receiver PB, PPB. On 13 March 2009, the Deputy Prime Minister noted PPB's progress as they commenced uh, exchanging contracts for the first tranche of uh, centres. At that time, it became clear that a number and the, the number and complexity of the offers meant that PPB required extension of their appointment to mid-May 2009. You can see the government got involved in this issue to support working families across the country. On 15 April 2009, PPB announced the outcome of the expression um, of interest for ABC2 centres and specifically specified the following. 200 centres will continue to operate with new operators. 19 centres would close as no new operator had been found. However, alternative childcare had been identified in neighbouring centres for all the children. Four centres had closed during the EOI. Eight centres continued to be reviewed by PPB. The 21 defence sites would move to a new management arrangement with B for Kids. The 70 new, new, 75 new operators of the centres, a mix of small and big, um, also private as well as not-for-profit organisations. It's expected about 85 per cent of the staff would be retained in all the circumstances, and that's a good outcome for the staff. In terms of the uh, ABC1 centres, they remain in the control of the ABC uh, receiver McGrath Nickel, and a process to determine their future is yet to be announced. So, from a position we had in November last year, where we had to step in after the phase of the Howard government, where it appeared that a thousand childcare centres would be in jeopardy, we're now in a position where just a handful remain to be resolved. 120,000 children, approximately, have certainty. There's certainty for their families. There's certainty for the staff and there's certainty for the businesses in which their parents work. The government has worked in a dedicated and determined fashion to ensure stability in the childcare sector following the upheaval caused by the ABC Learning Voluntary Administration. And locally, one of the expressions of the government's commitment can be found at the Brassel Shopping Centre, where an ABC centre was at risk of closure. With increased demand for childcare across Ipswich, we saw a Bush Kids Daycare open its doors in replace of ABC Learning Centre on the 11th of May 2009. Bush Kids refused to accept closures in Ipswich community were necessary. There was a united and tenacious team led by Bush Kids Area Director Ms Lodisha Brennan and family owners and operators of Bush Kids, Mrs. Ronell Carney and John Carney, and Mr. Brent Stokes, who joined with the centre owners and the Brassel Shopping Centre management to secure the centre's future. Mr. Stokes said, said this: "The support and encouragement from everyone has made this possible." And he said the following: "We could not have achieved this without the tremendous support from the federal member for Blair, Mr. Shane Newman, MP." the State Member for Ipswich West, Mr Wayne Wayne MP, and Councillor Cheryl Bromwich, all of whom I might add Deputy Speaker have their offices, including myself, at the Brassel Shopping Centre. Now, Bush Kids is committed to working closely with their new colleagues, including the current uh, Brassel Childcare Centre Director, Kylie Smith, and the fantastic team to ensure that all staff employment and enrolments for existing families remain secure. Now, Bush Kids is a wonderful organisation. Uh, a multi-award winning childcare service received awards including the 2008 Business Achievers Award in Tuition, Training and Childcare Services and the Commonwealth Bank Small Business Champion Queensland Awards for 2008. We've seen an increase of approximately 5 per cent uh, enrolment since Bush Kids took over and it's estimated in the next few weeks about another 17 per cent increase. Now, this is a fantastic outcome and it wouldn't have happened without the support expired. of the question is that this bill be now read a second time. The honourable member for Fisher has the call. Deputy Speaker, um, reading the uh, second reading speech by the minister responsible, the parliamentary secretary, uh, uh, I was interested to see how she summed up uh, the bill as being about administration, accessibility and accountability. 
uh, and she says, and I quote her, which I suppose you could call our own AAA rating. Uh, close quote. Um, well, that was a fairly nifty use of uh, the English language, and I certainly would not in the House want to in any way, shape or form suggest that the parliamentary secretary was uh, less than sincere uh, in supporting the purposes of this bill for the reasons that she outlined. Uh, when I look through uh, what the bill seeks to do, uh, it seems that any reasonable person would have to support uh, the bill, and that is what the Liberal National Opposition is doing uh, in the House today. Uh, the bill will make changes to allow the final quarterly payment of the uh, childcare tax rebate to be withheld until a parent's taxable income is determined for that financial year. Uh, and uh, the government has advised us that. Uh, the purpose or the reason for this uh, is to reduce the number of those families uh, who, in fact, uh, are overpaid or underpaid, and that certainly makes uh, a lot of sense and appears to be uh, logical. The bill also seeks to align the operation of the CCR provisions with the childcare benefits in the case of a deceased individual. Uh, that means that if an individual has received CCR payments, and passes on, uh, but the child continues to attend approved care, uh, those payments uh, can continue to be received by another approved adult who takes over guardianship of the child. Again, no one could object to that provision. The bill allows for those people who have been assessed at a zero rate for the CCB to request a review of their entitlements within two years of the relevant year that they received the zero rating where a variation to the CCB is made as a result of the review, an automatic review will be done in relation to the CCR payments. Again, uh, that is not unreasonable. Uh, civil penalties are imposed on childcare operators who breach their obligations in relation to when and how they notify their intention to cease operations. Uh, my understanding is that the current provisions uh, provide for 30 days' notice to be given before a centre can close, and yet um, only about 14 days ago, uh, with respect to the ABC centre at Alterna North in Victoria, uh, a centre that the, um, the, uh, the, the government appointed uh, receivers um, on the 5th of May said would remain open with final negotiations to be completed. Well, the announcement was made. Uh, that it would close and, only and parents are only given six days' notice. So I mean, six days' notice were given. The law requires for 30 days' notice, and so it's understandable uh, that the government would seek to impose civil penalties on childcare providers who breach their legal obligations. Logically also, Madam Deputy Speaker, the childcare tax rebate uh, is being renamed as the childcare rebate uh, because the payment is now made as a quarterly payment through family assistance legislation rather than as a tax offset under taxation legislation. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I've held um, a, a view for a very long time that the cost of childcare uh, for a working person is as much a cost of earning accessible income as would be the purchase of tools uh, for a tradesman uh, or maybe uh, reference books for uh, an accountant or a lawyer. And I must say that this is not uh, Liberal National Opposition policy, and it's certainly not government policy, but I've had a view that tax or that childcare expenses ought to actually be tax deductible, fully tax deductible. That way there is a linkage between the cost of producing uh, that uh, accessible income uh, and the linkage would mean that before the income is actually assessed for tax, the cost of producing that income will be taken into account and the person's taxable income will therefore be reduced by the amount of the, um, of the childcare payment. Now, for a whole range of reasons, uh, including equity, including the fact that uh, there are people who are not actually in the paid workforce who benefit from childcare, and I accept that as well, uh, this uh, view of mine has not been adopted by any major political party, but I do think that uh, as far as working people are concerned, it does make a, a very uh, fair case for uh, 
childcare costs to be fully tax deductible, uh, and then for those people who need childcare for other reasons, then the law as it currently is, uh, stands could well be um, actioned with respect to those people. Well, we'll just have to wait uh, and see whether anyone ever picks up this, but it is, I find, quite amazing that many people who are in the paid workforce don't actually uh, object to the fact that they are not receiving, as a tax deduction, the full cost of what they pay out. And if they didn't pay that out, uh, they wouldn't be able to earn the assessable income because, in many cases, uh, they wouldn't be able to go to work. Uh, but having said that, this is a bill that does enjoy uh, the support of the opposition as well as, uh, as the government. Uh, the bill does uh, include uh, housekeeping measures uh, uh, as well as amendments uh, which the government would want us to accept uh, would be as a result of the failure of ABC Learning. I suppose it's also uh, a bit of a worry that you can have one operator uh, that controls such a large section of the industry uh, that uh, uh, we saw with respect to ABC Learning. I suppose it doesn't really matter who controls the centres, but when you do have uh, a market failure, as occurred with respect to ABC uh, Learning, then clearly that has an incredible impact. And we saw the action by the government, uh, which was forced on the government, uh, to make sure that those families who relied on ABC Learning uh, were not uh, left entirely in the lurch. Uh, the government, I believe, could well have handled the ABC learning fiasco much better, uh, but that is history. Uh, we're not debating the ABC learning fiasco in this particular bill, and uh, because this bill is, when you look at it as a freestanding bill worthy of support, I'm very happy to commend the bill to the chamber. The parliamentary secretary for early childhood education and childcare, in reply. Um, Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you to those members of the House who have contributed to this debate, in particular to uh, the member for Blair, I think, for his very comprehensive appreciation uh, of all of the things that the government is doing in this important area of early learning. Uh, this bill, the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Childcare Bill 2009, continues to strengthen childcare governance. This bill builds on the comprehensive package of childcare initiatives passed last year through the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment, Childcare Budget and Other Measures Act of 2008. Now, our first step is to rename the rebate, childcare rebate, in recognition that the payment is now made through the Family Assistance Office. We're creating a debt recovery provision so that if a person's childcare rebate exceeds the entitlement determined at the end of the income year, the difference is a recoverable debt. We're taking further steps to simplify the calculation of the rebate for the income year and will pay the rebate to an individual in substitution uh, for someone who's died. Uh, measures contained in this bill will also strengthen the compliance framework. We are enabling the extension of the civil penalty and infringement notice regime through regulations. And we're tightening the link between a service and an operator to hold operators liable for meeting the obligations imposed on their service. We are introducing, Madam Deputy Speaker, a power to request information when a childcare service has notified they are ceasing operations. Now, in particular, uh, this power will introduce a requirement for an operator of an approved childcare service to notify the department if they are ceasing operations in the form, manner and way specified by the secretary. Now, within that notice, we intend to include a requirement for a service operator to provide evidence of the written advice of their intention to close and that they have sent to the families of uh, the children enrolled uh, at that centre. Now, this change will work in concert with the amendments that are made to allow the imposition of civil penalties through regulations. For example, regulations could be put in place so that a civil penalty would apply in a case where an operator fails to provide evidence of written advice of their intention to close to the families of children enrolled at that centre. Now, through these measures, we will continue to protect the government's investment in childcare. Last year, Madam Deputy Speaker, the government delivered on its commitments to childcare. We said we would do more. Through this bill, we are doing more and we will continue to do more to meet the childcare needs of the Australian community. 
I note that um, this bill uh, is making a number of uh, technical amendments to improve the operation of Australia's childcare sector. But in the debate we've uh, heard, uh, the member I noticed, uh, the member for Indi, has also made a number of comments uh, regarding ABC Learning, and in particular, she raised uh, the issue of problems in relation to uh, one centre at uh, Altona North. Um, I just want to put on the record the fact is that uh, PPB, the court-appointed receiver, receiver uh, wrote to all families um, um, involved in the Altona North Centre uh, about the receivership process, wrote on three occasions. Uh, families were received letters on three occasions. Now, it is, of course, regrettable that this centre is closing. However, alternative local care is available and has been offered to all the affected families and children. Nonetheless, I certainly can see this has been um, uh, uh, stressful uh, for families uh, and particularly for employees. But I would just like to take a, a minute to put this into perspective. Given what the outcome could have been last year when the vast empire that was ABC Learning went into receivership, an empire that extended to 1,084 centres. Uh, we were faced with the possible loss of tens of thousands of childcare places for a start. Uh, given all of that, the management by the government, by the receivers, has been remarkable. Uh, today I noticed the member for Indi has spoken about what parents need. Now, in cleaning up the mess of the ABC corporate collapse, the Rudd government has shown I think the ultimate concern and respect for the children, for the parents, and again for all of the employees involved throughout, we have acted to provide stability and certainty. Now, as I said in the second reading speech, this bill looks to improve the administration and accessibility of childcare entitlements and the accountability of the childcare service operators. It's clearly a step um, in learning the lessons of ABC Learning to ensure that this mistake is never repeated. I note as well, though, the, the member for Indi remarkably really made the point that she says the, the government is not on top of things. I would have to say it requires spectacular front to make that claim. Uh, when you consider that the member for Indi was a member of the previous government and during the Howard years, the entity that became known as ABC Learning grew unchecked. We saw unchecked commercial growth, and when it went into receivership last year, we had to clean up the mess. We have done that, and we are acting in many other areas. We have very ambitious plans with regard to early learning. We are acting, and I note the member for Indi made no mention of these things, we are acting on quality early learning. We are acting on ratios. We are making an unprecedented commitment and investment in training. And most importantly, we have acted on affordability. Um, we have heard from the member for Blair, who made the point, of course, that we acted on our first promise in the budget last year and introduced the 50 per cent rebate. Uh, that is 50 per cent of all out-of-pocket expenses. That has made childcare more affordable than it has ever been. And I will finish on one other important point, something we did not promise in the campaign, but in fact in this budget, during what is going to be a very difficult year, we have done the best possible thing for parents right across the country. We are introducing a system, a universal system, of paid paternity leave, something that the Howard government never managed to do during the long boom years. We have very big ambitions, as I say, in early learning, I think it's time the opposition got on board. I will come back, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, to this bill, the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Childcare Bill 2009, which is a bill which fundamentally strengthens governance in childcare, and I commend the bill to the House. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to family assistance and for other purposes. I have received a message from Her Excellency the Governor-General recommending in accordance with section 56 of the Constitution an appropriation for the purposes of this bill. Is leave granted for a third reading to be moved immediately? All those of that opinion say aye. Of the, no. Um, if leave is granted, is leave granted? If leave is granted, 
then um, the question is that this bill be now read a third time. I move that this bill be now read a third time. Right. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. Uh, to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to family assistance and for other purposes. I, I have a message uh, from Her Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent of the following bills. Social Security and Family Assistance Legislation Amendment 2009, Budget Measures, Bill 2009, and Financial Assistance Legislation Amendment Bill 2009. The Clerk. Government Business, Order of the Day number three. Nation Building Program, National Land Transport Amendment Bill 2009. Resumption of debate on the second reading. Uh, the question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the Leader of the National Party. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. This bill reinforces what we already know about the Rudd Labor government, that it's all about spin. It's all about spin. It's certainly been about debt and spending and unemployment and running an economy into the ground, but fundamentally it's been about spin. We're all amazed that this government has managed to blow a budget deficit of more than $20 billion and turn it into an astonishing $58 billion deficit in just 18 months. We, we already know that Australia is facing a gross debt of at least $315 billion, or around $15,000 for every man, woman and child in the country. And of course, that $315 billion doesn't include the $40 billion that's going to have to be borrowed for the, the broadband fantasy, the $60 billion for projects uh, that have been referred to by the government in its nation-building program for which, no, uh, for which additional money is required. We don't know how much we're up for with the Rudd Bank, how much for defence commitments and any number of other spending initiatives that the government may be intending to take between now and the time when that debt peaks. We also know that a very large proportion of this debt is not due to revenue downturns but the reckless spending decisions that the government has taken. But what's worst of all is that there's no plan to repay this money. Labor has no idea where the funds are going to come from uh, to, to repay the, the spending spree that's been going on in recent times. We all know that there's really only one plan, that is to spend, 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 and then rely on the next coalition government to pay it off. It took 10 years to pay off the last deficit. How long is it going to, be going to take to pay off the next, uh, this current one? Now, Labor often criticises the coalition for not having spent enough when in government. The Minister for Infrastructure is, is a frequent offender in this regard, saying we are spending where the previous government didn't spend. Well, what the Minister for Infrastructure needs to remember is that when we were in government, we were paying for what Labor spent last time. So the key issue is not so much how much you can spend in a day, but how much you can actually pay for. And in fact, there are many things that the, that the previous coalition government would love to have done worthwhile projects we would like to have pursued, but we couldn't because we had an interest and redemption bill to pay on the previous government's mismanagement. And of course the next coalition government is going to face similar difficulties. No one believes that any Labor government will ever retire debt. The reality is that the next coalition government will also not be able to spend as much as we would like on roads and rail and other things because we're paying off debt. But that's not something that Labor should be boasting about. They should be ashamed of the fact that they've left, left behind such a deficit and such a bill for future governments and future generations to repay. So to be out there boasting about how much is going to be spent when all of that money is going to have to be borrowed, much of it from overseas, so that these projects can proceed is only telling a very small proportion uh, of the story. There are potholes that, will be, that, that won't be filled in the future because of the expenditure that's going on today. And when you, when you buy a new car, you get the pleasure out of, out of uh, the purchase of that car. But you can't afford to buy another one until you've paid off the one you had. You spend the next few years going without other things because you're paying off your car. And this kind of simple lesson in household budgeting seems to have been lost 
on, on the current incumbents in the government chairs. Uh, the government uses a lot of rhetoric and spin to talk about the work that it's been doing and so-called revolutionary processes, the biggest budget, the biggest spending program in history, all of which is essentially empty spin. Infrastructure Australia, for instance, is not the first time that there's been some kind of a process to assess projects on their merits. Infrastructure Australia is not the first time there's been transparent opportunities for public input into uh, assessing uh, road projects and, and making decisions about infrastructure expenditure. Auslink was established to achieve those sorts of objectives. It involved consultation with the states. The community even had opportunities to make suggestions about projects which should be, should be considered. And all of that process was, was undertaken in a fair and appropriate manner. And if there's some kind of suggestion that there was a coalition conspiracy about the projects that were funded, I'd remind you that all of the state governments were Labor for, for a fair bit of that time, and they were actively involved as partners in this process and generally co-funders. And so, in reality, there has always been uh, this, there has been an open and transparent process. In fact, a stark change in the, act, in, the, in the way in which this government is dealing with issues is in fact that the processes of Infrastructure Australia are clearly not open and transparent. They're not available for public scrutiny. None of the documents are going to be released. We saw the, the spectacle in the Senate yesterday during the estimates process of the, of the minister flatly refusing to provide any of the data that might support the choices that the government has made in relation to uh, the funding, uh, funding announcements. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that later on. But uh, this, th this legislation is another example where spin is actually triumphing over uh, economic, uh, e economic sustainability. Uh, it's, a, it's an example of spin trying to, make, to cover up economic incompetence. The key element of this bill is a name change. That's right, just a name change. It's changing the name of Auslink to the Nation Building Program. Now, it's remarkable that the government would consider using the resources of the public purse and the time needed to draft legislation and the priority given in Parliament to what is essentially a piece of spin doctoring. It's perhaps not surprising, though, because this government thinks that, uh, that uh, using the time of this place for a rebranding re exercise is, uh, and to try and change the name of something that was a great success but also linked to the previous government is, is a worthwhile uh, activity. Now, they're trying to wipe out the memory of Auslink. The Auslink signs, the Auslink uh, uh, position in the hearts of Australians is associated with the previous government. So we can't have anything good left out there that the people love that, uh, that, uh, that, just, that finds its way through a Labor government. So they changed the name. Uh, they, they, they want it. This, is a, this has been a successful pro program and its name is being changed for no other reason than it was associated with the previous government. Now, during the election campaign, uh, Labor was quite happy to talk about Auslink and Auslink II and the projects that were going to be funded under Auslink. They allowed the word to pass their lips on hundreds of occasions during the election campaign, but when they came into office, they started choking on the word. And so we started seeing new versions, new descriptions of the program that everyone knew was Auslink II. Uh, firstly, it was going to be a, a nation. Uh, they started talking about it, a Building Australia program, and those words were around in packages in December 2008. They were referring to projects as being the, the Building Australia program. But on the 5th of February 2009, in a COAG communique, Auslink was turned into the Nation Building Program. And that's the term, and that's the, term the George Orwell robots in the, in the Minister's office have settled on. And that's why we've got this bill of spin and rewriting of history. It says so much about this government that it considers this legislation a priority to be brought on in Budget Week. Now, the bill is designed to encourage the error, uh, create the myth that uh, nation building is something unique to Labor. It isn't. We see the Prime Minister running around with his, he with his helmet on, uh, tractors starting up to run behind him while the TV cameras are in sight. But that's the kind of spin we're getting, spin an image but no substance. 
The commitment to infrastructure lies with those who have delivered it over the years and delivered the sound economic management that was able to build things and pay for them, namely with the coalition. And I'd remind the members of the Labor Party that infrastructure spending in Australia boomed during the years of the coalition government. In spite of what you may hear the, the minister say during question time about us having done nothing in government, the reality is that, according to the Engineering Construction Activity Index published by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, in constant 2007 dollar terms, infrastructure spending increased from $21 billion in 1996 to over $56 billion by the year 2007. Put another way, infrastructure spending in Australia rose from just under 3 per cent of GDP in 1996 to nearly 5.5 per cent of GDP in 2007. So much for Labor's claims that infrastructure spending declined under the coalition. It is true that in the early years of government, the task of repaying the debt consumed resources that might otherwise have been spent on road funding. But when Auslink was introduced, there was a massive increase in road funding. For the first time, we had a national plan that dealt with infrastructure requirements in the years ahead, that, that schematically dealt with the corridors around the country, which, which, which identified the task and looked at the best way to deal with it, whether that be road or rail. And there was a significant increase in expenditure at that time. Now, it was, so it was the coalition that established Auslink and not Labor. It was the coalition that developed Australia's first national land transport plan since Federation, not Labor. It was the coalition that massively increased expenditure on upgrading road and rail, not Labor. Under, the Auslink, under Auslink, the coalition government spent more on nation building than any other Commonwealth government since Federation. In terms of Auslink II, the former coalition government in 2007-08 uh, ple uh, uh, pledged to invest $31 billion in transport infrastructure. Labor has never matched this, committing less money over the next five years on transport infrastructure than the coalition had pledged over the same period. So in 2009-10, uh, Labor will, will spend less, uh, nearly one $1.5 billion less on transport than in 2008-09. There are two key points here. Firstly, the Labor Party says that they've got a huge program on roads and rail infrastructure. The truth is they will spend less on road and rail over the next six years than the coalition had committed. Less, not more. This, this program represents a reduction in expenditure on road and rail over what the coalition had committed. And then secondly, they're talking about an impetus, a growth and an increase in expenditure to deal with a recession and that we need to have some kind of stimulus program. They're actually going to spend $1.5 billion less in 2009-10 next year than have been allocated this year. So indeed, the whole, of the, the whole of what Labor is talking about is empty spin. I'm opposed to the cuts in expenditure on road funding that Labor has actually introduced, and I'll explain why I'm opposed to that as we go further. Now, the, the key element of Labor's proposal was the idea that Infrastructure Australia would transparently assess projects on their merits. Sir Roderick Eddington was appointed with a group of mates to make these assessments and then to, uh, to uh, deliver advice to the government on which projects should be funded. Except they won't tell us any of what any of this advice was. They won't release any of the documents. Uh, they won't release any of the data. In fact, the only thing that we've got from uh, Infrastructure Australia was a list of projects of 97 projects uh, last year. And now, of course, we've got the, the latest National Infrastructure Priorities report of May 2009. But Labor hasn't chosen the projects that were identified under this list as the ones to be funded. There are some of those projects included, but others which were merely pro projects with potential have been funded. They've been brought forward. Others, others that are not on any of the lists have been funded. None of the lists have been funded. And in fact, the government has now publicly admitted that they chose the projects. 
The Infrastructure Australia uh, exercise was completely irrelevant, a waste of taxpayers' money, a waste of the resources of the people who meaningfully made contributions to the, to, to the assessment process. Their advice was simply ignored. Labor had already made up its mind uh, what projects were going to be funded. Many of them appear on Labor's election uh, promises list and, and, in fact, therefore, were, were, not even, were simply some way immune from Infrastructure Australia's processes. They're being funded on the basis of their merits or not. Sounds a lot like the Better Regions programs to me, the Better Regions rort, under which Labor election promises are being funded. Whether or not they have any merits, no one other than Labor candidates could even apply for this, for, for this particular scheme. And, and, and won't I be looking forward to the Auditor-General's report into this program? I hope the Auditor-General will also do a report into the Infrastructure Australia process, because it has also been designed to cover up the facts rather than to, to, in, fact, uh, to, to in fact to expose them. So we have here a list of projects that are being uh, that announced uh, that are in fact Labor's list. They're not Infrastructure Australia's list at all. It's the project that they have chosen. And that list includes some projects which, which, uh, which the, includes some projects which Labor has committed to that we had not. It does not include some projects that we had committed to that Labor hadn't. It commits some projects that both sides of politics had committed to. And, and uh, if the government wants to make decisions about what the pro which projects are going to be funded, be honest about it and say that they're doing, making all the decisions for their own political reasons. Don't try and blame Sir Roderick Eddington or somebody else and try and pretend there's some kind of open process when, in fact, it clearly hasn't been there. Can I talk now a little about some of the specific projects <coughs> that are being funded by the government? <coughs> there, are, there, there are really two projects that have been brought forward because on the, on the government's claims they're shovel ready. And this is a part of the problem that the government has got. It's got all of these grand ideas, but none of the projects are actually ready to start. Not only do they not have the money, they don't have the engineering plans, they don't have the, 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 the planning process through, and so some of these projects are years and years away. Indeed, many of the projects in this budget go out for more than a decade before they're actually, before they're actually, uh, before they're actually funded. So much for them being a stimulus package. But there were two projects that were genuinely shovel-ready. Shovel One was the F3 to Brankston uh, Road uh, in, in the Hunter Valley. That was genuinely ready because the previous government had spent $109 million getting it genuinely ready. Purchased the land, uh, got, the, got the, uh, the design process underway and it was ready to go. Indeed, the member for Hunter was very supportive of this project before the last election. But on the very day after the election, he withdrew his support. He withdrew his support. And the project was put on hold for 18 months. Here was a project that was shovel ready 18 months ago, and Labor did nothing. Instead, they commissioned a new study, <coughs> a new report on the traffic needs of the Hunter. I don't know what's happened to that study. I haven't seen the light of it yet, but they're going ahead with the project that we had ready to go. All Labor has done with this project was to delay it for 18 months by which time the cost has gone up further. And so it was ready all right. It was shovel ready. But give the credit where it was due, it was shovel ready because the previous government had got it shovel ready. But of course, we can't have the, gov the previous government being given too much credit for it. It's not going to be called the F3 to Brankston anymore. In a new piece of spin, it's now going to be called the Hunter Expressway. So somebody might think that it's actually a different project from the one that they held up for 18 months. Now, the second project that was genuinely shovel-ready is the 12-kilometre section of the Karoi to Curra Road on the Bruce Highway. Now, that's shovel-ready because the Queensland government has got it shovel-ready because it's the road that goes around the Traveston Crossing Dam. The Traveston Crossing Dam, if it's built, and we all hope it won't be built, that the Commonwealth will have the good sense uh, to honour its environmental responsibilities and stop the project, but if it goes ahead nine kilometres of the Bruce Highway will be flooded. Nine kilometres will go underwater by 2011. So if the government doesn't build this road, start building this road now, there will be a nine kilometre gap in the, in the national highway that you'll have to traverse by boat. So that's why it's, this project is shovel ready. In fact, the Queensland Minister for, for Roads has said before the last state election that they were going to pay for the whole road themselves. The Queensland government intended to build this, to actually fund it, and they had the money there to fund it. 
the, the Commonwealth government has been sold, have been conned into funding a project that the Queensland government intended to pay for themselves, and they're trying to make some kind of a virtue of it. The second thing that the minister often says is that they're doing it when the previous government didn't do it. Well, again, let me make the point absolutely clear. It was the previous government that got the four-lane highway up to Karoi. It was the previous government that significantly upgraded the, project, upgraded the existing road, including the, 80, the, the work that's being done through Gympie at the present time. And it was the previous government that has done the design work to get it to a stage where the project is, in fact, now a route identified uh, where, in fact, the project can proceed. That hadn't been done by previous Labor state governments. But we've done all that work, and so we got it to that stage. And so this is a project that is shovel ready because it's a part of a dam scheme that the state government had, had already developed. Can I also make some comments about the quite appalling way in which the minister and the prime minister have tried to make out that this is some kind of a compassionate program? He referred to the 13 people who have been killed on this section of road over recent years. There have, in fact, been 54 lives lost between Karoi and Curra uh, over that period of time, only 13 of them on this section, and very few, if any, since the road was upgraded in 2006. A significant amount of money was spent on safety improvements on that section of the road, uh, including a centre, uh, a, a centre fence uh, through, the, through the road, <laughs> because this section had, had been laid by a, a stone mastic service which would prove to be unsafe in wet, wet times. So most of the accidents and fatalities that have been referred to have in fact been on a section of road that has currently been repaired, that, that, is, that has subsequently been repaired. So if they actually want to fix the, the places where the people are dying at the present time, they should choose other sections. Indeed, there was a, there was a serious accident again just uh, earlier this week, mother critical not on the section that the, that the Prime Minister is out there with his hard hat pretending that they're trying to save the, 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 to deal with the safety problems on the road. Now, let me say there are safety problems on all of the road, and it all needs to be fixed, and, and, and it is reasonable that this, that this section also be considered in that context. However, the government hasn't solved the safety problems on Karoi to Curra by building this section of road. The most dangerous sections still remain to be done. And so I call on the government. To, to, to honour the coalition's commitment made at the last election to complete this section by 2020, put forward the necessary funding to make sure that there will be an ongoing program so that, the, that, this, that this death highway can in fact, uh, can, can in fact be, uh, be built. Uh, so th there, are, there are many other projects of, uh, of this nature that remain on the list, uh, key, uh, but key Labor election promises remain unfulfilled. Labor's pledge to allocate $840 million for a dedicated freight uh, line between Strathfield and Gosford, dealing with one of the most serious rail freight bottlenecks on the East Coast, uh, remains delayed for another study. We, we're still waiting for Labor to duplicate the Western Highway from Bacchus Marsh to the South Australian border, as it promised, and for Labor to honour its commitment for $2.5 billion to the missing link from the Gateway Motorway to Nudgee in North Brisbane. Uh, we, we, we need to look at some of the other projects that are being funded. Uh, it's quite interesting that the government is going to spend significant funding on the Pacific Highway, as did, as did the coalition. Uh, however, Labor has made a significant change. Previously, this was a, a project that was being jointly funded by the New South Wales and, and the Commonwealth government. It was a 50-50 project. The, the Commonwealth is now going to pick up the full cost of the Pacific Highway letting New South Wales off their 50 per cent of the cost. That's a $5 billion plus gift to the, New South, the bankrupt New South Wales Labor government. Instead of paying their share, they've been let off the hook. Look at some of the other projects that are on this list, uh, such as the, uh, the, 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 uh, the proposal to, put, to uh, do a study on the Sydney West Metro, uh, Metro announced a $91 million study. The actual cost of this project will be about $6 billion. There's a $20 million study for the Brisbane inner city rail. That project is going to cost about $14 billion. So to, Labor can't pretend it's actually building these things. They're just actually studying. Uh, so that we're going to have a study-led recovery. Then what about the increased expenditure on the Ipswich motorway? This is because the cost of the scheme is blown out of all proportion. <coughs> now, there, there's a $365 million for the Gold Coast right railway. 
and that's only a possible equity contribution. No guarantee the project's even going to go ahead. It's only described as a possible equity contribution. So who knows whether we'll get any real benefit from that as well. The Darwin port, the Okergy port, all require significant investments by other parties. And if anyone had any idea that perhaps this was some kind of a genuine and honest process, we've only got to look at the Adelaide Obam. The Adelaide Obam project, which was announced as a priority project, was not even requested by the South Australian government. It was never on the shortlist by IA that was published in December last year, and yet it is being funded. Shame. It's being funded. They, uh, and when, the, when it was announced, the minister in South Australia was honest enough. Well, that's a nice surprise. We didn't even ask for it. <laughs> and yet it's supposed to be such a magnificent priority. And this is the hypocrisy of the way in which this government has, has, um, has, has been behaving. It's addicted to spin. Now, I want to deal with, uh, in the few minutes that are available to me, some of the other features of the bill, which again demonstrate some disturbing trends. It's clear that, this is a, that Labor is firing another bullet in its war against regional Australia in this legislation. We already know that of the $8.4 billion of new projects funded from, former, from the former government's surplus, most will be spent on urban pa pa passenger transport uh, projects. There's a significant shift in funding in what the government has announced, away from uh, roads and rail projects, especially in regional areas, uh, to urban public transport. Now, this bill mo modifies part six of the Principal Act to enact a basic change to what was known as the Osling Strategic Regional Projects. Members may recall that the Strategic Regional Program was designed to assist state and local governments to build better transport networks to support industry, tourism and economic development. The purpose of the strategic regional program was to foster partnerships and to develop networks for, to, to, to upgrade infrastructure-related projects on areas off the national uh, land transport network. Around $469 million went to fund projects under the strategic regional program between 2004-07, and there are many very worthwhile projects around the nation that benefited from that funding. Well, that's going to change because the government wants to amend section five of the, 55 of the Act to remove all references to regional and simply name the Strategic Regional Initiative to a nation-building program off-network project. In other words, the key characteristic of the Strategic Regional Program will cease to exist, and funding will now be available for urban Australia. Now, you've got a regional strategic roads program, and now it's going to be spent in the cities. Now, this is a clear sh a shift of priorities uh, from, the, from the Labor Party, and it will be opposed by the coalition. Uh, th they've, they've clearly identified a, a, a long list of projects that they intend to fund with this, with this money. $762.5 million, or 86 per cent of what's to be available, has been set aside to fund Labor's election promises. Now, many of these promises were made in areas that couldn't be funded under the regional strategic program because it didn't meet the guidelines. And so they're getting rid of the program so they can fund ill-thought-out, ill-considered uh, and ill-valued projects uh, because they were simply Labor Party's election stunts. So this amendment clears the legislative path to use these significant funds for transport-related infrastructure away from regional Australia. Now, there's a second element where, there's been, where there is a major change which we will oppose. And that is the changes to the Black Spot program, a very successful program that has saved many lives. The Bureau of Transport Economics estimates that by 2007 the Black Spot program saved at least 130 lives and prevented 6,000 serious accidents by upgrading 4,200 dangerous sites on state, lo state and local roads. Now, this was a coalition initiative. We had to restore it after Labor had abolished the program. And we allocated $30 million in 2008-09 and $60 million in 2009-10 to extend its coverage. This is on top of the government's announcement in, De in December 2008 that it would more than double the Black Spot program for 2008-09 from $50 million to $110 million. So it's pleasing that, the, that, the, that, the, that this Labor government has not done what the previous Labor government did and abolished the program, but has indeed committed some additional funding. And we welcome that. However, what they are doing now is, to, is proposing to change the very nature of the Black Spot program so the benefits will not flow in the future to local roads and streets 
to, to, to projects uh, in local communities where there have been accidents. In fact, the black spot funding is, is now going to be available to be spent on the national network. It will be sub subsumed into the highway system. Now, I accept that there are dangerous spots on, their, on our highways, but there is a very substantial funding program that, that provides support for upgrading the highways. We shouldn't be taking away money from local projects on streets and roads uh, uh, to be spent on the national highway network. Now, I wonder whether we'll see any money left on the local roads or whether it's all now going to go on one or two projects in the national highway would take all this money away. So we'll be opposing that element of, of the bill and be putting forward an amendment to keep the black spots funding for areas off the national land transport network. They can be in both city or country as they are now, but they should not be allocated into an area which is already uh, funded in substantial quantities through other programs. So this is a bill that's, uh, that's all about government spin. Unfortunately, Labor is attempting to rewrite history again to take out of the public's memory some of the excellent work the previous government did in road and rail funding, and in particular, well-known names like Auslink uh, are to disappear so that, they can, uh, so that any association with the projects of the previous government can be written away. Now, that is just typical of the way in which uh, Labor governments behave. It's all spin. It's all about TV images, 30-second uh, spots on, on, on the news. The it's all spin. There's no substance. Has expired. Yeah. Uh, the question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Werriwa. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I've got to say, there's nothing like living in the past and dwelling on memories well back in them, particularly when they didn't deliver on any of this stuff. They may have wanted to speculate at one period of time, but in terms of delivery, I've got to say the shadow minister has got a, a lot to answer for. They had 12 years to actually uh, do various things that he had. Uh, He's just mentioned here, and I've got to say, Mr. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, they did precious little. The Australian Labor Party in government has always been a party that's been dedicated to building this nation. It's worth acknowledging uh, that uh, this has been delivered over a long period of time. Any student of politics uh, uh, will actually know the, uh, the values of the, um, uh, of the Chifley government and its initiation of the, uh, the hydroelectricity uh, scheme for the Snowy Mountains. It, it was a nation-building government. Indeed, the, the Hawke government in opening up the economy to uh, competition. Paul Keating in building a Better Cities program, which was introduced. A broad range of strategies and reforms that indicated innovation, housing programs, a renewal of focus and urban consolidation. They were big-ticket governments. I know they might get a, a few criticisms from people opposite that want to dwell in the past, but you look at the, the contributions that those governments made in terms of putting um, not only innovation forward but building, building for this nation's future. I've got to say, vast contrast to the uh, previous Howard administration, uh, wasted opportunities. Um, that it, it just failed. It failed to actually build on that, uh, that, that tradition of nation building. It squandered. Uh, it uh, actually squandered the nation's future. We saw that, whether it be education, now, their contribution to edu education, Madam Deputy Speaker, was to rip $1 billion out of the system. That, that wasn't bad. That was their first year of government. They also managed to take billions of dollars out of the health care system. Again, not exactly what you put down to be uh, uh, nation-building efforts. But for too long, our national budgets, have, uh, under, the, under a coalition government, had been short-sighted. They just focused only and only on the next election. Uh, they continued to ignore the big challenges faced by this country. They squandered the proceedings of the mining boom, the resources, uh, uh, opportunities we had. What they did not do is invest in this country's future. Madam Deputy, there just can't be an argument about that. Those officers just can't get up here and try and actually spin their way out of it. They had the time, they have a track record, and their track record in this regard was failure. The bill before the House today, Madam Deputy Speaker, reiterates Labor's commitment be to being a, a, a nation-building party. Uh, this, um, this bill, therefore, should be supported and should be supported in the, in its, uh, fully by all members of this par uh, parliament if they actually do genuinely believe in nation-building. Not like uh, the support that seems to be offered by the leader of the uh, um, uh, 
uh, opposition business in his motion of privilege yesterday, where it seems that uh, members opposite are becoming hopelessly embarrassed when they've got to visit their local electorate, go and talk to schools, go and talk to uh, local councils about road-based infrastructure, and also lay credit to it and come in this place and vote against it. No wonder they feel embarrassed. They should be embarrassed. You know, this is not what people put them into parliament to do. Uh, from one hand, go out and try and get, capture as much press as they can in their local electorates uh, by aligning themselves with Labor-led projects to come into this House and vote it down. And that's what they've attempted to do and uh, do continually. And my colleague here is probably going to—he oh. probably wants to have another go at it. Yes, the shadow minister. Uh, a quorum required. Yes. Ring the bells. Sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, July. <laughs> no, we're going to eyeball you from here. <laughs> no, don't worry, you'll never be over there. Have a decide. How's your Hebrew? Do you speak Hebrew? I read it. Ah, right. My reading has collapsed. Um, I didn't, it doesn't take long. I mean, like, if I look at the map, it takes five minutes. Yeah. Come back. I could have... <coughs> <coughs> but my conversation is reasonable within the narrow Great. And you're ahead of me. All my kids speak really good conversation in primary school. Right. And I don't. So my, wife no. hmm? my wife does. My wife does too. But she went to a Hebrew speaking school in the second half of children. She was going to the office. Yeah. Oh. So an immersion. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So she studied Spanish. Is, and is, is she Australian or? Born in China. Hmm? Australian, but she's born in China. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. And, uh, a quorum's present. Where did you The member for Werriwan. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, look, I, I know it is embarrassing. I, I know it is embarrassing for those opposite to have to sit down and hear this. And for someone to actually have to come here and point out the facts, but yeah, Matt, oh, Greg, I've got to say I actually do wish that, that during that quorum a few of your other colleagues turned up. I would have actually liked to have seen a member of Cook here. The member of Cook, Madam Deputy Speaker, this bill is uh, is going to be very much concerned about the issue about black spots. So that is very significant. It goes to the heart of this bill. Um, this they want to oppose the important aspects of the black. Prot's uh, program within, um, as it's contained in this bill. But what do they say when it gets down to their electorates? A member of Cook, he just got $50,000 for the installation of guardrails in the Pacific Highway at Sylvania. I'm glad he didn't run down to this quorum. Or the member for Patterson. Now, you know, big bold Bob is, is, is likely to do many things in this House, but he hasn't come in here and said how he welcomed the $450,000 for the, uh, uh, for the installation of traffic lights on the New England Highway at Medford. And uh, the member for Cowper, he just sat behind the diatribe by his, uh, by his uh, leader, uh, 
uh, of the Nationals in the House, but the member for Cowper got $75,000 uh, for separate projects, three separate projects on the Pacific Highway in uh, Koibana, Yurunga and uh, Karindai. Madam Deputy Speaker, if they got out there, they certainly actually made much of these projects in their electorate. They went out and tried to claim credit for these things. But the facts of the matter, they're here and they're going to be here again today, Madam Deputy Speaker, voting against this part of the program. So when it comes to the issue of uh, what, should a, uh, uh, what should this op opposition be um, uh, tagged as, hypocritical actually comes to mind uh, from my point of view. Madam Deputy Speaker, this bill is central to the delivery of a, a 26.4 billion road and rail program, the National Building, um, building Program. The bill proposes to, changes to ensure that more effective provision of uh, uh, major road and rail infrastructure projects uh, of the, throughout the national network, as well as various projects that are off the network, but also uh, a more efficient provision, uh, an application of the Roads Recovery Program and the Black Spot Program, two of them at, uh, which I've just mentioned uh, three, or rather uh, projects were just mentioned that fall into coalition electorates now. Um, we need to make these changes now uh, to make sure that we can deliver on our road and rail infrastructure program in the most efficient and effective way. Additionally, Madam Deputy Speaker, this budget has been carefully uh, crafted to stimulate the economy now to support jobs, but also funding the long-term savings infrastructure to ensure that the fiscal stability and ensuring that uh, this country uh, has a net debt remaining the lowest of all major advanced economies in the world. Madam, Madam Deputy Speaker, that might be a tall order. But that's something we have committed ourselves to. It's something that those on the opposition, despite all the ranting, the raving, we have heard nothing yet of what their plan would be. Absolutely nothing. Their plan would probably, you know, at this stage, they, they like what we're doing in relation to schools. Well, look, at least in the local media, they like that. They came here again in terms of our investment, a $17.4 billion investment in education. And they opposed it. They, they opposed a bill that led to the building the education revolution. They came into this place and also opposed what we committed to put in respect to building of social housing, the, uh, the 20,000 additional houses. But in addition to that, also opposed the level of maintenance uh, for the refurbishment of existing uh, public housing stock. Madam Deputy Speaker, they do have a track record. They've already been tagged. You know, they are hypocritical to the extreme. They don't have a position in respect to the economy. and That's pretty clear when you look at the interchanges of, uh, uh, that have occurred in the media, particularly when you contrast the views of, um, of uh, the shadow treasurer and that of his leader. Um, certainly, Madam Deputy Speaker, if you listen to what they've actually said and listen to what uh, uh, Honest Joe has said about uh, uh, his position in terms of borrowings, I mean the opposition treasurer, um, they would be running a debt. Of course they would. They, they, if you listen to what they think, they think, if you listen to the opposition's uh, leader, leader's speech to the in budget reply, not once did they refer to the effect of the world financial crisis. They've tried to actually perpetuate this myth that the, the difficulties that we find ourselves in now is a consequence of 18 months of a Labor government. Madam Deputy Speaker, they don't believe that. No one in the Australian economy, no one, no one in their uh, wild streams believes that. Most people have got a TV set. If they don't, they read a newspaper. They actually know what's going on out there. And yet they want to come in here and try and perpetuate these myths uh, with a view to not saying what they would do but uh, simply vote against those initiatives that have been uh, taken up by this government. Now, I concede that the opposition leader has got a very hard uh, job. Now, I often said that when I was in opposition ourselves. I think the hardest job in the parliament must be an opposition leader. And, and clearly, it is a difficult job. I feel sorry for the bloke. But um, I, I, I am hard. You know, I, actually, you know, I have feelings too. But, but Look at what has occurred. Nothing has occurred there that hasn't been in someone's her own personal political interest. This is an opposition based on spin. It's not based on anything in contributing to the national debate. It's about running a scare campaign. 
That's what this opposition is about. And uh, just while I'm on the, on the topic of the opposition leader, I guess uh, he's got one of those problems we'd all love to have. Uh, I noticed from reading the Australian newspaper this morning um, that uh, uh, of the BRW top 200 list, top 200 the richest people in, in the country, he he has now an uh, asset worth $178,000. Uh, no wonder there. And the member for Wairarua resume your seat. Attention is being drawn to the state of the house. A quorum required. All right. <laughs> Please. Ring the bell for four minutes. The quorum is present. Could uh, members uh, resume their seats or quietly leave the chamber? The member for Werriwa. Well, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I, once again, I acknowledge the embarrassment that what I've said has caused the other side. But this, this, these, these uh, childhood uh, uh, sort of tactics that they want to employ, uh, dis disrupting the parliament. No. I've got to say, no. Madam Deputy Speaker, obviously they're, they're feeling a bit precious about something. Now, I've actually invited the William Carey Christian School to visit the parliament today, and uh, I would hate to think that this childish uh, uh, and precious extreme of uh, 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 tactical aspects by, by the opposition, uh, I'd hate to that this would leave an indelible mark on the, these young people's minds about how this, uh, uh, how this opposition uh, uh, actually really does perform. I, I would expect that they could take away from this debate the fact that they generally, in the opposition, don't care about the issues in this bill. They don't care about the uh, efficient delivery of road and rail infrastructure around the country, but they do care about playing political games in this parliament. Now, I would hate to think young minds be corrupted like that. I wish you could play a slightly more, uh, uh, more responsible role when it comes to the debate and actually have a, a contest of ideas. I would welcome the opportunity of sitting up here eyeballing on the other side someone who wants to have an argument about the application of this bill and what it means for their electorate. I would like the member for Cowper to come in here and either, either come in here and be honest to say would he support uh, the, those traffic lights going to New England Highway. Uh, oh, I think that was, uh, uh, that was actually the member for, um, for Patterson. But um, the member for Cook, 
He should actually come in here and actually have the argument. Does he want that money? I'm dead sure that when he goes and talks to his local newspaper, which I can't remember which one's down there at the moment, but uh, uh, he'll have his photo on the front page of that and claiming some, uh, uh, some responsibility for getting that $50,000 uh, for the guardrails on the Pacific Highway. None of these people, by the way, none of these people who are, are net beneficiaries for these programs, these three programs here, have even had the audacity to front up in this parliament and uh, be honest about the approach. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, People listening to this debate can at least take away one thing. It is the Labor government that is committed to nation building. This is a Labor government that's going to roll these things out, generating jobs now, stimulating employment and demand now, but providing the assets and infrastructure we need for the economic future of this country. Um, as much as uh, they hate it, they know that it's true. They know that in their heart of hearts, and that's why they all go scurrying away here. Uh, they don't want to participate in this debate because that they know what we've said is actually right on the money when it comes to uh, that. I'd actually just like to finish in the short time I have and uh, simply mentioning some of the benefits that I have actually attained in respect to my own area of, uh, of Campbelltown. Uh, we have actually done reasonably well in terms of black spot funding there. Uh, we have been able to ensure that the road safety aspects of a number of uh, projects, three specific projects, uh, one in the, um, in uh, uh, Blairmont, one in um, Glenfield and one in Minter are being taken care of. We actually care, care about the safety of those people, their families and the victims of, that are affected by road accidents, and also of those police and emergency service people who have to go and actually the attend these accidents as well. The member's time has expired. I call the member for Herbert. Deputy Speaker, uh, thank you. I'm here on behalf of the people of Townsville. I'm here on behalf of the people of North Queensland. I'm here on behalf of the people of rural and regional Australia. And I'm glad that the member for Dawson is with me because likely both of us will move an amendment to this bill. Because this bill should be called Southern Votes Are More Important Than Northern Lives. Right. And the member for Dawson well knows, and I don't have to tell him. Order. I don't have to tell him about Dawson. the terrible state of the Bruce Highway in North Queensland. And I don't have to tell him what needs to be done but has remained unfunded in this current uh, program. It's almost the potholes shake hands with each other. And in relation to the Port Access Road, that's not the Bruce Highway, sir, as you well know. And it's the Bruce Highway that we need to attend to. There is no doubt about that. And with, stay here, Jason. Stay. Um, and with your indulgence, uh, Deputy Speaker, um, I'm joined by the member for Blacksland here, and I understand uh, one of his schools is in the gallery. Uh, we've got St Mary's Primary School uh, from uh, George's Hall uh, in Western Sydney. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Parliament of Australia. You've got a very fine uh, member here um, in uh, for Parliament. Thank you, Jason. Um, Back to uh, North Queensland. The federal government needs to make the Bruce Highway survivable for Queenslanders, and in fact all Australians. And unfortunately, unfortunately, Member for Dawson, how do you explain this? You'd rather shave 28 minutes off a journey between Newcastle and the Hunter region, not even on the National Highway, uh, rather than looking after the National Highway in North Queensland. How can your government get it so wrong? The Hunter Expressway is not even on roads of Australia's list of priority projects, and yet it gets $1.45 billion, and North Queensland the Bruce Highway is only allocated a third of that. Where is the priority? Why has it gone wrong? It, it seems to you, Member for Dawson, that your party rates Hunter region votes as more important uh, than the lives of North Queenslanders. And you need to stand up for North Queenslanders. You're not standing up for North Queenslanders. And that's what our role is here in the parliament. And that's why I'm here at the dispatch box, standing up for North Queenslanders. And Order. The member for Dawson. And of course, to add insult to injury, for the projects that are being funded, what's going to happen is I ask the question, is your super really yours? 
because as taxpayers we've been bombarded with rhetoric about the wonders and benefits of the $42 billion nation building plan, and we've even footed the advertising bill, but we're going to pay much more than just advertising. See, the government can't actually afford to pay for all these projects it's committed to, so it's seeking private investors. The trouble is private investors have more sense than to put money into poorly uh, costed and financially unviable projects. So where's the money going to come from? Well, the, uh, the government's advisory group, Infrastructure Australia, has the answer. The plan is to use the $1 trillion of super, super uh, that Australians have put away for their retirement to plug the $58 billion hole in the disastrous nation building program. But I'll come back to that uh, in due course. In relation to um, the overview and what North Queenslanders are seeing, they're asking this, these questions. Why are 15,934 dead people getting an estimated $14.3 million in tax bonus payments? How could that be? How is it that Labor is spending $50.8 million to advertise Labor policy? How is it that the broadband waste keeps coming. Taxpayers will pay $703,000 worth of expenses racked up by Labor's broadband panel of experts, uh, and uh, we have this ongoing problem with potholes on the Bruce Highway. And of course, the cash splash has put our AAA credit rating at risk, and all Australians will be very concerned about that. This bill that's before the Parliament is just another example of the Rudd Labor government's obsession with spin. The spill seeks to rename the Osling program, as you know, the former government's program, which was established by the coalition government in 2005. It was a landmark program when it was established. It created the first national transport framework in Australia. Osling 1 commenced in 2004-05 and ran to 2008-09. Osling 2 was scheduled to run from 2009-10 to 2013-14 until Labor became determined to rename the program. The Labor Party referred to Auslink during the 2007 federal election campaign. From 2008, however, it became clear that the new Rudd government disliked referring to a successful coalition program, so the renaming process began. The first attempt in December 2008 was to call it Building Australia Program. This must have failed the test of Labor's spin doctors as the second name was developed just three months later in February 2009. Auslink programs began being referred to as nation building. So, thus we see the new name uh, in the present bill. What we can see from the Rudd government is the desire to claim a successful coalition program as their own, and I mean a successful coalition program. Rather than display a true commitment to the Australian transport network, the bill displays the Rudd government's commitment to spin. Labor's driven us into debt. They've turned a healthy surplus left by the coalition government into $58 billion of debt this coming year. During this time of economic crisis, rather than show true commitment to Australian transport networks, they're more concerned with political acts of renaming projects. Labor has lost control. Labor has lost control of the nation's finances. Labor's reckless spending has built a mountain of debt we may never uh, pay off, may never pay off. Everything Labor turns touches to debt. Two thirds of Labor's debt is a product of their own new spending commitments. Labor spent $10 million an hour for every hour since they were elected on new commitments. Extraordinary. Labor are assuming 12 years of economic miracles to pay off their mountain of debt by 2022. And we all see as we sit in question time Labor's refusal to answer the opposition's questions about how that debt is actually going to be paid off. And you can see by their silence they don't know. And I hope the Australian people see that. Labor is not knowing for presiding over economic miracles or paying off of debt, especially under Rudd run, run and Swan. And uh, alas, I think our strong record of paying off Labor's debt will be required again when we return to government. And we'll do those, those, um, those tough, uh, make those tough decisions necessary to do it. What uh, the member for Dawson now has got to answer is um, the following point. The coalition, uh, of course, is committed to Australia's transport infrastructure, and that's why we pledged an investment of $31 billion in 2007-08 for Auslink 2. But that's uh, not what we see now um, from the Labor government. 
Labor has not committed the same level of funding to the national transport network. Despite all the rhetoric we hear, Labor has not committed the same level of funding that we committed to the national transport network. La well, here's the, here's the uh, facts. Here's the facts. Labor's claims to care about the transport infrastructure system ring false. The 2009-2010 budget provides for nearly $2 billion less than their spending on land transport infrastructure in 2008-09. Your $2 billion on your own budget papers, your own budget papers, your $2 billion less this year than last year. $2 billion in your own budget papers. Despite all the spin and branding so undertaken by Labor, they're not delivering true and proper support to the national land transport network. This bill is what's come to expect from the Rudd government. The amendments in the Nation Building Program National Land Transport Act amendment bill demonstrates how the government does not support regional Australia. And, and this is my next Solomon point. The later. government is not supporting regional Australia. And that's why the members for Dawson should be standing with me, standing with me as uh, joining colleagues. And of course, the member for Solomon from regional Australia should be standing with me demanding our fair share of the government largesse that's currently being spent in the metropolitans. A large proportion of the funding for new projects will be spent in urban areas. Urban areas. Regional Australia misses out yet again. The Rudd government seems only concerned with urban Australia, and I'm disappointed that my fellow regional colleagues are not supporting me in standing up for regional Australia. The amendments in this bill alter part six the of the uh, Auslink National Land Transport Act 2005. Uh, under the coalition government's strategic regional program, funding, and that's important, the strategic regional, regional, our area guys, the regional program, funding was provided to projects not on the national land transport network, most notably in regional areas. The coalition understands the needs of regional Australia and supported valuable projects in such areas. Surprise, surprise. The Rudd government intends to revoke this support for regional Australia. Member for Dawson, I hope you're listening. This bill revokes support for regional Australia. They seek to do this by amending section 55 to rename the strategic regional project to the nation building program one off, uh, off network project. The nation building program off network project. Under this change, the funds previously earmarked for regional projects could now go to an urban area and, under the track record of the Labor government, will likely go to an urban area. Labor's uh, target is the language of the bill. Attempts to remove the word regional are at the heart of this, the, but these amendments do more than alter language. They're, they're telling of the Rudd government's priorities. I fear for North Queensland. I fear we're going to get less and less money allocated to our dangerous road system. Uh, they're telling of the uh, regional industries, sorry, become only industries. Regional communities become only communities. The bill is trying to delete regional Australia from the program, and I'm strongly opposed to these changes. I want regional remaining in the language of the government and the language of the Act. It's very important that the parliament sends a message uh, to the bureaucracy and to the people of Australia that regional is important. The bill also seeks to allow areas on the National Land Transport Network to be entitled to funding under the Black Spot program. This is a large change. Councils will be very unhappy with this. The Black Spot program, originally established by the coalition government, is designed for local roads. It's unfortunate that parts of our national highway are dangerous. Provision and funding for areas on the national network already exist. But these areas should not be funded at the expense of funding dangerous local roads. Surely that's common sense. I don't understand why the uh, Rudd government is taking away a very sensible coalition program. And of course, that affects so much our local councils. Of course, under the amendments contained in this bill, the Black Spot program itself is subject to a uh, name change. The Osling Black Spot project becomes the Nation Building Black Spot project. 
the Rudd government are determined to rebrand Auslink as their own and they undertake renaming policies on a project as important as this one. The Rudd government has driven Australia into debt. It's lost its focus on regional Australia. They're a government that's unable to manage the Australian economy and, in fact, have lost control of our nation's finances. They're clearly unwilling to demonstrate the same commitment as the coalition to the national land transport network. In a failed attempt to distract all of these things from these things, they engage in needless spin. I want to return to where I started, back to um, regional Australia and particularly North Queensland. Yes, there's uh, some money uh, announced in the budget for the uh, Douglas Arterial duplication. That was previously announced a year ago. There's money in the, in the budget for Cardwell Range realignment. That was announced a year ago. There's work on the Townsville Port Access Road, which was announced a year ago. But the spin is to try to get North Queenslanders to think, these are new projects. Well, they're not new projects. They've been previously announced a year ago. And you can't keep claiming credit for the same project as if it's a new project, because people will see it for what it is, government uh, spin. And I want the member for Dawson to tell me what he thinks about the importance of the Townsville Mount Isa rail corridor and why, um, why the government has not funded money for that very important nation-building corridor. Why is that? The, um, the North West Minerals uh, Province so much relies on that rail corridor. The rail is old and out of date. It's uh, not heavy enough in gauge to carry the weights. There's not enough passing loops. And why the uh, member for Dawson doesn't support investment into the rail corridor, the 900 to 1,000 kilometre rail corridor from Townsville to Mount Isa, I don't know. It's very, very odd. And, and I'd like to conclude and make this challenge to the member for Dawson. What about the much-needed passing lanes on the Bruce Highway. What, what about them? We need passing lanes every five kilometres. You're the government and you've just dropped North Queensland as a priority. We're second-class citizens. You're more interested in the people of Newcastle than the people of Darwin or Townsville or Mackay. And that's sad. It really is sad. The wealth of this country comes out of regional Australia. Yes, we don't have the population, and ergo we don't have the votes. And that's the uh, spin from the Rudd government, go where the votes are. But at the end of the day, if this nation is going to be prosperous, it has to have regional infrastructure, proper regional infrastructure, as it does have proper urban infrastructure. We haven't got that. And when this speech is reported uh, in the Mackay Mercury and the Townsville Bulletin, um, the residents of North Queensland will see that I was standing up for North Queensland, the member for Dawson was opposing me. Deputy Speaker, um, I thank uh, the House. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member, the member, the member for Dawson. I'm actually trying to help him here. The member for Dawson, if you are seeking leave, I will have to ask the opposition if leave is granted. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. The member for Dawson will resume his seat. The member for Dawson can seek to table the document when he has the call to make his speech. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Kingston. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I do rise today to support a bill that is central to the effective delivery of the government's $26.4 billion road and rail program, the, national building pro the nation building program. And the previous speaker spoke about, for some reason, he spoke about why he didn't believe that we should build this nation. This program before the House today delivers to projects that will support jobs today and jobs tomorrow. This program funds essential road and rail upgrades that will improve the capacity of the Australian economy long into the future. This investment in infrastructure is essential if Australia is going to get uh, out of the infrastructure deficit left to us by the previous government. And while the previous government, uh, as we, we know, enjoyed the fruits of the mining boom, 
They squandered. They used that. They didn't use that opportunity wisely. They squandered the opportunity to invest in critical economic infrastructure for the country's long-term future. And it's now been left to our government, to this government, to rebuild Australia. And uh, we have taken this this challenge up with gusto, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I would like to take this opportunity to commend the Minister for Infrastructure for delivering the nation building program and doing so with the full support of the states. And this support does uh, come because, unlike the previous government, who, like, when they talked about infrastructure, all they really liked to do was just blame the other side. Uh, not, oh, well, well, the member for Sturt might like to listen to some of this. It might. There's some very, very the important the things in this. The member for Kingston will resume her seat. It's actually in the uh, prorogue of the chair who I give the call to. The member for Sturt has the call. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I appreciate you giving me the call, and I draw your attention to the state of the house. The member for <coughs> Sturt is a quorum required. Ring the bells until quorum is present. I will remind the member for Sturt, though, it is in the chair's prorogue to give the call. Present. No, I killed. Quorum's present. The member for Kingston has the call and will be heard in silence. But I do know that the op opposition uh, and members of the previous government don't like to talk about their failings, but I am going to talk about them. They continue to blame, you know, they continue to blame the uh, states for infrastructure, playing this blame game. So the minister for infrastructure has 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 looked at being cooperative with the states. And what, why I do commend him is that he is committed to the real needs of local communities and committed to working with the states, with the states to deliver important pieces of critical infrastructure for this nation. I'd just like to talk about a couple of these examples of investment in my electorate of Kingston. Firstly, among the projects funded by the government's nation building program is the Victor Harbour Road and Main South Road intersection upgrade. And this project will receive uh, $3.5 million from the federal government in this budget to ensure that construction is completed by 2010. And the upgrade will provide three northbound lanes uh, on Victor Harbour Road instead of one, three north northbound lanes on Main South Road extending through to the Flemington Bridge, 
two southbound uh, lanes to the Victor Harbour Road, two southbound lanes between Seaford Road and Victor Harbour, and two right turn lanes into Seaford Road, and a left turn acceleration lane uh, out of Seaford Road. And this is a big boost for safety uh, for the people that use this uh, road in the southern suburbs of Adelaide. And this will also ease congestion at an incredibly very busy intersection. It's also another example of this government delivering on its election promises. Now, fixing this intersection will improve access to the Flurio Peninsula. And the Flurio Peninsula is a lovely destination for holidaymakers. But often on long weekends there is a huge amount of frustration at this intersection. So this intersection will improve access and stop frustrated motorists from taking a parallel route through Old Nor the Old Norlunga Township. And this means less through traffic on our local roads, which will improve safety and quality of life for those in Old Norlunga. Now, this improvement uh, of the Victor Harbour Road has been demanded for locals for some time, however, it was ignored by the previous government. And I just want to illustrate this by quoting David, who lives in the southern suburbs. And he sent me an email and I quote, Hi Amanda, I have lived down south for six years and the bottleneck at Victor Harbour turnoff is getting beyond a joke in the mornings. Now I was pleased to tell David that it's this government who is listening to local residents and is doing something about it. In addition to dealing with one of Adelaide's worst bottlenecks, the Nation Building Program provides funding for Black Spot, uh, the Black Spot Program, which will provide funding in my electorate for upgrades at Wickham Hill Road at McLaren Flat and Meadows Road at Wollonga Hill. And, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, this means an extra $235,000 invested for an extension of guardrail, shoulder ceiling de delineation and a signage on a three-kilometre section of Wickham Road, and $185,000 for shoulder ceiling and on a three-kilometre section of Meadows Road at Willunga. These projects are critical for safety of residents that use this area. There's been a lot of uh, times brought up with me about the safety of some of these roads, and I'm very pleased to let the residents know that we are concerned about safety, despite what the previous speaker said. We do want to make our roads safer, and, and we're doing just this. This funding comes in addition to roads to the recovery funding uh, that has been provided in this budget to Southern Adelaide. The Roads to Recovery is another important part of our nation building program. And through the program, the City of Onkaparinga and the Marion Council will receive over $2.3 million. These funds will assist in the maintenance and upgrade of roads right across the southern suburbs, and the jobs generated uh, by this activity in tandem will inc increase the capacity uh, for people in the south. And this shows real value infrastructure. We hear a lot um, from the opposition about talking about poor spending on infrastructure. Well, my message is clear to the opposition that the money provided to my electorate in this budget for their local roads is high quality spending. The investment builds on the investment from the first Rudd government's budget uh, for roads in Kingston. The previous budget provided for $2.8 billion to both, uh, both the councils in the local area and was certainly welcomed by my constituent. The bill before the House today does make administrative changes to ensure that there are more effective provisions for major road and rail infrastructure projects particularly those that are, off, uh, that are on and off the national network, as well as providing more effective provisions for the two programs I have just discussed, the Roads to Recovery and Black Spot funding programs. For the Black Spot program, the bill extends coverage of the National Building Program Black Spots project to allow the minister to approve funding under Part 7 of the Act for projects on the national land transport network. Importantly, the bill also allows the minister to increase funding to roads to recovery projects if the minister sees fit. This flexibility is incredibly important, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, as currently uh, no increases to funding in the funding period can be made once the funding has been determined. This is impractical in the real world, where costs are not stagnant uh, and certainly not stagnant as bureau bureaucrats' lists. 
Now, we need to make these cha changes now, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, to make sure that the government can deliver on our road and rail infrastructure program in the most efficient way. The bill before us today is just one part of this government's nation-building agenda. And in addition, we have seen this government create Infrastructure Australia and the Building Australia Fund, which will also invest in major infrastructure projects. And I'm pleased um, to, that one of these projects ha that has been announced from this fund uh, in this budget is the rail extension from Norlunga to Seaford. And Madam Deputy Speaker, I've mentioned this project a number of times already in the House, and I will do so again because this project is critical to the outer metropolitan suburbs of Adelaide. This will have a significant benefit in reducing urban congestion and providing vital public transport infrastructure to those in the outer southern metropolitan suburbs of Adelaide. And the outer metropolitan suburbs of Adelaide are growing. They are growing and they need this infrastructure. This corridor has existed from Norlunga to Seaford for 30 years, with no previous government doing anything about it. There's been a number of other a uh, number of other nation-building projects that have also been mentioned in the budget. And I've, uh, the member for Macon is here in the chamber, and he is someone that another project in South Australia is the extension of the Oban. He's made it really clear that this is a project that he has been calling on. And one of the oh he was here, sorry, <laughs> he's no longer here. He was here a moment ago. But the member for Macon was here, and he informed me that previous speakers have said that this project was just dreamt up. It wasn't a project that was on. It, was, it wasn't a project. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, the interjections from, uh, uh, from uh, the, the shadow minister for environment and water said it's an it's a embarrassing moment. Uh, I'm not sure what's more embarrassing, not investing in infrastructure or realising someone's not in the, in the chamber. I'd say it's pretty embarrassing to have not invested in infrastructure for so many years. Not, in infra not invested not, has not invested in infrastructure in southern Adelaide and has not made a commitment to the extension of the Oban, which the member for Macon has been calling for for many years. So, so I would say that's pretty embarrassing. Um, this government's nation-building program will address the previous government's infrastructure deficit. And we hear a lot from the opposition about deficit, and we hear them criticising, well, they need to stand up and be counted about the deficit they left for Australia and this nation when it, when it comes to infrastructure. When it comes for inf to infrastructure, they, they squandered uh, the mining boom, they squandered the, mine, the, the proceeds from the mining boom and did not invest in the critical infrastructure that we need today. And, and the Seaford Rail is just one example of, of a project that has been desperately cried out for the local residents association, the council, the state government. This is a project that they have all wanted significantly. And I'm very pleased that this is one of the many nation-building projects around the country that will be delivered. But this program, um, with the many other programs that have been uh, invested, uh, that have been announced in the budget, will support jobs today by investing in infrastructure we need for tomorrow. And the increase in the southern suburbs of Adelaide, the increase in population, is growing, and they do want and they require this investment in infrastructure. So the bill before us uh, will help support jobs in Kingston, it will help support uh, local jobs in the southern Adelaide region and it will help uh, em employ people right across South Australia. The improvement of Main South Road and the Victor Harbour Road intersection is just one small part of the Rudd government's investment in the infrastructure across the country, working with councils, working with state governments, cooperatively investing for our future. Um, but, uh, but along with other projects in southern Adelaide, there is a tremendous uh, importance to the local area and the economy for South Australia generally. And this bill is, is a, provides a very effective way to provide these funds. And, and really, this, this project is, is very much about investing, investing for the future, and making sure uh, that 
that we do have a nation uh, that, is, that is prepared for the future. And I would say that I have been overwhelmed by support from local residents who have been clear that this is the type of investment they want. This is the type of investment that they want for the future because it shows that this government is planning for the future. It's planning not for five years, not for ten years, but decades, decades into the future. And therefore, and therefore, I commend the bill to the House. The member for New England. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, given the short period between uh, uh, now and question time, I'd uh, like to make some introductory remarks in relation to the nation-building uh, bill. And, uh, I do have a lot of comments that, uh, that I will be making a bit later on, but one of the issues that I think the government has addressed that it does need uh, congratulations uh, on, in, in particular in relation to nation building, is the final recognition that the tunnel through the Murrundi Range, the Liverpool Range, is at last going to be financed. Uh, many members would know, and uh, I know the Minister for Defence. Uh, would be well aware of the issues of the uh, connectivity issues between the Liverpool Plains, the North West of New, uh, and New England parts of New South Wales, and the issues of uh, transportation through to the port of Newcastle. Currently, a third coal loader is being constructed in Newcastle. Uh, that has always been a bit of a bottleneck in relation to the coal industry. But one of the major and significant bottlenecks that has been there for many years uh, is that mountain range uh, between Murrundi and Willow Tree. So I'm uh, absolutely delighted, and I do congratulate the government. Uh, the Minister for Defence is, is in the chamber now, to, and I acknowledge uh, uh, his role in relation to the uh, Murrundi range. It's a, a much needed piece of infrastructure Order. that is finally being, being 2 p.m. The debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 97. The debate may be resumed at a later hour. The member for New England will have leave to continue speaking when the debate is resumed. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. And I refer the Prime Minister to his claim that he can repay the nation's $315 billion debt by 2022. I also refer to the statements from the Treasurer's office last night, confirming that, contrary to what was said in the House yesterday, these claims are not supported by the budget papers, but rather by Treasury modelling. Will the Prime Minister now release the Treasury modelling? or are Australian taxpayers just to be left with a debt repayment promise that does not add up? The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his question, because uh, the government's strategy for returning the uh, budget to surplus and for repaying um, the government borrowing is outlined clearly in the budget papers. Furthermore, what I'd say to the Leader of the Opposition, as his question goes to the point of numbers, is as follows. We had um, the clear articulation of the opposition strategy on debt and deficit on display at the doors today. Uh, when the Leader of the Opposition was asked the following question, given we're all about specificity on budget numbers, he was asked this question. What does the Coalition regard as an acceptable level of debt? Answer from Mr Turnbull. Well, the level of debt should be no more than is absolutely necessary. <laughs> then the journalist asked this question. What's that then? Answer Mr Turnbull, well, it's not a question of a number. Unquote. And so we've had a two-week strategy here, uh, uh, a, a two-week strategy on the part of the opposition, which is all about numbers and specificity and drilling down. And then when asked a simple question on the doors today, come on, Malcolm, what is it? The answer is, well, it's not a question of a number. Can I just say? This is the ultimate bookending of what began with the hockey doctrine two weeks ago, which confirmed that the Liberal strategy on deficit and debt is equal to the government strategy on deficit and debt. Equal, oh, $25 billion less, they say, and then they refuse to back $22 billion worth of savings. So Joe's position is 
a $275 billion Liberal deficit and debt strategy, add $22 billion worth of savings foregone, that equals a $300 billion debt and deficit strategy. That's the hockey doctrine two weeks ago. The Turnbull doctrine today says it's not about a specific number. Is it any wonder that nobody actually attaches any credibility whatsoever to this scare campaign, this scare campaign on debt and deficit? It has one single objective in mind, the government building the economy up, the Liberals seeking to talk the economy down. The member for Page. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, how is the Australian government building out of recession through its Nation Building for Recovery program? The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And I thank the honourable member for Page for her question. And I note that under the Australian government's Nation Building for Recovery plan, there are over 157 projects underway in the members' electorate. 157. And there will be an investment of $43.8 million in the members' electorate. 121 projects under the largest school modernisation program in Australia's history. 20 social housing units being built in the members' electorate. 16 projects under the government's Black Spots and Boom Gates program, including $950,000 towards the accident-prone area of the Kyogle Road at Lismore, and $10.9 billion for five local councils under the Community Infrastructure Program, including a $3.4 million investment in the Evans Head Aquatic Centre. These are practical projects aimed to build the infrastructure her community needs for tomorrow while supporting jobs and business and apprenticeships today. That's the government's uh, overall strategy in response to the global economic recession, which is ripping the heart out of economies across the world. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to confirm today to the House that the government, through its strategy, is providing funding for infrastructure for every one of Australia's 9,540 schools. Every one of them. And I'd like to confirm to the House that under the National School Pride Program that we will be delivering $1.3 billion to 9,490 schools for 13,176 projects. I'd also confirm to the House works on 8,863 projects at 5,994 schools are due to commence this month. And on top of that, on 7 May, the government has allocated $2.8 billion of funding to, 2010 major, to 2010 major projects like school halls, gymnasiums, multipurpose centres across nearly 1,500 Australian primary schools. Mr Speaker, that is the government's strategy on nation building. Yesterday we had some interesting exchanges with those opposite on their response to nation building in their electorate. And I would draw our attention, the attention of the House to one of our favourite members opposite, the member for Canning, a person given to enormous generosity of spirit. And he said at the time when this stimulus package supporting these projects was put through the House, this is what the member for Canning had to say, quote, I am saying tonight, as the leader of the opposition has said, that he, we will not be a part of this, unquote. That's what the member for Canning said in February. What did the member for Canning have to say last night? And I quote him, I support whatever taxpayer funds or funds borrowed on behalf of taxpayers are going into my electorate, unquote. What a distance it is. Order, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister resume his seat. Order, those on my right. The member for Canning. Mr. Speaker, for the Prime Minister to be relevant, he must be accurate. And Order. The member for Canning will resume his seat. Was, the member for Canning will resume his seat. The member for Canning will resume his seat. The Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, how they squirm and turn when presented with the facts. A bit like the member for Fatten yesterday. Will I? Won't I? Put my hand up. Put it half up. Put it down. What day is it? Are they watching back home? Are they watching on TV? Are they listening through the broadcast? It's called being transparent and honest with your community. You either vote for it or you don't. And those opposite, and those opposite Order. know nothing whatsoever about transparency. Order. Let's go. Let's go. I always Order. love Joe's interventions. It's called the, the Joe Hockey bellow factor. The louder you bellow, you know the less the amount of content Order. lying Never behind the bellowing. 
Let's go to uh, our good friend opposite. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pass by the member for Patton. He made a um, he made a notable contribution to the House yesterday as well on this. And, uh, Order. and let's go to the member for Wentworth, who we know, as the leader of the opposition, has a keen interest in local infrastructure as well. Because we know when the Minister for Infrastructure showed up to announce an investment in the Waverley Park Pavilion, uh, the leader of the opposition had the following to say, quote, could I just say that I'm delighted by the government spending this money on the pavilion here. Delighted. I'm delighted to be here to welcome the investment. It's a very good investment in infrastructure. I have a few problems with this. How does that reconcile itself with the huff and puff and bluster we have heard here for the last two weeks? But I could also go on to the question of schools in the honourable member's electorate. And uh, let's just look at a few of these schools. Uh, we've got um, St Anthony's School. Does the Leader of the Opposition support the refurbishment of the playground and classrooms and the installation of broadband Order. at St Anthony's School in his electorate? Order. Prime Minister, she is. Prime Minister. Uh, does he support the refurbishment of classrooms and roofing at St Clair's College in Waverley? Order. The member for Canning. What about that one? <laughs> Order. The order. The Prime Minister resume his seat. Order, order. The leader of the, pro of the opposition on a point of order. Speaker, we have raised before this business of the Prime Minister posing questions to the opposition. Now, if he wants us to do that, if he wants us to respond to the way he's using billions of borrowed order. money the to blackmail members of the opposition, will of resume his seat. The leader of the opposition will resume his seat. The leader of the opposition will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition is warned. Order. The rhetorical, the, the use of these rhetorical questions highlights a need for the, the House to consider those. No. The need to consider the amount of debate that is allowed in, in the answers to questions, because I remind honourable members that a lot of the angst that's expressed is that the standing orders have several, several restrictions on questions, and those restrictions do not apply to answers. The manager of opposition business, Speaker, I assume, I... on a point of order. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I direct you to Standing Order 98B, which is a very specific standing order which says during question time a member may orally ask a question of a minister but not a parliamentary secretary without notice and for immediate response. The contrary for Sturt, to the comment you the made member to the for House, Sturt, the, the standing member orders for are very will resume his seat. My, The member for Sturt will resume his seat. I thank him for supporting my case. <laughs> the member for Sturt will resume his seat. The member for Sturt will resume his seat. Prime Minister, in response to the question, you have another party room meeting or something. the manager of opposition business on a point of order. Standing order 86, Mr. Speaker, I'm entitled to take a point of order. The point of order that I'm taking is that indeed you pointed to the standing orders as inhibiting your capacity to make the Prime Minister conform with the standing orders. Standing order 98 specifically the prohibits the member for being Sturt asked resume his a member seat. of the, the member for Sturt will resume his seat. Again, I thank him for supporting the point that I'm making. Because it is any there is no way then that the Leader of the Opposition can get up to answer a question. Because there is no question. There is no question. The Prime Minister is responding to the question. The Prime Minister. 
Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. The degree of discomfort on the part of those opposite is transparent to the nation. Uh, of course, we then come to the question of the Galilee Catholic Primary School, um, and we'd be interested to know uh, whether the honourable member supports Order. the refurbishment the Prime or reconstruction of the covered learning area at that school. No, the Prime Thank Minister you. has to call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Or the upgrading of floors, roofs, and sewerage at the Wallara Public School. Yeah, looks like a nice school, but I'm sure they could deal with the upgrading of the floors and roofs. The roof Prime Minister resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Mr Speaker, I refer to your own ruling of this week in which you said that props should be incidental to an answer, and, you, and for, for a few, uh, previous Speaker's rulings, Speaker Andrew and Speaker Jenkins Senior, on numerous occasions, that in fact uh, uh, props were out of order or were not to be encouraged. The, the bulk of the Prime Minister's answer is waving embarrassingly pathetic photographs around, and I ask you to rule them out of order, otherwise props will become the major aspect of answers and questions, which I'm sure you don't want to happen, Mr Speaker. Order. It is true that if one reads practice—I'm not sure about the generational reference, but I'll, I, I will check that. It probably will have me amused over the over the holidays, the, uh, over the weekend. The practice, practice refers that the use of props is tolerated but not encouraged. That's, that's correct. And I read a, a ruling from last parliament in, into the record again yesterday, and there are several similar rulings. I did make a point also that all this is, illustrates to me that Yet again, something that we could move to that could be approached with maturity, perhaps we may not be able to do. I remind honourable members on my left that when the member for North Sydney decided to take an action that would give his question more vibrancy, that was allowed. That was allowed, and at least one media agency actually gave him the outcome that I assume that he was after. The Prime Minister. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And uh, I noticed one of the interventions on the part of those opposite referred to uh, embarrassment. Can I just say that what is singularly embarrassing for those opposites having to stand before their local communities and say that they voted against each one of these investments in their local schools? That is why they are embarrassed, except except the good old member for Canning who did this complete backflip with reverse pike and twist yesterday in the parliament. So whether it is the, uh, the uh, Kincopal Rose Bay School of the Sacred Heart, Multipopers Hall and Performing Arts Centre, to show that our program is directed to non-government schools as well, uh, St Francis of Assisi School as well, uh, on top of that St Catherine School, and then we have the installation of wireless uh, broadband at St Charles Catholic Primary School, very nice school as well. So those opposite have said, those opposite have said that um, uh, these are questions which have been posed to them and they say have been imposed, uh, posed to them in a manner inconsistent the with the standing Baden. orders. Can I just say the to those opposite, Dixon. can I just say to those opposite, Member for Dixon. What has the Order the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No, no, sorry, the Leader of the Opposition. I've just got some uh, very good. thinking time, uh, I hope. <laughs> I inform the House that we have present in the gallery this afternoon the Minister for Planning and Investment of the Lao People's Democratic Republic, Dr. Sin Lavong Kutpotun. On behalf of the House, I extend to him a very warm welcome. Yindi Ton Lap. The, I, I was unsure that you, whether the Prime Minister finished or not, but if the Prime Minister hasn't finished, um, he will now come to his conclusion. But the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I will. So the uh, Leader of the Opposition, uh, on the, the uh, question of the investment in these schools, these very good schools in his electorate, uh, has uh, disputed— yeah, look, 
I, if the manager of opposition business will resume his seat, I, I think that I created some confusion. I'm not sure how, but I, I was going to ask the Prime Minister whether he had concluded or not before making the uh, greeting that I did. Um, the Prime Minister, I think, uh, had anticipated one of your uh, prov provocative type or, or um, I think not provocative. There's a word that you used last last week about one of your points of order, and he was in anticipation and may have sat down. So, well, helpful will do. The, the Prime Minister, in conclusion. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and it's uh, glad to have our good our good friend Tony Abbott intervening so volubly as well, because I know he stands up Prime investment Minister in his electorate as well. Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, um, and, of course, a strong upholder of parliamentary standards himself. Uh, can I say, Mr Speaker, that um, the Leader of the Opposition has objected to a series of questions being posed to him uh, about whether he supports investments in each of these schools. Well, he could use, he could use the device, and I challenge him to use the device used yesterday by our good friend, the member for Canning, who stood up and said in this place, he supported the investment in his electorate. He supported the borrowing to support the investment in his electorate, and the schools and the schools which were funded as a consequence of that investment and borrowing. So the procedures of the House have that facility available, Mr. Speaker, for the leader of the opposition to stand up at the conclusion of question time and say that on each of these schools that I have represented, does he support the investment in those schools and the borrowing to underpin the investment in those schools, or does he not? That is his challenge, pure and simple. The leader, the leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. And I remind the Prime Minister that in life there are only two certainties, it is said, death and taxes. And I ask, given today's revelations, Order. that this government's reckless cash splash Order. has resulted in $14 million in cheques being sent out to the dead, isn't the Prime Minister reminding the Australian people of a third certainty? that Labor can never be trusted with taxpayers' money. The Prime Minister. Uh, first of all, Mr Speaker, can I say to the honourable gentleman who has asked the question uh, that the criteria for the uh, administration of the payment concerned goes to the completion of a tax return in the year which has been specified, which is 0708. Furthermore, as the honourable member would know, when the previous government, and the member for Higgins, uh, would be fully familiar with this himself, uh, that when the previous government uh, implemented low-income tax offset bonuses, they implied exactly the same methodology as been employed by the government in relation to this matter as well. Therefore, I would suggest to those opposite they reflect carefully upon the standards they bring to bear in this debate. Can I say also, Mr. Speaker, to the honourable gentleman as he asks this question, to be exceptionally mindful of the circumstances of those who have lost loved ones in the last 12 months. This is a sensitive matter. This is a, um, the Honourable Leader Order. of the Opposition interjects Order. on this point. I would simply say to those opposite, Order. I would say to those opposite that for those who have lost loved ones in the last 12 months, this is not an incidental matter. Order. It is of direct and personal concern to them, and I would urge those opposite to reflect on that as they pursue this particular line of questioning. The member for Macon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline for the House the importance of stimulating the economy through direct investment in infrastructure so we can support jobs in local communities? The Treasurer. So I uh, thank the honourable member for Macon for his question because there are something like 107 projects underway in Macon, something like 102 school projects uh, in Macon. Of course, they are supporting jobs and they are supporting small business in Adelaide, and they are key parts of our nation-building plan for recovery. But of course, not one, not one of those 107 projects would go ahead if those opposite were in government. Not one. And these vital jobs, this vital support for business would not be there. And the consequence for those local communities is higher unemployment and more business failures. It's really that simple. 
And of course, that is why those opposite are so embarrassed about the fact that they don't have an alternative fiscal policy, which is why we are getting this scare campaign on deficit and debt. Now, Mr. Speaker, we have put in place through the budget an historic investment in essential infrastructure, road, rail, port, to expand the productive capacity of our nation. And of course, something like 70 per cent of our stimulus is invested in infrastructure, which of course is being opposed by the opposition here, but it is vital in supporting jobs today. You know, without the government's investment, up to 210,000 Australians would be out of work. We should think about that for a moment. That is the logical consequence of their position. Now, they're our, fe they're our fellow Australians, they're our neighbours, they're our family members, they're our, they are our workmates. And those opposite should seriously consider the unsustainability of their position in this House, as has been demonstrated day after day by the Prime Minister and other ministers. Because this stimulus, through investment and in infrastructure, is absolutely vital to support jobs. But I suspect there's only one job that the Leader of the Opposition is worried about here, and that is his. Right. Only one job. Well, it is the truth. It is the truth. The only job he's worried about is his own job. He's not worried about the jobs of Australians because he doesn't walk in the same shopping aisles as average Australians. Mr. Speaker. He certainly doesn't do that. Because why does he vote against stimulus, Mr. Speaker? Why does he vote against stimulus? If he understood the impact, if he understood the impact of his decisions to oppose these measures, why does he vote against the stimulus? Member for because he is chronically, chronically out of touch, chronically out of touch with the needs of the Australian economy, and chronically out of touch with the need to support jobs in our community, Mr. Speaker. Because the only job he is worried about is his own, is his own naked political opportunism, Mr. Speaker. That's what rules the day. Well, we on this side of the House will go on supporting jobs, Order Mr. The Speaker, member for Dixon. doing the responsible thing by the Australian economy, the member for while those Dixon. opposite do the opportunist the thing, Mr. Speaker. Born. The deputy leader of the opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The My question is to the prime minister. I refer the Prime Minister to the reason he gave at a press conference this week for personally blocking the appointment of Mr Hugh Borriman as Ambassador to Germany. And I quote the Prime Minister's words, When it comes to foreign diplomatic appointments, I do place priority on languages. And last time I looked at Germany, they speak German. <laughs> Given that the Foreign Minister had boasted in a media release only a few days earlier of Mr Borman's German language qualifications, <laughs> will the Prime Minister now give the real reason that he Order. personally vetoed the appointment of this highly respected senior diplomat as Australia's ambassador to Germany? The Prime Minister. What, um, Mr. Speaker, one of the delights oh, the about the Biden. member for Curtin is originality. Uh, one of the further delights about the member for Curtin is spontaneity. And uh, the one thing about the member for Curtin is that you just need to turn into the pages of the Australian today to work out that you're going to get a question from the member for Curtin, because it says so that she's going to ask a question on this subject today. Can you picture that 40-member uh, tactics committee of the Liberal Party? Monday, Order. Julie goes in. Can I have a question? No. Tuesday, can I have a question? No. Wednesday, can I have a question? No. Thursday, it's in the newspapers. The I should be given a question. The Prime Minister will his seat. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. 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 The Deputy Leader of the Opposition has... Order. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Mr Speaker, this is a serious matter about the Prime Minister personally interfering in the career prospects Probably. of a highly respected the Deputy Australian Leader of the diplomat. I ask him to the answer— The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The, Treasurer, the Prime Minister will respond to the question. 
uh, one thing uh, almost as enjoyable about one of Julie's angry looks. It's one of Alex's angry Order. looks. The Prime when Alex Minister used to be in the House. And we miss titles. Alex. The Prime Minister resuming his seat. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, if the Prime Minister has had so much time to prepare, why doesn't he answer order the question? The <laughs> There's not a point of order. The Prime Minister will refer to members by their titles. The Prime Minister will respond to the question. Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, referring briefly to the uh, former Foreign Minister, Mr. Downer, and uh, the, currently the opposition's chief of staff would be entirely familiar with this about how the former Foreign Minister dealt with ambassadors in Argentina and elsewhere when they happened to cross the paths of the then Foreign Minister, but I'm sure they could answer for that on their right, own account. The Prime Minister Mr. will Speaker, respond to the question. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The Prime Minister will respond to the question. The... the Deputy Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat until the House comes to order, predominantly on her side. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister made a public statement about why he interfered Order. with the, the diplomat's Deputy Leader appointment. Of the opposition, that statement the Deputy was not true. Is raising on I ask that the Prime the Minister now the give the real reason why he The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will resume her seat. Prime Minister. We will respond to the question. Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, consistent um, with um, uh, practice, which I understand was probably the case with uh, Mr Downer and Mr Howard, uh, the Foreign Minister, uh, Order. The Order. Foreign Minister Order. and I regularly discuss senior diplomatic appointments. Order. The Foreign Minister and I agree on appointments which go to the question of which skills are best applied to which of our most senior diplomatic appointments abroad. Order. That applied in the case of the posting, which is the subject to this question as well. Name on the question of uh, Mr Hugh Borrowman, he is a first-class diplomat. The Kingdom of Sweden is an important country for Australia. They will soon, as I am advised, assume the presidency of the European Union. Uh, we therefore wish him well on that appointment. He will do an excellent job. Furthermore, Mr Speaker, could I say Order. applying those national interest criteria to appointments was exactly the discussion the Foreign Minister I had, and I had in relation to the appointment of Mr Tim Fisher as Australia's first ambassador to the Holy See. The Mem the member for O'Connor on a point of order. No, Mr. Speaker, I order. The, mem no, the member for O'Connor resume his seat until the and the member for Braddon will resume his seat. Oh, but yet again, the member for New England is not helping me with a certain matter. The member for O'Connor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I seek leave to table letters from the Attorney General, which includes a, a shell press release in my name, which is now obviously on the Prime Minister's behaviour an invitation to entrapment. Is, is leave granted? Leave is not yeah. granted. The member for Braddon. Always... The member for Braddon. The member for Braddon. Member for Braddon. Yeah, thank you. The member for Braddon has the call. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Leave is not my... Braddon. <laughs> the member for Braddon will hear me say. No, I'm not. The member for Braddon. Uh, Someone's going out in a box. My question is to the Minister for Education, Employment and Workplace Relations and Social Inclusion. Will the Deputy Prime Minister update the House on what the government is doing to invest in education infrastructure and of the reaction from local members to this investment? The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Braddon for his question and for his uh, 
bringing of decorum into the House. Uh, the member for Braddon, of course, Order. would be welcoming the 75 projects in his electorate the under the Building Casey. the Education Revolution program. I know he is a member who cares very passionately about the state of his local schools and also about supporting jobs in his electorate and would be welcoming those 75 projects under the Building the Education Revolution, which are part of the 93 projects in total in his electorate worth $35.3 million. And of course, these projects are just some of the more than 15,000 projects that have been approved through the opening rounds of the National School Pride Program and the Primary Schools for the 21st Century Program. Now, of course, the great unknown about these programs is not which schools have benefited so far, but whether or not the Leader of the Opposition supports this expenditure on these schools, a question I hope he clarifies after question time. And when he is clarifying that question, he may, during the quest course of question time, want to look into the galleries above us where we are expecting, during the course of question time and in the House today, to see the Sacred Hearts Primary School from the member for McKellar's electorate, Pimble Ladies College from the member for Bradfield's electorate, Greenpoint Christian College from the member for Robertson's electorate, St Gertrude's Primary School from the member for Prospect's electorate, and Hornsby Heights Public School from the member for Barara's electorate. And I would also ask the Leader of the Opposition, as he contemplates uh, whether or not he should say he supports this expenditure, that these schools have received assistance from our National School Pride program for things like the refurbishment of classrooms and school grounds, the construction of new shade structures and general refurbishment. And I note that individually some of these schools have benefited already under our Primary Schools for the 21st Century program, with $2 million going to the Hornsby Heights Public School, $3 million to the Greenpoint Christian College and $2.5 million going to the Sacred Hearts Primary School. Now, Mr Speaker, this is important national expenditure about the future of our schools and about supporting jobs today. It's expenditure that every member of the opposition voted against. It was consequently with some surprise, Mr Speaker, that I read a media release put out by the member for Bowman on 12 May, where he says, having come into this House and voted against this expenditure, and I quote, 11 Redland schools will receive major building grants worth a total of more than $26 million, Federal Member Andrew Lamming announced today. And it goes on. I am a strong supporter of any investment in educational infrastructure like language and science laboratories. So he's a supporter of any investment in educational infrastructure when he's putting out a media release in his electorate. What he can't do is bring himself into the parliament and vote for it when it's under consideration by this House. Now, I know, of course, that the surname of the member for Bowen is Lamming, but of course, I think the behaviour by those opposite would be better caught under the word lemming. Lemmings are, of course, rodents famous for throwing themselves over cliffs in, in uh, herds. Order. The Deputy Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister will resume his seat. The member for McCalla on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Under the standing orders, Mr. Speaker, you are required to keep order in this house, and, and the actions of the Deputy Prime Minister and using demeaning language uh, against a member in this house is also precluded by the standing orders, and she should be made to apologise and withdraw. It is order. highly unseemly and brings order. nothing but dishonour the on her member herself. member for McCullough resume her seat. Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and there's nothing like getting lectured by the party of Wilson Tucky on parliamentary standards. But of course, Mr Speaker, you would be aware of the uh, myth of the lemming. And to quote the ABC Science website, uh, the, this myth is now a metaphor. Order the Deputy Prime Minister to resume his seat. The member for McCullough on a point of order. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Again, under the standing orders, when, a standing or when somebody draws a point of order, it is required to be ruled upon. Yes, I would so ask you to rule upon my point of order. The member for McCullough resume her seat. I ruled on the point of order by 
giving the call to the Deputy Prime Minister. The Deputy Prime Minister. Tell him words, you and, Mr. and as the website says, the quote, this myth trade. is now a metaphor for the behaviour of crowds of people who foolishly follow each other, lemming-like, regardless of the consequences. Well, who does that remind you of, Mr Speaker? I think Order. the lemming-like Liberal Party of Australia. The member for North Sydney. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. And Mr Speaker, my question Order. is to the Treasurer. Order. And Mr Speaker, uh, I remind the House that the last time the Labor Party had a debt, it took the Coalition to pay it off. And now the Labor Party has an even bigger debt, <laughs> Mr Speaker, uh, which is going out, Mr Speaker, all the way, Mr member Speaker. Member for North Sydney, Thank resume his seat. Mr Speaker. The member for North Sydney, resume his seat. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. The member for Blair. Uh, member for Blair has the call. The member for Blair has the call. Right. The member for Blair has the call. The member for Blair has the call. Right. The member for Blair has the call. My, que my question is to the Minister Member for, for Blair, resume his seat. The member for Sturt. Mr Speaker, this is a very serious point of order. You have, uh, over successive days, allowed the Prime Minister to wave posters around in this place, which we have pointed out to you on numerous occasions is provoking the opposition. You are now apparently, if I'm correct, you are apparently ruling out yep. a question the member from for the Sturt Shadow Treasurer. The member for Sturt will resume his seat. The member for Sturt will resume his seat. Now, hop up and do your stunt. The member for Sturt, because I am ruling it, I am ruling it out of order. No, no. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. Because having just suggested that the actions that the member for North Sydney took yesterday were appropriate in, a, in, in, in inviting other members to have to assist him with a prop is, is a blatant, is a blatant, On yesterday's occasion, if you are suggesting that the passing of the papers that were to be tabled is akin to what you just did, I'm surprised. The member for North Sydney. Mr Speaker, I, uh, I respectfully suggest to you, Mr Speaker, that I am using this prop to illustrate the matter that goes to the substance of my no, question the member for about North, the government's The debt. member for North Sydney will resume his seat. I'm about to explain to you, Member for McEwen. <laughs> if, in fact, if, in fact, if we took each of those uh, frames individually, there would have been no complaint. The member for Blair will resume his seat one at a time. The 
it separate. Separate them. The North, I'll give him the call next while you prepare. No, well, come on. I mean, we're not running a sideshow. The member for Sturt on a point of order. Mr Speaker, I think the uh, ludicrousness of the situation has been amply demonstrated and I respectfully ask you to give the member for North Sydney the call to ask his question. The member for North Sydney will come to his question now or he will lose the question. The member well, Mr. for North Speaker, Sydney. My question refers I refer the Treasurer to the fact that the last member time for the member Sydney will resume his seat. The Chief Government Whip. Mr Speaker, with great respect, you gave the call to the, to the member for Blair. His call has been interrupted by a number of points of order, but he actually still had the call. The member for North Sydney has the call. <coughs> Mr Speaker, I refer to the fact that the last time the Labor Party was in government, the Coalition uh, had to pay off their debt after they left Australia with a burden of $96 billion. This time the Labor Party is in government again, and the Labor Party is accruing debt on a massive scale as the biggest spending government in modern Australian history. And the debt is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and redder and redder, just like the Deputy Prime Minister's face. Mr. Speaker. And I say to the Treasurer, Order. now that the Minister for Finance said simple mathematics explains how to pay off all of this Labor Party debt. Will you now come clean with the Australian people about just how much debt you are really leaving Australians? The Treasurer. Can't read your draft, well, Mr. The Speaker, member for Fadden is warned. Mr. Speaker, Treasurer. they can never get fired up about jobs in local communities. They can never get fired up about the people that are being pushed against the global recession. But what member we just for saw Forrest. was the hockey $300 billion debt. That's what we saw. He has admitted, and so has the Leader of the Opposition admitted, in the circumstances this country fires, uh, finds itself, that they would have to borrow as much as the government has to borrow, and they would not pay it off one day sooner. That's what they've confirmed. Because if they're not confirming that, where is their alternative plan? Where is their alternative plan? What is the alternative fiscal policy? Well, I That's remind the Leader of the Opposition of status. A blank piece of paper, Mr Speaker. A blank piece of paper. No alternative fiscal policy because they know, they know that this government has had forced upon it and this country has had forced upon it a $210 billion revenue collapse. A $210 billion revenue collapse. And if they were going to do something different, what they would have to do is savagely increase taxes or savagely cut back services. And they come into this House and won't nominate one saving they could make. And what that means is that they would borrow every cent the government has borrowed and they would not pay it back one day sooner. They are complete frauds. The member for Blair. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Finance and Deregulation. Why is it vital for the government to invest in nation-building infrastructure? Why is it crucial that the importance of infrastructure investment is emphasised in debate about Australia's economy? The Minister for Finance and Deregulation. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Blair for his question. I notice that the, there are 392 projects underway in the member's electorate, projects supporting jobs and small businesses as part of the government's Nation Building for Recovery Plan, the plan that is committed to building Australia for the future and which the opposition continues to vigorously resist, carping negatively about Australia's economic prospects. Mr Speaker, the government has a long-term strategy as well as a short-term strategy of stimulating activity in the economy. It also has a long-term strategy to return Australia to a strong productivity growth pathway. And there are three central elements to this strategy, investing in infrastructure, 
investing in skills and reforming regulation, Mr Speaker. They are the key items in the government's strategy to lift the pro productivity performance in the Australian economy that has been inadequate for a number of years. And central to this, Mr Speaker, has been the investment in infrastructure that forms part of the stimulus package that the government has put forward for the Australian people to boost economic activity. Now, Mr Speaker, the opposition doesn't accept that investment in infrastructure is crucial. It's happy to turn up to photo opportunities. It is happy to participate in local photo opportunities. It is happy to be part of the picture in the local paper, Mr Speaker. But the opposition does not is not prepared to support infrastructure investment when it comes to voting in this chamber, Mr Speaker. The, this particular aspect, Mr Speaker, has always uh, puzzled me. It has always puzzled order, me somewhat, Mr order, Speaker. Order, order. The House will come to order and not be distracted by events it, in the gallery. Thank you the very much, Mr Minister Speaker. Of Finance. It has always puzzled me somewhat, Mr Speaker, as to why the opposition is not prepared to support nation-building infrastructure, and indeed it puzzled me for nearly 12 years when they were in government as to why they were not prepared to invest in infrastructure for Australia's future. It's always puzzled me. Now, given the astonishingly juvenile performance we've just witnessed from the opposition, perhaps I shouldn't be that puzzled. But I can tell you this, Mr Speaker, yesterday, yesterday I got a little bit of a hint, a little bit of a clue as to why the opposition doesn't support investing in infrastructure. Because in Senate estimates hearings yesterday, the Shadow Minister for Finance, Senator Coonan, asked a question of public servants. The question she asked was this, and I quote, what is infrastructure? Order. What is infrastructure? That was her question. And she then followed up with Order. the question, the what is your North definition Sydney. of infrastructure? So, Mr. The Speaker, the problem Sydney. the opposition has is they don't even know what infrastructure is. That's why they don't support it, Mr. Speaker. That's why they don't support it. The government is committed to investing in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. It is committed to lifting the productivity performance of the Australian economy, which for too many years languished under the now opposition. For too many years, they did not invest in infrastructure and skills. They did not seek to reform Australia's regulatory structures. Order. And as a Order. result, the, as a result the Australian productivity performance languished, Mr Speaker. The Australian government knows the importance of investing in infrastructure. Australian business knows the importance of investing in infrastructure. And indeed, the wider community knows the importance of investing in infrastructure. Senator Coonan, who I remind you was not a minister for a portfolio with nothing to do with infrastructure. She was the minister responsible for broadband. The minister responsible for broadband has to ask, what does infrastructure mean? That gives you some indication, Mr Speaker, of the true depths of ignorance and complacency and lack of regard for the long-term productivity development of this nation that the Liberal Party opposition represents, Mr Speaker. Well, the Australian government, the Rudd government, has a very different perspective. We regard invest investment in productive infrastructure as central to the economic future of this nation. In Member broadband, in ports, in road, in rail and in skills, they are the central drivers of long-term prosperity for the Australian people. The member for Casey. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Has the government received advice from the Treasury, detailing scenarios in which government debt could blow out further than the Treasurer has forecast. The Treasurer. Mr Speaker, the advice the government has received from the Treasury is the advice that's conveyed in the budget papers. The Chief, opposite, the Chief Government Whip. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My Order. question, Mr. Speaker, Order. is to the Minister for the Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Will the Minister outline how the government's nation-building economic stimulus plan is supporting green-collar jobs and reducing cost of living pressures to households? The Minister for Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Chifley for that question. And I note that we already have some 140 households in his electorate who've applied for either the insulation rebate or the solar hot water rebate under the Rudd government's plans. And 
the members' constituents join over 50,000 Australian households who have already accessed the Energy Efficient Homes Plan, part of the $42 billion nation-building economic stimulus plan. And I also note Mr. Speaker, that the member for Chifley's electorate is home to the Fletcher Insulation Plant in Rudy Hill, where the insulation production is going through the roof. And that is what the economic stimulus package is about. It's about making sure that we have jobs, jobs that are created in the local community and at the same time rolling out the largest ever energy efficiency program that Australia has ever seen. And Mr Speaker, this package from this government will deliver energy efficiency to around three million Australian households over the next three years. This is an ambition well beyond any previous energy efficiency program in this country, and it's a mark of the Rudd government's commitment to getting on with the business of supporting jobs that we're seeing this program deliver so quickly right across the nation. Now, Mr. Speaker, I saw some comments earlier this week from the US Secretary of Energy, Dr. Stephen Chu, and he said, and I quote, the quickest and easiest way to reduce our carbon footprint is through energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is just not low-hanging fruit. It is fruit that's lying on the ground. And, Mr. Speaker, the government couldn't agree more. And it's well overdue that we began to harvest that low-hanging fruit because the previous government were asleep at the wheel for too long on this issue. And I can report to the House that the Energy Efficient Homes Call Centre has already received more than 83,000 calls over the same period. So since February, 83,000 calls. 27,000 Australians looking to install ceiling insulation and 23,000 Australians looking to install solar hot water. And Mr Speaker, this is all before the rollout of components. The full rollout starts on the 1st of July. And Mr Speaker, I'll come to you later on. I'll come to the member of Flinders later on. I'm glad he's made that intervention because I'll come to him later on. Mr. Speaker, the Bradford Insulation Group to ignore the member for Flinders and the member for Flinders to stop interjecting. Have informed my office that they are adding employees on the manufacturing side alone by some 55 people. That doesn't include additional jobs from call centres and warehousing. And just last week as well, Fletcher Insulation announced an $8 million upgrade to its Victorian manufacturing plant and the extension of its Dandenong and Rudy Hill plants to 24-7 production. And that's the Rudy Hill plant in Chifley, where I understand that prior to the Energy Efficient Homes package there was some consideration of rationalising operations. Now they're going 24-7. And Mr Speaker, Fletcher Insulation has also announced the creation of 50 jobs as a result of this increased demand. Now, Mr Speaker, what are these jobs about? With Fletcher Insulation, these jobs are about pink bats. But it's not just about pink bats, of course. It's about green bats. It's about polyester. It's about glass wool. It's about rock wool. It's about cellulose. It's about natural wool. It's about foil. If it meets the standards, you can install it under the Energy Efficient Homes Plan. But, of course, pink bats is the product that is so often maligned by the member for North Sydney, the shadow treasurer, who takes every opportunity to ridicule an investment that's already supporting Australian jobs and saving Australians' energy bills. We wouldn't have had the pink bats, the member for Moore Sydney says, and he goes out of his way to run down the most cost-effective, energy-efficient improvement that Australians can actually apply at this time, and it's one that produces jobs. Now, Mr Speaker, the opposition leader is fond of getting up in the House and saying it's all about jobs, jobs, jobs. But I saw a weekend report in the Sydney Morning Herald pointing out that when he was Environment Minister, he actually wanted to roll out a program of ceiling insulation around Australia, as is this government doing. But he was blocked by the member for Higgins, just as he's been blocked by the Nationals on an emissions trading scheme. And I think this says a lot about where the opposition's at, Mr. Speaker, because they're voting against measures and publicly ridiculing measures. And some of these Member were the Fitt same Dixon. measures that they wanted to introduce when they were in government, but in the case of the opposition Member leader, he wasn't able to. Now, Mr. Speaker, the government is delivering, providing leadership on an issue that produces green collar jobs, which produces the largest ever energy efficiency program that's been rolled out into this country that supports and assists Australians in reducing their energy bills and taking care of cost of living pressures, providing real leadership in the infrastructure of this country and helping people reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. The member for Casey. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And my question is again to the Treasurer. 
and I refer the Treasurer to his last answer, in which he referred to the budget papers. And I ask him, has the government received additional and separate advice from the Treasury detailing scenarios in which government debt could blow out further than what the Treasurer has forecast? The Treasurer. Well, what we've got here, Mr Speaker, is another smokescreen from those opposite to try and camouflage the fact that they don't have an alternative fiscal policy. He well knows that uh, net debt is projected to fall to 3.7 per cent of GDP by 2019-20, Mr Speaker. But what this is all about is to cover up for their embarrassment for not having an alternative fiscal policy and not being able to articulate anything about Member this, for either in this House or outside. Has the Treasurer concluded? No. The member for Casey on a point of order. On a point of order, Mr Speaker, the question was very specific as to whether he had received additional and specific advice. The Treasurer. Mr Speaker, on, on the doors yesterday we got a real insight into the, the predicament of those opposite. We had the member for Bowman out there doing an interview. And this is what he said Order. in answer Order. to this question from a journalist. What level of debt is not too high? Lamming. There is no level of debt that is too high or not too high. <laughs> journalist, journalist, what do you Order. regard the as Treasurer an acceptable level his seat. of debt? The Treasurer resume his seat. The Treasurer resume his seat. Treasurer. Treasurer. The Order the member for Bowman. Well, I simply say to the member for Canning, it doesn't really justify the member for Bowman denying the manager of opposition business the call, which is the amazing point. The manager of opposition business. Mr Speaker, under the standing orders, uh, relevance is required, and he was asked a specific question about advice. If he doesn't wish to answer the Order question, the manager of opposition business the resume his seat. Should... The manager of opposition business resume his seat. The Treasurer will relate his response to the question and he will refer to members by their titles. The Treasurer. Uh, certainly, Mr Speaker, well, I was asked about debt and I'm talking about debt. <laughs> Absolutely, Mr Speaker. Order. This is what the member for Bowman had to say this morning when asked by a journalist, what do you regard as an acceptable level of debt? The member for Bowman, I won't name a number. Journalist, give us a number. Member for Bowman. No numbers, no numbers. Order, no. The member for Dixon resume his seat. The member, the Treasurer, Treasurer will respond to the question. Treasurer. And Mr Speaker, as Order. hopeless Order. as that sounds, Order. it was then taken up by another Order. member of the opposition Order. this morning. It was taken up, in fact, by the leader Order. of the, the member opposition. For, no, the member this for Dixon, I am listening to this morning. The, if, there was less interjecting. I would be able to listen to the treasurer. The treasurer has the call. The treasurer will respond to the question. Order. Treasurer. Mr. Speaker, this was what the leader of the opposition was asked this morning. What does the coalition regard as an acceptable level of debt? Leader of the opposition. Order. The treasurer resume his seat. Order the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On a point of order, the Treasurer is defying you. You have directed him to answer the question, and he is defying you. The Member for Leichhardt. Member for Leichhardt. The Treasurer will respond to the question and relate his material to the question. The Treasurer. Well, yeah, Mr. Speaker, I'm talking about debt, and I'm talking about the Leader of the Opposition this morning when he was asked, what does the Coalition regard as an acceptable level of debt? Leader of the Opposition. Well, the level of debt should be no more than it is absolutely necessary. Journalists, what Order. then? Leader of the Opposition. Order. Well, it's not a question the of a number. Will his seat. Not Treasurer will Treasurer. Treasurer. Treasurer will resume his seat. Member for Leichhardt. 
My question is to the Minister for Defence, Science and Personnel. Will the Minister update the House on the progress of Defence Housing Australia in constructing the 802 houses funded under the Nation Building Economic Stimulus Plan? The Minister for Defence, Science and Personnel. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I thank the member for Leichhardt for his question uh, and thank him for joining me in his electorate on the 19th of May when we launched the defence health care trial in Cairns. Uh, he's a strong supporter of defence, the defence community, and he was with me as we delivered on another election promise from the Rudd government. I note also for the uh, member for Leichhardt that under the Australian Government's Nation Building for Recovery program, there are 236 projects in his electorate, projects supporting jobs and small businesses in suburbs such as Waree and Redlich. And as we know, uh, Mr. Speaker, this is part of the government's program of nation building for recovery, supporting jobs and business for in and infrastructure uh, for Australia's needs for tomorrow. Of course, we know if the Liberals had their way, not one single one of these projects would commence. You'll be aware also, Mr Speaker, uh, that as part of this nation-building program, uh, the government's decisive action, as part of the government's decisive action, we announced expenditure of $251.6 million in funding for Defence Housing Australia. This is to construct 802 dwellings for Australian Defence Force personnel and their families in metropolitan and regional centres. I'm pleased to be able to announce that DHA have had significant, uh, had significant progress since this announcement. Nationwide, over 260 houses have been contracted to date. Tenders for over 650 houses have been issued. Major site works have begun on over 180 houses. Unfortunately, though, as ever, as ever, Mr. Speaker, the opposition has not supported this measure. The following members are significant: the member for Herbert, the member for Hunter, the member for Mayo, the member for Gilmore, the member for Groom, the member for Indi the member for Flinders and the member for Gippsland all voted against having Defence Force families have new homes built Order. in their electorate. Order. The minister resume his seat. The minister resume his seat. The, the, uh, I, the member for Patterson, I think, is going to... It's not quite a point of order, but you're making a point very quickly. Uh, Order! 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 Mate, I, uh, Mr Speaker, I wouldn't have called the member Hunter not yeah, supporter I, of defence housing. I, I understand. I think he should member for, his member own for minister. Patterson will resume his seat. The, mini the minister has the call. Of minister. Course, Order. Of course, Mr Speaker. Order. Of course, Mr Speaker. Order. Of course, Mr minister Speaker. Has the call. I meant Patterson's curse, not the member for Hunter. Order. Order. I don't know them. Mr. Yeah, the minister for Patterson resume his seat. The minister has the call. Now, Order. Now, sadly, no, sadly, uh, Mr. Speaker. Order. No, the minister resume, will resume his seat until the House comes to order. The Minister for Defence, Science and Personnel. Unfortunately and sadly, Mr Speaker, while these members say they advocate for Defence Force families, they failed miserably when it came to the opportunity to show their support by voting for this investment in this chamber. No doubt, Mr Speaker, as we have known, they will be shameless in attending any ceremonies celebrating the hand over the new homes. Order. Of course, uh, Mr Speaker, we expect them to carry placards, 
Those placards should say, we're here in body but not in spirit, because, uh, because unlike the members of the Labor Party who have Defence Force families in their electorate, this provision of this additional housing for Defence Force families and the job and business opportunities it creates, we do not support. That is what they have done by voting against these proposals in this chamber. <coughs> Yet I note that the member for, the member for Herbert got up <coughs> earlier this afternoon and spoke about the need for people to stand up for <coughs> regional Australia. Well, I asked the member for Herbert, when's he going to stand up for the people of regional oh. Australia? When's he going to stand up for oh. the people of his oh. electorate? Member for the Herbert fact is he voted against the Member Speaker. for Herbert, resume his seat. Minister has the call. The, the minister has the call. Member for Herbert, no, the member for Herbert, resume his. The member for Herbert has other. The member for Herbert has other ways of dealing with what the matter that's and causing. All right, the minister for resume his seat. The member for Herbert on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, when is the minister going to de uh, deliver the family order? Medical the member for will Barrett. resume his seat and then leave for one hour under 94A. The map order. 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 Those on my left will come to order. <laughs> the member for Line. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, in light of the continued flood and wind recovery efforts underway on the mid north coast and north coast of New South Wales across four electorates, and in light of this being the third natural disaster in three months of this kind, in light of ongoing regional impacts of the global banking collapse felt on the ground through such examples as one local council now writing off $25 million of its investment portfolio and up to 5,000 local residents being caught by the recent collapse of three locally managed funds, in light of unemployment for the Richmond Tweed Mid North Coast now breaking 10 per cent last month, in light of employment rates and participation rates being the lowest in the, in the nation right now, income levels being the lowest in the nation right now, tertiary education levels being some of the lowest in the nation right now, and in light of poverty across these four electorates being some of the highest in the nation right now. Prime Minister, in light of natural disasters, financial disasters and ongoing structural disadvantage for the Mid-North Coast and North Coast regions, we now look to increase government support and attention to our region along the lines of the seven Australia-wide jobs funds regions recently announced by your government. The Prime Minister. Um, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I thank the honourable member for his question. Um, he legitimately points to the difficulties which have been experienced uh, recently in um, the um, Richmond, Tweed, Clarence Valley, the Mid-North Coast uh, on the back of natural disasters, but also more broadly in the impact of the uh, global economic recession on the communities, on the communities which he represents. And therefore, he legitimately raises questions of what can be further done in his area. I was um, speaking with the um, Minister for Employment Participation about the, ministers, uh, the members' area recently as we looked at unemployment data from across the country. And uh, the member uh, represents an area which, from recollection, uh, looking at the data from April, is north of 8 per cent, 8.3-8.5 per cent. Uh, and therefore, in terms of those priority areas which the government is seeking to address additional efforts to at the moment, it uh, would therefore, uh, from our point of view, uh, qualify for further consideration by way of additional assistance. Uh, therefore, uh, my discussions with the uh, Minister for Employment Participation, uh, we've agreed that uh, this should be designated as a priority employment area, and that is the area of um, the Richmond, Tweed, Clarence Valley, the North Coast. Um, we would also confirm to the honourable member in response to his question that we will proceed with the appointment uh, of uh, a priority employment coordinator for this area as well. Uh, the particular mechanism uh, that uh, the priority employment coordinators are deploying uh, across the nation is to engage with local communities, their business leadership, their community leadership, their local government leadership and local church and charitable organisations and work together to come up with practical <coughs> projects which could form the basis for further investment from the Community Jobs Fund. 
which is a fund which we provided uh, support for in earlier allocations from this parliament nationwide of some $650 million. Uh, in response to the announcement of that fund, we also uh, made it clear in statements from the government that in our jobs and training compact with Australia, uh, we would be implementing compacts with young Australians, compact with those Australians who have been retrenched through no fault of their own, and compacts uh, also with local communities. This particular program comes off the back of compacts with local communities. In the seven areas that we currently have designated around the country, uh, we uh, have uh, already, together with the Minister for Employment Participation, uh, addressed local community seminars about practical projects which could be supported. And further in conversations with the minister recently, I understand that in, t in response to the first round uh, seeking applications from the community at large, that we received more than 3,000 applications. I'm looking for a prompt from the minister here. 3,000 plus uh, applications from around the country. Um, therefore, uh, there will be further rounds uh, which will be uh, sought uh, for expressions of interest from local communities. I would invite the honourable member and other affected local members uh, in this region uh, to work with the priority employment coordinator once they are appointed in terms of working on particular projects which will have effect in their area. Uh, Mr Speaker, what I would say more broadly about the challenge of unemployment uh, is that as the global recession has deepened and the recession uh, has um, inflicted uh, damage on the Australian economy and on the workforce more generally, it underlines again the absolute importance of a nation building uh, for recovery program of the type which the government has outlined in this parliament over the last two weeks and prior to that as well. That provides an additional injection of activity in the economy. Again, I emphasise something which the Treasurer correctly put to the House before, which is in the absence of the government action to date through, firstly, our stimulus payments uh, in uh, October last year, secondly, the Nation Building and Jobs Plan, which was released in February this year, and thirdly, the measures contained in the budget, that on the back of those investments so we are providing support for 200,000-plus jobs in the Australian economy for each of the two subsequent years, which would otherwise be lost. That is a huge number in the overall dimensions of the size of the Australian workforce. And therefore, what we've sought to do on top of that in particular areas of intense uh, unemployment uh, activity uh, is to provide additional support through the application of local jobs funds. I therefore thank the honourable member for his question. Uh, he, together with the uh, member for Page, the member for New England, um, and the sorry, the member for New England, the member for Page, the member for Richmond, um, uh, in terms of the a particular area that we're speaking of, uh, Page, uh, Richmond, uh, Lyne uh, and other affected areas, I'd encourage them to work closely uh, with the uh, local employment coordinator, get applications in for what will work locally to try and bring that unemployment rate down a further notch compared with what it would otherwise be, building on the back of the Nation Building for Recovery Plan that the government has outlined comprehensively in the parliament. The member for Wakefield. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. What action is the government taking to, to improve the health of rivers and wetlands in the Murray-Darling Basin? The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I thank the honourable member for Wakefield uh, for, his, uh, his answer, for his question, because it goes to the whole health of the Murray-Darling si uh, River system. And it goes to what uh, investments we are making in that system for the future in order to deal with the fact that water allocations across the Murray-Darling have been excessive not just for years but for decades. And the challenge for, on the part of any responsible government of Australia is what action that you can take to take some of that pressure off the system. Uh, can I say in response to the honourable member's question that all honourable members in this House should ask themselves one question. How many litres of water entitlements did the previous government buy back in their 12 years in office? Zero. 12 years of rhetoric on the Murray-Darling, 12 years of rhetoric on taking pressure off the system. Not one gigalitre, not one litre of water entitlements was ever purchased back from the system in order to take the pressure off the Murray-Darling. That is the record of those opposite. And I seem to recall that the Leader of the Opposition at a certain stage of his political career was also the minister responsible for water. Again, parallel to what we've seen on climate change, a lot of statements of rhetoric at an earlier time, but when the rubber hits the road and you're required to do something and actually deliver an outcome, be it on climate change, be it on the carbon pollution reduction scheme, 
Baird having occupied a ministerial position able to purchase back entitlements from the river system, not one litre of water entitlements ever purchased back. Mr Speaker, this government is a government of action. This government has committed uh, to assist in taking pressure off the system. And I would like to confirm to the House today that the Australian government is buying almost 240 gigalitres of water entitlements for $303 million from the Twynham Agricultural Group. Mr Speaker, this represents the single largest purchase of water from the environment in Australia's history. The single largest purchase of water entitlements for the environment in Australia's history. That is what we have done in this decision today announced by myself and the Minister Order. for Climate Change and Water. Once again, once again we hear the barracking answered. from the National Party. The National Party who actually call the shots within the coalition on water policy and climate change. When it ever yeah, it's, it's the tail wagging the dog once again. The National Party says we're not going to do anything on climate change. What does Malcolm Turnbull do? Collapse in a heap. What does the National Party say on buying back water entitlements? We're not going to do anything on that. Malcolm Turnbull collapses Order in a heap. Member, Prime Minister will refer to members by their titles. The Staffer. member for Mayo. I just wonder if the Prime Minister can tell the House how much, will re how much of this water Order will reach Wakefield. Order the member for Mayo. Pro Prime Minister has a call. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's always a delight to hear uh, from the um, former member for Mayo's replacement in this place. Mr. Speaker, what we have is a clear indication of government action. 240 gigalitres purchased for $303 million. If you add that to what we have also, what we have also purchased back, this government has purchased 300 gigalitres of water entitlements to take pressure off the system. And I would say to those, I would say to those opposite, as um, again the member for Flinders seeks to intervene, again a stellar parliamentary career of great achievement when it comes to delivering real results. Nothing. Uh, this government has acted to buy back water entitlements of two, nearly 300 gigalitres, contrasted to not a single litre of water entitlements purchased back in their 12 years in office. Why? Because it's the National Party that controls the coalition on this. The National Party dictates the shots. Any leader worth his salt would stand up to the National Party. The current leader does not. This investment is part of the government's $12.9 billion Water for the Future program. And under this Water for the Future program, it provides $3.1 billion for purchase of water for environmental purposes. And also, our water purchasing program is complemented by a $5.8 billion program for infrastructure investment to improve water use efficiency. Mr Speaker, the these Flinders, are practical decisions to take pressure Flinders. off the system. And for the benefit of those opposite, let me just say what it actually amounts to in terms of 240 gigalitres of water. That is equivalent to one half of all the water used in Sydney in a year. One half of all the water used in Sydney in a year. And I heard the Minister for Climate Change say this morning it is in excess of what the City of Adelaide itself takes off the Murray Darling system each Member year. For in itself. These are not small numbers, these are large numbers. Because this government takes seriously oh, the leader of the National Party intervening again. How many leaders, how many gigalitres of entitlements would the National Party have as buyback? Can't hear anything. Once again, what we have is the National Party parading itself in this place as the tail that wags the dog in the coalition, both on climate change policy and on water policy. Mr. Speaker, can I just say in this place, when we're debating serious questions of climate change and its most direct impact, which is what's happening to the once great Murray Darling River system, what's happening to the Great Barrier Reef, what is happening also to Kakadu, that what we need in this parliament is leadership. What we need is leadership from the Liberal Party on water, on climate change, so that we can make a difference in the Senate. What we have is a leader of the opposition who has, on these hard questions of policy, squibbed it in the face of the right-wing ideologues within his own party and within the National Party more broadly. As a consequence, they stand ready in the Senate to vote down, to vote down measures on climate change that would make a difference. This government is about making a difference on climate change in water. Those opposite are simply captive to the National Party and the climate change sceptics within, within their own ranks. Mr Speaker, we have a plan Order. of action for the Murray-Darling 
those opposite have nothing but a litany of excuses for inaction on the Murray-Darling. The contrast is clear for all to see. The Leader of the Nationals. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. And I refer the Treasurer to the fact that it was confirmed in Senate estimates this week that there's only $2.4 billion of funds available for the national broadband network, and that the government will have to borrow more than $40 billion for this project. Treasurer, why haven't those numbers been included in your debt forecasts? The Treasurer. Because you just made them up. What, what we have included in there is provision for an equity injection. That's what we've done. And what we've also done is acknowledge that if we move forward and we do more, we may have to guarantee borrowings, and that is accounted for in the statement of risk. The member for Shortland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister Order. for Health and Ageing. Order. The House will come to order. The member for Shortland has the call. The member for Shortland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Will the Minister update the House on the latest swine flu developments and any steps the government has taken to protect the community from the disease? The Minister for Health and Ageing. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Shortland for her question. She is always interested in steps that can be taken to protect the community. Uh, obviously, the Prime Minister and I went through a number of steps that the government has already taken uh, to tackle this problem yesterday in question time, but there are some further developments today that I'd like to keep the House abreast of. Uh, but before I do that, just to advise that we now have 103 confirmed swine flu cases in Australia. The number has jumped significantly overnight. Uh, in the course of that time, we have also seen the number increase, for example, in the United States by 1,000 new cases uh, and in Canada by an additional 200 cases. So the disease has got to a point where the numbers are increasing fairly significantly around the country, and we can expect, unfortunately, to see more of that uh, in the coming days. Uh, I'd like to advise the House that there is a Significant Order. change. Minister. Uh, there is a significant change to a number of circumstances that members might need to be aware of. Whilst most of the 103 people who have been confirmed as having swine flu have been experiencing mild symptoms, we do now have four people who have been hospitalised, uh, two in Victoria who presented with quite severe um, condition. Both are now recovering well. Uh, one young man in New South Wales whose condition is improving and one case where we still don't have confirmed details uh, as there seem to be some other unrelated complications with that person's circumstances. Uh, there's also been a lot of focus of course on the situation of the Pacific Dawn, the cruise ship that has been uh, up in northern Queensland. I can advise um, in addition to the comments that I'd made earlier that the Queensland government and P&O have now um, announced that an agreement has been reached for the ship to um, dock in Brisbane on Saturday and return to Sydney on Monday, three days early. Um, this agreement has been reached in order to uh, ensure that passengers can spend still some of their time uh, having their holiday safely on the boat, um, can get the support if any is required at these two major ports. Uh, three crew members have tested positive to swine flu. They have all been receiving Tamiflu from the commencement of the trip uh, and don't uh, believe, as I've been advised, that they have been in contact with other passengers. No passengers have currently tested positive to swine flu, um, and P&O does advise that passengers will be compensated for the shortening of their trip. We obviously uh, thank P&O for their cooperative actions and, of course, want to join in apologising to passengers um, whose holidays might have been disrupted. But I think the public health advice to ensure that this disease, which is uh, not yet in northern Queensland, uh, can be, as, for as long as possible, isolated from parts of the community that don't have any cases. Um, the government's taken an important step to further protect the community today, and that is we've placed an order with CSL for the purchase of the swine flu vaccine. This vaccine is expected to be developed in the next couple of months. 
We have a priority agreement with CSL, which has been activated, and this means that we will be placed in the queue, high in the queue, to be able to receive this vaccine once it's able to be produced by CSL. We've placed an order for um, doses to be purchased sufficient for 10 million people. That's based on the current expert advice that this is sufficient to contain the spread of the disease, but also pr to protect those at risk of any complications. Of course, further work will continue to be done while the vaccine is being developed as we have any further evidence in Australia of particular groups that might be more vulnerable. Um, CSL is obviously currently working fast to develop the vaccine. It will need to do clinical trials. It will register um, with the TGA to ensure that the vaccine is safe. We also, in the past fortnight, purchased an additional 1.6 million courses of Relenza for the stockpile, um, which means that we are building on our existing supply in the stockpile. We will have um, 6.9 million courses of Tamiflu, 1.8 million courses of Relenza and the additional purchases that I've just announced, meaning that we will have 10.3 million courses of antivirals in our stockpile. I also need to advise that the first requests and release of Tamiflu, the first requests have been made from the states and territories, and the first release of Tamiflu from the national medical stockpile have commenced. Uh, the chief medical officer authorised the release of 7,500 doses of paediatric Tamiflu suspension for Victoria and Western Australia, and 10,000 packets of Tamiflu to Victoria. This is of particular importance because the paediatric version, of course needs to be used particularly for very young children uh, in Victoria. That's in order to ensure where we're seeing the disease spreading more quickly than other communities that they'll have sufficient supply. And I understand that Western Australia did not have a large supply of paediatric Tamiflu, and although they only have one case confirmed, wanted to make sure that they had some on hand if the situation develops. Um, we, of course, will continue to consider requests as they come in. We've already taken steps to ensure that um, the stockpile is not being held just in Canberra, so it can be readily made available to our state and territory authorities if and when they need them. And the chief medical officer, of course, will take account of the different circumstances in different parts of the country in uh, making a decision whether the stockpile should be used. And we'll look at the number of cases, the spread, the epidemiological advice, and of course the availability of medicines in the states and territories. These medicines will be dispensed by state public health officials in line with agreed national guidelines. And um, I think it is important to remember that this means Australia is very well placed to handle this situation. The community does need to be prepared that there will be an increased number of cases, probably significantly, in the coming few days, and any support that members can continue to give to the public to remember that there is no need to be alarmed, but there certainly is need to be vigilant and ensure that people— uh, Order. It is important to remain vigilant and to provide advice to people to see their medical professional uh, if they are experiencing any flu symptoms and if they particularly have travelled to countries at risk or believe they have been in contact with any confirmed cases. The member for Flinders. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Environment, Heritage and the Arts. And it concerns his declaration during question time on 12 May in relation to logging activities in New South Wales central Murray forests, when he stated, and I quote, it is particularly important for me to confirm that no stop work order has been issued by the department. Is the minister aware of this letter from the assistant secretary of his department dated 1 May 2009 to New South Wales State Forests, clearly stating that by 31 May there must be, and again I quote, cessation of all harvesting operations in the Central Murray State Forests Ramsar site until further advice from this department. Can the minister explain the inconsistency between his statement and his department's actions? The Minister for Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Uh, thank Order. You. Order. <coughs> the Minister you. has been asked a question. The Minister is now getting the opportunity to respond. So. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. 
and it astonishes me that the honourable member hasn't been following uh, this debate more closely since that article was first uh, produced and, in fact, since that correspondence was first issued. Because what we have said, uh, and this is uh, the case, that we will continue negotiations with the New South Order. Wales government Order. on those matters that have been identified Order. in that correspondence. And Order. I'm happy to report to the House that those negotiations are ongoing. I also want to make perfectly clear to the honourable member opposite Order. The that no stop order has been issued. This is correspondence. This is correspondence, Mr. Speaker, between the department to uh, the New South Wales government, and on that basis, negotiations are underway between those two governments. Order. The member for Brisbane. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. How has the Australian government been working to increase Australia's engagement with international regional organisations? The Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his uh, question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, since coming to office, the government has been working very hard to increase Australia's engagement across a range of uh, countries and a range of regions. Regrettably, when we came to office, we discovered that there were many parts of the globe, many regions where there had been considerable inattention so far as Australian foreign policy and activity had been concerned. Uh, that's why, uh, Mr Speaker, for example, we've moved very quickly to establish uh, observer Member status with the eye. South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, a very important uh, South Asian regional group which of course includes India and uh, Pakistan. It's why, Mr Speaker, I attended the African Union summit in January of this year, the first Australian Foreign Minister to uh, do so. It's why, Mr Speaker, before the end of this year, we'll start our strategic dialogue with the Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC, across the range of uh, trade, strategic <coughs> and security matters. And it's why, Mr Speaker, last year we established a modern framework for the basis of the relationship between Australia and the European Union with the presentation of the Australia-European Union partnership framework. Mr Speaker, I'm very pleased to advise the House today that Australia has taken additional steps to deepen our engagement with both Europe and Asia. The Asia-Europe meeting process, or ASEM as it is known, brings together 16 Asian nations and the ASEAN Secretariat along with uh, 27 European Union nations and the European Commission. ASEM was inaugurated at, with the first ASEM Leaders Summit in Bangkok in March 1996. Australia, some members will recall, applied for membership in 1996 but was unsuccessful, applied for membership again in 1998 at that Leaders Summit but was unsuccessful, and regrettably, Mr Speaker, no further efforts were made since 1998 for a decade to get Australia into that important regional, important regional organisation, deepening and broadening our engagement with both Asia and Europe. Mr Speaker, after the government came to office at the first ASEM meeting in Beijing in 2008, the first ASEM meeting since the government came to office, Australia applied for membership of ASEM. The government put forward Australia's name. I'm very pleased to advise the House, Mr Speaker, that in Hanoi this week, Australia's application to join the Asia-Europe meeting process was welcomed by ASEM foreign ministers. And once arrangements have been effected to formalise the detail of Australia's membership, Australia will join ASEM at the next Leaders' Summit, ASEM 8, uh, in Brussels next year. And our participation in that process reflects the government's very strong commitment to deepen and broaden our engagement both in Asia and in Europe. It also reflects uh, the modern basis of our relationship and engagement with uh, Europe, just, to, just as it does our strongest possible commitment to our friends and colleagues in Asia. Mr Speaker, membership of the Asia-Europe uh, meeting process will make our engagement with both regions uh, stronger. This is a very positive and very welcome development, and it is one, frankly, Mr Speaker, which has overcome a decade of inattention and inactivity a decade of inattention and inactivity which has not been in our national interest, uh, and uh, despite uh, that uh, lack of activity and interest over a 10-year period, our membership of ASEM uh, from next year at the ASEM Leaders' Summit in uh, Brussels will enable us to more appropriately and effectively advance our national interests both in Asia and in Europe. The member for Cook. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister. I refer the Deputy Prime Minister to the fact 
And in 2005, she solicited more than 1,300 signatures for her petitions to oppose any reduction in Medicare funding for IVF, and she described such cuts as a cruel measure. Does the Deputy Prime Minister support her government's broken promise to cut the Medicare safety net funding for IVF? Order. The order. Order. The Minister can only be asked questions within her public administration and portfolio. She, she, and I would rule that the question was out of order. The member for Cook on, a point of, on the point of order. Point of order, Mr Speaker. My question went to her as the Deputy Prime Minister. She was a member of Expenditure Review. She was a member of the Executive Government. These are her decisions. And I seek leave to table the order. petitions uh, referenced in Hansard uh, that are under her name and other members of the government. Is, is leave granted? Is, is, no, no. Is there any objection to leave being granted? Mr Speaker, leave is not granted. The question is clearly out of oh. order. You should have gone to the health minister. It's her responsibility. Order. Order. The member for Cook will resume his seat. The member for Cook will resume his seat. The member for Cook will resume his seat. The member for Oxley will resume his seat. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. Mr Speaker, on the point of order, uh, standing order 98C, uh, small Roman numeral I says, a minister can only be questioned on the following matters for which he or she is responsible or officially connected. Roman numeral I is public affairs. I would have thought that the deputy prime minister who lodged a petition herself for thir with 1,300 signatures with respect to a matter of public affairs would be prepared to answer the question whether she stood by the contents of that petition. I think that we had um, examples of this surrounding the actions of parliamentary secretaries before they became oh, Order. We had instances. Oh, the member for Fadden will leave the chamber for one hour under 94A. I name the member for Fadden. Service of the House. The, sorry, the, yeah, the leader of the, uh, the member, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, and I apologise. I've been describing him as the member for Perth when referring to him as the acting leader of the House. Mr. The Minister for Foreign Affairs. Mr Speaker, I am very proud to be referred to as the member for Perth, and I move that the member be suspended from the service of the House. Right. The question is that the member be suspended from the service of the House. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Order. Lock the doors. Question is: the Motion moved by the minister be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Shortland and Werriwa Tallers for the ayes, and the members for Riverina and Ryan Tallers for the noes. Order. The result of the divisions is the result of the division is I seventy five, nose fifty nine. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The honourable member for Fadden is suspended for the services of the House for twenty four hours. The member for Oxley. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. 
Will the minister inform the House on research into the impact of climate change and policy responses on our agricultural industries and whether there is any threat to action on climate change? The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Oxley for the question. The ABARE modelling is available now on the, both the costs of if we were to do nothing on climate change and the costs of action. And as members are well aware, there's no cost-free option in either direction. The modelling on Australian agriculture, if Australia were to do nothing, uh, was released uh, more than a year ago, which has export figures per commodity uh, which are alarming at the least. If we were to do nothing uh, in terms of wheat, our exports take an 11 per cent hit by 2030, a 15 per cent hit by 2050. On beef, a 29 per cent hit by 2030, a 33 per cent hit by 2050. Sheep meat, 15 per cent and 21 per cent. Dairy, 19 per cent hit by 2030, 27 per cent hit by 2050. And sugar, most alarming of all, our exports would take a 63 per cent hit by 2030 or a 79 per cent hit by 2050. That said, the cost of acting is not, is not free either, uh, and the costs are real and were referred uh, the other day to by ABARE in Senate estimates, and I do think it's important to advise the House uh, of those figures here. Uh, the costs at the point of processing, uh, which therefore includes the impact of on-farm inputs and the inputs by, by the time you get to processes, uh, would be in 2011 $1.83 per head of cattle, 17 cents per head of sheep, 61 cents per tonne of grain and four dollars per head for the average dairy. These costs are real. They are small compared to the costs of not acting, but nonetheless there are significant costs in acting, which is why the government with the Climate Change Research Program has been determined that the scientific research in this space find the areas where we can get the alignment between improvements in productivity and the reduction in emissions, so that where each of those modellings pre presumed that there would not in fact be improvements in technology, the government, by more than tripling the money originally promised for the Climate Change Research Program, is determined to make sure that these issues can be aligned. The question also, though, asks what are the threats to responding? And of course, the threat in the government being able to respond through the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme lies very, very clearly in the behaviour as to what will happen from the coalition in the Senate. And some people, when the Leader of the Opposition became, first took on the role, were reasonably confident that we would end up with a construct and constructive approach and that we would not actually end up seeing a significant threat to action on climate change until this week came round. And this week, when it came round, if there was ever evidence that the Leader of the Opposition had become a threat to acting on climate change, it was before a word was spoken when he appeared side by side in the media conference with the leader of the National Party. Now, it is, it is not unknown for a leader of the opposition to go searching for a power base when times are tough, to go to power brokers or to try to get a base of support. But the National Party? The National Party is a power base and base of support? This is a group of people. This is a group of people. This is a group of people who not only, not only disagree fundamentally with the views that the Leader of the Opposition has always put on this issue, but can't even Order. agree with each other. Can't even agree with each other. Order. The member from Wide Bay that very day said we wanted to take a constructive approach to these issues. And yet the Leader of the Nationals in the Senate, his, his, wording, his wording of a constructive Order. approach was this. The answer is no. There you go. No, 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 no. OK. That's the unity. That's Order. the unity of the constructive member approach by pass. the National Party. You have one member Blair, of sorry. the National Party who was reported on the 6th of August as saying he's prepared to out himself as a Order. climate change sceptic to bring a voice of reason to the debate, and one member of the National Party in a media release only on Order. Monday Order. The member for Calair, the leader of the Nationals. as a massive threat. Now, Order. And the concern Order. as to the Order. massive threat, as opposed to the climate change sceptic, is this. I was actually referring to Order. the same member of the National Party. Order. Leader it's of the, the National same person, Party. the shadow minister of immigration, the shadow minister for agriculture, who is both, who the is member both for the climate change sceptic and Kalea. the person who believes climate change is a massive the member threat. For the National Party will never will never want to act on climate change 
and the Leader of the Opposition at the moment has caved in entirely to the sceptics. At least there's an opportunity now, though, to show some leadership, because the opportunity for leadership is there, at least in terms of the local electorate, to stand up as requested at the end of question time and let us know whether or not you support school funding in your own electorate. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I ask that uh, further questions be placed on the notice paper. The member for O'Connor with a question to me. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, what areas of this parliament are prescribed by the standing orders as off-limits to elected MPs to this House, particularly when they are denied the democratic right to table documents in the chamber? Uh, ignoring ignoring the, the last phrase, um, I think that this arises from some, some action that occurred in the gallery above me and behind me during question time. Um, I would think that the answer is that there are no areas where a member is denied, and I will be following through on um, the basis of what I believe to be the member for o the member for O'Connor's concern, and just be checking on this. Um, and I think well, I'll, le I'll leave it at this point, but I will get back to the member for O'Connor if there is a different answer. Uh, the, the chief government whip on indulgence. Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, the uh, Leader of the House and the Manager of op Opposition Business have already commented about the leaving of Tony Levy, the parliamentary liaison officer, who has occupied the job for four years. Um, he is uh, uh, at the heart of uh, seeing legislation flow through the uh, chamber, responsible for ministers and uh, bills and uh, being on time and in the chamber. He's um, got a thankless task in trying to talk to both uh, whips to ensure uh, how long their speaking lists are and uh, how quickly legislation can get through. Uh, Tony, in his four years, I think has done uh, an outstanding job. He certainly has the respect uh, um, uh, of us all. We thank him for his uh, great contribution. And like so many uh, uh, people in this uh, uh, House of Representatives, we are totally dependent uh, on them, uh, the way in which they do their job, their high standards for us being able to do ours. I thank him and uh, I wish uh, Glenda every consideration um, when she will become uh, his boss when he uh, uh, departs this place. The Chief Opposition Whip. Speaker, I'd like to add my comments on behalf of the Opposition to, uh, to uh, congratulate Tony. Uh, leave you on his uh, retirement. I uh, happen to have known Tony since I, he and I were in our early 20s <clears throat> as young blokes in hostels around Canberra. And uh, I assure you that Tony has always been a nice, quiet, gentle sort of person who does, like me, <laughs> who does his job uh, to the best of his ability. And uh, the, um, uh, being in opposition, our task is made a lot easier by the service that Tony provides us, and I join the Chief Opposition Whip in wishing him all the best for his future. Thank you. Order, I indicated on Tuesday, oh, the National Party Whip, the member for Riverina. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. On behalf of the Nationals and as part of the Opposition, and formally as, uh, as the Nationals Whip in government, um, I would like to take the opportunity to make some kind comments about Tony Levy and his service. His, um, his service has been absolutely extraordinary. He's an extremely competent um, worker and has always made the, the task of the whips much, much easier by the, his actions. Um, I also uh, wish his wife the very best 
um, in her um, in, in Tony's retirement. And I think that's um, one of those most extraordinary cases whereby I'm sure that there's got to be some new ground determined um, in the household when one, when one retires. But uh, from the Nationals and on behalf of uh, the previous whips, uh, Tony, thank you very much for the service that you have provided to us always. Thank you. I join with the comments made by the Leader of the House and the Member for Cowper on Tuesday and the Chief, Government whip, the Chief Opposition Whip and the member for Riverina on behalf of the National Party today. The admission by the member for Fairfax that he knew uh, Tony in his 20s explains a lot, and I wish I'd known that earlier. But in all seriousness, the position that um, Tony Levy holds as the PLO, I should explain, the Parliamentary Liaison <laughs> Officer, is a very important bridge between the parliament and executive government and he um, has followed in a great line of occupants of that position that have ensured that things have run smoothly, that's, that there's a recognition that from time to time there are different uh, priorities of this institution, but that we are here to make sure that those things that I wish to be achieved through the parliamentary program are achieved. And I congratulate him and thank him. I apologise that I'm amongst one, uh, one or two people around here that have perhaps compared him unfairly to some of his predecessors, but I think that he has done the job with great distinction, as we would expect of officers of the Australian Public Service and, in particular, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And I wish Tony all the best for his uh, retirement, capital R through T. The, oh, sorry, the member for Aston with question to me, I think. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I have a question to you where I seek your help and advice. Uh, earlier in the week I was making some remarks in the chamber and I made a direct quote from the Prime Minister where, 12 days before the election on 4BC Radio, the Prime Minister said that he would not change the superannuation laws one jot or one tittle. I have received um, uh, on Hansard I saw that the word tittle had been replaced with the word tittle. I sought to advise Hansard that, in fact, the word that the Prime Minister had used was tittle. Hansard have refused to correct that, being a direct quote of the Prime Minister. They have said that the word the Prime Minister used is not a correct word. Mr Speaker, I'm sure that our PM would not use an incorrect word, and I, I would seek your help to change Hansard so it reflects the direct quote Order. that the Prime Minister would not change the laws of superannuation, Order. one I jot, one tittle. Order. I will take advice on the matter raised by the member for Aston. The Minister for Foreign Affairs has some papers. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated by honourable members earlier today. Full details, details of the documents will be recorded in the votes and proceedings in Hansard. Order. I wish to address the matter of privilege raised by the member for Sturt. Yesterday, the member for Sturt raised as a matter of privilege references made by ministers to the role that members have made in making representation about and being involved in infrastructure projects in their electorates. The member claimed that members would be intimidated from becoming involved in such activities as a result of the references in the House thus interfering with the performance of their duties as members. The member for Sturt also referred to particular electorates being disadvantaged by the government's administration of the decision-making about infrastructure projects. I have had the opportunity to reflect on the matters raised by the member and to re refer to precedents. In relation to the first matter raised by the member, the alleged interference with members, a relatively similar matter was raised in 2006. The then Leader of the Opposition and the members for Ballarat and Chisholm raised matters of privilege following references made during question time by the then Minister for Education. The Minister had made references to representation she had from, she had from opposition members under the Investing in Our Schools program. The member for Ballarat alleged that the references impeded her ability to communicate with and represent her constituents. 
In response to this complaint, the Speaker noted that there was no evidence that the references made by the minister were designed to interfere with the ability of members to raise such matters in the future and, as a result, a prima facie case of a breach of privilege had not been made out. In this case, the matters referred to by the member for Sturt may be seen to be part of a similarly robust political debate and, on the information presented, as not, cons as not cons constituting improper interference with members continuing to perform their duties in representing their constituents. In relation to the possible differential treatment of members in relation to infrastructure projects, I refer my, to my comments about the matter of privilege raised by the member for Sturt earlier this year concerning invitations to members to participate in openings of projects in their electorates. As I noted, these are government programs and are matters for the government to administer. Unless there is evidence that such administration amounts to an improper interference with members performing their duties as members within their electorates, having regard to the precedence in such matters, it is not easy to see that a matter of privilege arises. I do not see evidence of such interference in the matters raised by the member for Sturt. For these reasons, and having regard to the long-established policy of restraint in matters of privilege and contempt, I do not consider a prima facie case has been made such as would warrant precedence being given to a motion in respect of this matter. The member for Sturt. On indulgence, Mr Speaker, I thank you for the consideration of the matter of privilege which I raised yesterday and thank you for your speedy response. Uh, before taking the matter any further, I will of course uh, consider your uh, sage advice and take advice from uh, my colleagues and uh, if we wish to pursue it, we'll obviously have the opportunity to do so next week. The Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I ask leave of the House to make a ministerial statement relating to North Korea. Oh, is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. The Minister Thank for Foreign you, Affairs. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, I wish to update the House on developments following North Korea's underground nuclear tests and its further threats and provocations. Though verification work is proceeding, Australia and the international community have little doubt that a nuclear test occurred on 25 May. Australia remains very gravely concerned by this development and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea's subsequent missile tests, which have the potential to directly affect Australia's national security. I repeat the Australian government's view that this was an unacceptable, provocative and destabilising act by North Korea. Mr Speaker, I note with concern reports that North Korea has issued statements to the effect that, following the Republic of Korea's accession to the Proliferation Security Initiative, North Korea would no longer be bound by the 1953 Korean War Armistice Agreement. Mr Speaker, while Australia does not propose to respond to every statement by North Korea, no matter how threatening or provocative, this statement is of course completely unjustified and unjustifiable on North Korea's part. These statements and North Korea's threats of military action do nothing to enhance its security and leave it increasingly isolated. Any act of aggression by North Korea would of course be a breach of the United Nations Charter. Australia welcomes the Republic of Korea's decision on 26 May to become a full member of the Proliferation Security Initiative, now composed of more than 90 nations. And Australia strongly supports the United States, Japan and the Republic of Korea in working with the international community to respond to this major security threat. Australia reiterates its strong condemnation of North Korea's actions unanimously condemned by the United Nations Security Council. North Korea's nuclear test is a clear breach of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1718. It is in flagrant disregard of North Korea's international obligations. Madam Deputy Speaker, as I said to the House on Monday, there is only one option for North Korea. It should immediately desist from all of these provocative acts. It should immediately comply with United Nations Security Council resolutions, in particular Resolution 1718, and it should immediately resume, resume the six-party talks. Both the Prime Minister and I are consulting our counterparts on the international response. The Prime Minister has spoken to his Japanese and Republic of Korean counterparts, as well as to the United Nations Secretary General. I spoke on the 26th of May to United States Secretary of State Clinton to express Australia's resolve to work with the United States to get North Korea to denuclearise and resume the six-party talks. 
I have also spoken to my South Korean counterpart, Foreign Minister Yu, and I am scheduled to speak to Japan's Foreign Minister Nakasone tomorrow. Australia will also continue to work with China and others to send a united message to North Korea over its provocative actions. At my instructions, Australia's mission to the United Nations is also working to encourage a strong new Security Council resolution with new and additional measures against North Korea. Work is proceeding at the United Nations and we expect a new resolution to emerge in the near future. Australia already has strong sanctions in place against North Korea following North Korea's 2006 nuclear test. Australia has fully implemented the sanctions under United Nations Security Council Resolution 1718. The sanction regime requires a ban on the supply to and procurement from North Korea of certain military items and associated training, advice and services, a ban on specified goods and related services with an application to the development of weapons of mass destruction and the means for their delivery, and a ban on the supply to North Korea of luxury goods. Madam Deputy Speaker, in addition to fully implementing these sanctions, Australia has a visa ban that applies to North Korean nationals. North Korean flag ships are banned from entering Australia and bilateral aid is suspended. Given the suffering of the North Korean people, Australia continues to provide emergency humanitarian aid through United Nation, Nations agencies and the International Committee of the Red Cross. Madam Deputy Speaker, North Korea's recent actions its nuclear test, further missile tests and threatening language pose a very serious threat to regional and world security. Its action have breached international norms of behaviour. To ignore North Korea's behaviour would undermine the credibility of the United Nations. It would send the wrong signal to others about the international community's steadfast commitment to preventing the further proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. The international community has no option but to respond very firmly to North Korea's actions. That is why Australia is calling for new targeted sanctions to be imposed on North Korea and for the United, States, United Nations Security Council to work to ensure that United Nations members implement new sanctions together with full implementation of previous sanctions that have been imposed on North Korea, including through Resolution 1718. Madam Deputy Speaker, North Korea is a particularly complex international security problem. It is a closed society, one seemingly impervious to international community concerns or the desperate plight of its own people. We have, unfortunately, become accustomed to North Korea's provocative, belligerent threats. The international community should not, of course, overreact. North Korea has engaged in this sort of brinkmanship before. It is in Australia's and international community's interest to ensure that the door is left open for dialogue with North Korea. Australia is not starry-eyed about this, but the eventual resumption of dialogue is something we need to work towards. Australia will continue to support our key partners, including the United States, Japan and the Republic of Korea, in their efforts to get North Korea back to the path of dialogue. There is already a mechanism in place for dialogue with North Korea a mechanism that is strongly supported by Australia and the international community. That mechanism, of course, is the six-party talks involving the United States, China, Russia, Japan, the Republic of Korea and North Korea. This is the avenue for the North Korean regime to ensure its own security. The only way to create better opportunities and to improve the lives of its starving population is by the regime in North Korea returning to conformity with United Nations Security Council resolutions and by North Korea engaging in serious dialogue. North Korea needs to recommit to and implement the commitments towards denuclearization that it has already made through the six-party talks. Madam, Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, as the Prime Minister said yesterday, and I quote, North Korea's nuclear weapons and ballistic missile programs are an increasing threat to regional security and represent an emerging threat to Australia's national security. Australia is determined to play its part at the United Nations with its friends and partners to respond to this major international security threat. Minister for Foreign Affairs. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, I ask leave of the House to move a motion to enable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition to speak for a period of seven minutes. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There is no objection to leave is granted. The Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition speaking in reply to the ministerial statement for a period not exceeding seven minutes.
The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. As a result of the extremely provocative acts of North Korea this week, there is now a new and disturbing security landscape in Northeast Asia. The decision of the North Korean military regime to detonate a nuclear device earlier this week was particularly provocative after its test firing of a long-range missile in early April. It is deeply concerning to read reports that North Korea has raised the level of its rhetoric, saying it is no longer bound by the terms of the armistice that ended the Korean War in 1953. North Korea has subsequently threatened a military strike against South Korea. It is also reported to have restarted its nuclear reprocessing plant to produce additional weapons-grade plutonium and has fired numerous short-range missiles. These actions represent a direct challenge to the authority of the United Nations. The ballistic missile and nuclear tests are a clear breach of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1718 of 2006, which demands that the Democratic People's Republic of Korea not conduct any further nuclear test or launch any ballistic missile. The resolution was passed in response to North Korea's first nuclear test in October 2006, and it was absolutely clear in its requirement that North Korea desist from any further development of nuclear weapons. The Security Council has previously described North Korea's nuclear weapons program as having the potential to destabilise the region and beyond. And while the world is understandably focused on North Korea and the necessity for a multilateral response, our focus and support must also go to our close ally Japan and our strong strategic and trading partner South Korea. Seoul is only 30 kilometres from the border with North Korea and would bear the brunt of any military outburst from the north. And there are still around 28,000 United States troops stationed in South Korea. This morning, the US-South Korea Combined Forces Command was placed on higher alert and surveillance over North Korea is to be upgraded in response to the nuclear and missile tests and threats of war. Japan has been placed in an extraordinarily difficult security position by the actions of North Korea. It is bound by its long-standing interpretation of constitutional non-aggression to only develop military defensive capability. It is now forced to grapple with the consequences of North Korea actively pursuing nuclear weapons capability, which may well mean a shift in Japan's military stance. Tokyo is planning a stronger quarantine strategy against North Korea to end all trade with that country. Seoul has joined the Proliferation Security Initiative, a US-led initiative with 90 member countries designed to stop the spread of weapons of mass destruction. For the people of democratic South Korea, North Korea's bellicose talk of turning Seoul into a sea of fire has meant a life forever on the edge, with the fear that the conventional threat posed by one of the highest concentrations anywhere in the world of artillery, rockets and missiles will one day be superseded by the threats of weapons of mass destruction. Madam Deputy Speaker, North Korea's delinquency is highlighted by the fact that this regime is responsible for the only two nuclear explosions in the 21st century. The North Korean investment involved in embarking on a nuclear weapons development program is immense, and the impact on regional security and stability is profound. The costs imposed on the peoples of the Korean Peninsula in particular have been cruel in the extreme. The diversion of North Korea's meagre resources to the regime's efforts to acquire this weapons technology has robbed a beleaguered people of their basic needs of decent food and decent shelter. Australia has a direct stake in the denuclearisation of the Korean Peninsula as a critical element in the interests of longer-term peace and stability in our region. We do look to China as North Korea's major trading partner, but also as a responsible stakeholder in the region to bring maximum pressure to bear on the North Korean regime to comply with its international obligations, in particular the unanimous call by the Security Council for North Korea to abide by Resolution 1718. It would be a mistake for these latest developments to simply be dismissed as a repeat of a familiar cycle of alarmist statements and threats. Now, while there is an element of Groundhog Day about North Korea's behaviour. We've been down this path before the threat crisis response cycle. 
It is important that the international community ensure that the military regime is not rewarded for its provocative behaviour. In the past, there has been a carrots and sticks approach to negotiating with North Korea. Provocative behaviour by North Korea has, in the past, been successful in eliciting concessions and incentives. In exchange for concessions, North Korea has repeatedly promised to halt development of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles, but North Korea has failed to honour these commitments in the past and cannot be trusted to honour future commitments. The Security Council has said it will work to develop a new legally binding resolution with regard to North Korea. The coalition is of the view that all members of the international community should refocus efforts to enforce the provisions of Resolution 1718, fully enforce the existing provisions. The calls for additional sanctions must consider past events in terms of the most effective approaches in dealing with North Korea. For example, the United States imposed strict financial sanctions in 2005 and targeted a bank in Macau, the Banco Delta Asia, that was alleged to have been involved in money laundering and other activities that supported the North Korean regime. The United States sanctions are reported to have effectively crippled that bank and brought pressure to bear on the regime. And many analysts have also pointed to the greater willingness of North Korea to resume the six-party talks in the wake of that action. So that raises the prospect that similar actions to limit North Korea's access to finance through banking and corporate sanctions should be considered again, and the coalition would urge that the Security Council consider such sanctions. The coalition condemns the actions of North Korea. The coalition stands with our allies, the United States and Japan, with South Korea and the international community in finding a resolution that encourages the Security Council to develop a strong framework to deal with North Korea that includes further sanctions. The coalition calls for the full and proper enforcement of all sanctions currently contained in Security Council Resolution 1718, and the coalition supports the call for the six-party talks to recommence to see if diplomatic Members engagement can divert this game of brinkmanship and defuse the latest frightening expired. scenario being played. I have received a letter from the Honourable Member for Flinders proposing that a definite matter of public importance be submitted to the House for discussion, namely the government's failure in its administration of environmental programs. I call upon those members who approve of the proposed discussion to rise in their place. The Member for Flinders. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, on Sunday we read that the Minister for the Environment had harpooned his own whaling envoy. Today we're, hearing, today we're hearing porkies over parrots. Let me deal with both of these issues under the general question of a minister's duty to administer his portfolio with a moderate degree of competence and in Australia's national interests. What have we heard just today from Senate estimates? I want to take the House firstly through Senate estimates and secondly through what occurred in question time today. From Senate estimates on the question of the, uh, the poor whaling envoy who has been harpooned, we know that the envoy's contract was only ever until March, and yet it was denied as such. The envoy was promised, not in 2009, not in 2008, but on December 17, 2007. Was the envoy appointed in January? or February, or March, or May, or April, or June, or July, not even August, not even September, but in October 2008. Wow. <laughs> and what had happened in the meantime on this grand whaling issue, which had been promised, where we'd been told there would be action, what we saw is very simple. The ships were late. They spent the summer in the port at Fremantle before arriving for the tail end of the season. They missed the action. The planes never flew, other than for a couple of flights where they made no contact with the principal Japanese whaling fleet. The envoy was missing in action. We'll be back, my friend. The envoy was missing in action. But then we go, then we go to something very simple. This minister's promise on eight occasions through himself and his friends to bring a case before the International Whaling Commission. Quote, 20th of May 2005. Our challenge to the Howard government is to prepare a case now for the International Court of Justice, which will bring the international public spotlight on Japan's claims. On the 24th of May 2005, 
somebody who now occupies the Prime Minister's chair. The Howard government must initiate a case against Japan in the International Court of Justice. Mr Rudd and Mr Albanese on the 19th of June 2005. The IWC will not stop the slaughter. It goes on. The 20th of June 2005. The Howard government should take Japan to the International Court of Justice to end the barbaric slaughter of whales once and for all. The 18th of July 2005. Must act immediately to take Japan to the International Court of Justice. The 19th of May 2007. The minister's own words, take Japan to international courts such as the International Court of Justice or the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea to end the slaughter of whales. Peter's the milly vanilli of the politics. The 20th of May 2007, the words, but doesn't do the action. take Japan and any other, court, uh, any other country necessary to court in the International Court of Justice. Vanilli, that's what this the 20th of May 2007, <laughs> the IWC has not worked. And so they appointed an envoy to go to the IWC. But what have we found today? What have we found today in Senate estimates? Not only was the contract initially for six months, we had a, a, a six-month envoy one year late. We've also found $1,800 per day, and I don't begrudge him his per diem. Total fees, 79,000. Total flights, 80,000. Additional costs of others, it all adds up to about 309000 And now under pressure, now under pressure, it seems they may extend it for another three months. But here's the rub. The whaling envoy, for whom 300000 has been paid, for whom an international court case has been abandoned, isn't going to go to the International Whaling Commission. No, the whaling envoy doesn't go to the International Whaling Commission. What about that, My advice is I send the whaling envoy and leave the minister at home, because this is ultimately about who gets the job done. And we had a minister who promised, not just once, but through himself and his colleagues, not just twice, three, four, five, six or seven times, but on eight occasions that Australia under their leadership would take Japan to the International Court of Justice. Strangely, it never happened. All of these other things never happened. And yet now we see that for all the money they've spent on an international whaling envoy whose personal credentials I don't disparage at all, for all of that money the envoy isn't going to the International Whaling Commission meeting. What an extraordinary situation. So we have a promise, a pledge, a commitment, and ultimately, ultimately what we have is a failure, a deception, a distortion, an abandonment, and an international whaling envoy who doesn't go to the International Whale Commission, but whose contract, but whose contract is being extended so as to deal with the Sunday Telegraph headline. And just in case, just in case anybody missed it, the Sunday Telegraph headline sums it up very nicely. The editorial, Garrett betrays the whales. And the article, after eight months, Garrett acts as whale envoy, breach of promise. Breach of promise, betrays the whales. Never can we say that it has been better nor more succinctly summarised. But that's only one part of today's news. What we also saw was a very significant beginning. And I say significant because we raised the issue of what was said on the floor of this parliament in this chamber in question time on the 12th of May. I would guess that we have not heard the last of this issue. I would just say, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but I suspect we haven't heard the last of this issue. Because what the minister said to this house in this place on the 12th of May was very simple. When he was asked, when he was asked during question time in relation to logging activities in the New South Wales Central Murray Forests, he stated, it is particularly important for me to confirm that no stop work order has been issued by the department. Now that was clear, it was simple, it was categorical. We took him at his word. No stop work order has been issued. It wasn't even was ever. It wasn't, it, this was an issue about it hasn't happened. And we, 
we look at what was the case. Because in this letter from an assistant secretary in the minister's mm. own department, what we see very simply is something slightly different. In this letter from the assistant secretary of his department, dated the 1st of May 2009, 11 days before he stated that no stop work order has been issued, there were a few inconvenient phrases. And I say inconvenient because <laughs> in the letter addressed to the Murray-Darling area manager of Forest New South Wales, what we find is that the department has made the following statement as to what must happen. By the 31st of May 2009, Cessation of the use of Australian group selection across the southwest New South Wales Murray Mildura management area. Wow. That's one. But then, even more expressly, by the 31st of May 2009, cessation of all harvesting operations. I just will read that. Of all harvesting operations in the central Murray State Forest Ramsar site until further advice from the department or referral of the wider operations. Down tools to me. Now, in anyone's language, this was a stop work order. Yeah. Unless, of course, the cessation is not a stop. No. That, was a pause. It was uh, that is a bit perhaps like a temporary deficit. Yeah. But what we have is a cessation, a stop work order, and we have a denial that any such order was ever issued. Now, this, of course, was preliminary, because if this didn't happen, we're told everything anywhere would also be stopped. So it was clear and categorical that these activities must be stopped, and they must be stopped by the 31st of May, because if they are not stopped, we will stop everything. I discussed this with the Leader of the Opposition. We looked at the idea of, from him as a former environment minister of what is a stop work order. He, he looked at it. He knew it. He knows this type of thing. He used to issue them. He said, oh, we've got a stop work order here. I had, to do, I had to look at these things. I recognise that type of action. It's a legally binding commitment. It is a statement from one tier of government to another. It's a statement from the minister through his department. But more than that, he didn't deny that it was himself. He denied that even his department had issued a stop work order. And yet we see that this letter, this piece of evidence shows that a cessation of work was ordered by the 31st of May. Say, and that is clear, that is absolute, it is without doubt a stop work order. Yeah. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, I would simply make this point. What we have seen today is not just a whale envoy who has been harpooned, but we have seen porkies over parrots and we have seen a minister place his future on the line because we will return to this issue. That's right. And you may well look very carefully at the transcript over the weekend, over the coming week. But let us be clear that this minister has made statements to this House which are clearly and categorically I untrue. Propose to, oh, it being 4.30, the debate is interrupted. I call the minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I move, I move that the House resume at 10am on Monday, the 1st of June. I thank the Minister. It being 4.30, I propose that the, oh, sorry, I need to put my apologies. The question is that the motion moved by the Minister be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. It being 4.30, I propose the question that the House do now adjourn. I call the member for Canning. Thank you. This evening I wish to raise the debacle that is the Perth Airport and the likelihood that significant and long overdue developments will be strung out. I've raised this matter repeatedly with the Minister for Infrastructure, the Prime Minister, the Airport Operators, West Australia Airports Commission, with Qantas and the Coalition when, when in government, and I'm raising it again now. While the draft 2009 Perth Airport Master Plan was reduced last week, produced last week, all indications suggest the planned $1 billion overhaul could be delayed by at least five years, supposedly as a result of the credit crunch which has ravaged Australia Airports Corporation's investments. Like many Perth travellers, I have been eagerly anticipating the redevelopment of the third world Perth Airport that the WAC aptly named Vision for the Future. That's, that's it in a point. It's a mirage. The truth is that I shouldn't have to have this debate now. 
If WAC hadn't been asleep at the wheel, major upgrades wouldn't be in this cloud of doubt. When passenger movements and aircraft traffic was on the up and up a decade ago and even five years ago, this is when they should have had liftoff. Yeah. It's no secret that the airport is shambolic. Only 64 per cent of flights leave Perth Airport on time. This means that more than one third obviously don't. The morning log jam is, a phenomenal, is phenomenal, with 70 aircraft taking off between 5 a.m. and 7 a.m. There are frequent uh, traffic jams on the tarmac where passengers often have to disembark because there's little open space and few gates. The 2009 master plan extends the time frame for major domestic and international terminal consolidation from between five and seven years to more now than 10 years. To the Australian last week, the WAC CEO, Mr Geeches, con conceded that there would be some issues meeting their own time frames. He said, certainly when we announced our plans um, were flat strap and the middle of a historic period of growth and boom condition in Western Australia. And when pressed for giving time frames, we said we expected five to seven years. No, no, there's no doubt that this there will be a softening. This softening will cause that to slip to, uh, to some degree. Airport executives had said they are making arrangements to move forward. However, international ratings agency Moody said that they, the time frame for merging the domestic and international terminals could expand to well beyond the plan to. 2013 stating that major capital expansion in the absence of an improvement in market conditions and agreement with airlines is not expected to occur as it should as it could pressure the WAC's credit rating. The financial crisis is just a convenient excuse. Not only am I concerned about the delays to redevelopment, but under the circumstance that it appears when or if plans proceed, they could be significantly watered down. When Australia unveiled its redevelopment plans after some sharp criticism from coalition members and the former WA Labor Premier Alan Carpenter, there were grand plans that it was to be among the best airports in the Asia-Pacific region. Recently, the West Australian newspaper reported that it could be now a C-class airport, which is the minimum standard rating for under the International Air Tra Transport Association standards. Originally, it was to have 44 air bridges, aero bridges. Now the terminal will have only 20 to 25 in its plans. That means passengers will continue to walk to their aircraft on the tar tarmac in all sorts of weather conditions. While investment performance may be lacklustre, airports are profitable, maybe because airports like Perth are uh, gorging on commercial property development than rather than on the core business of aviation services. Perth Airport is another is a money maker. In the financial year to June 2008, the airport recorded a profit of 84 million or 84 and a half million, an increase of more than 45 per cent on the previous year. Perhaps the beneficial owners and Chairman David Crawford are trousering the profits rather than reinvesting them back into the airport. I acknowledge that some improvements, in other words, Qantas's $50 million terminal upgrade, baggage carousels and parking, have been made at the domestic terminal. However, these are predominantly cosmetic and have not resolved the underlying problems of capacity. There is an increasing pressure on existing infrastructure and no real vigour from the owners to make the necessary changes. Now, both state and federal governments are committed to major investment in the surrounding road network, particularly Tonkin and Leach highways. WAC must come to the party. Surely the profits of a 99-year lease are enough incentive to keep these things moving. The airport owners need to provide a strict time frame for the redevelopment, including key progress indicators. I will be seeking advice on WAC's obligation under the current 99-year lease and the federal government's ability to enforce those obligations, or alternatively have their lease rescinded. It is now time the WAC will put on notice and by its own the admissions the WACCA regulations agrees with me. I call the member for Bonner. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, the electorate of Bonner, which takes in the southeast suburbs, southeast suburbs of Brisbane, is, I think, one of the most beautiful and biodiverse electorates that you would find in our three major metropolitan capital cities. It is uh, bordered by Moreton Bay, it's bordered by the Brisbane River, it contains several mountains and some pristine creek catchments. But undoubtedly the jewel in the crown of that electorate, Madam Deputy Speaker, is the magnificent sand island of Moreton Island. And that is why members in the House will appreciate that those of us who know and love that island so dearly were devastated when we saw the first images of the massive oil spill that had occurred on the 11th of March. 
the Pacific Adventurer uh, in the in the uh, in the in the bay at the time, or uh, sorry, off the off the island in the ocean at the time, Madam Deputy Speaker, lost 31 containers, causing approximately 270 tonnes of oil to leak into uh, the ocean and wash up on the pristine beaches of Morton Island. It was a dramatic sight, Madam Deputy Speaker, to see what are usually uh, beautiful white sands completely black and covered in oil. It was of grave concern and required an immediate but also practical and effective response, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I rise this evening to congratulate all of those who were involved in the clean-up of Morton Island, and I'm happy to say that as of the 11th of May, um, the beaches have been open to the public, and you would not know the devastation that had occurred only a couple of short months ago. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, of course, the 11th of March was also significant in Queensland because we were in the very final days of, an, of a state election campaign. It was unfortunate that, as a result of that, the oil spill on Morton Island, which should have required everybody's support, focus and attention, became a political football. And there were criticisms from members of the Liberal National Party at both the, lo at both the local and state level about the government's response. Madam Deputy Speaker, it is unfortunate that when these things occur, that people want to score political points. Not only do they actually take the time to become informed about the nature of the response. For a start, you were in uh, cyclonic conditions. The safety of any workers would have had to be paramount. Secondly, Madam Deputy Speaker, the oil was, was uh, washing up onto the beach. If you'd have gone in there straight away and removed it, inevitably you are also removing sand. You would have had more oil washing up on the beach, therefore more sand to be removed, and indeed the damage to the beaches would have been quite significant. It was a much more practical response, Madam Deputy Speaker, to in fact for all, wait for all of the oil to be washed up onto the beaches and thus begin what was an incredible clean-up operation. Madam Deputy Speaker, it is also a shame that when we have these political games played that it is, uh, it is fair cop for us as politicians to get involved in the argy-bargy, but unfortunately it is those people, those incredibly dedicated people, who are out there trying to, the, to do their best in these situations that feel the brunt of that criticism. They take it personally, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I know that. I have visited the island twice since the oil spill, and on both occasions I have discussed with the workers the incredible uh, efforts they have made, and all of them to a person uh, feel so proud of what they have achieved, but feel hurt and disappointed that they are being blamed for not cleaning up the beaches appropriately because of criticisms that were made. Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to particularly acknowledge Peter Keats, who was the incident control officer. I want to uh, acknowledge Adrian Hawes, who ran the incident room, uh, Jane Howard, the media officer, who obviously dealt with all of those difficult criticisms, Squirrel, who was a great guy out there driving trucks and uh, looking after the contamination area, Willie, the bobcat owner, and particularly Trevor Hassard, Madam Deputy Speaker, the manager of Tangaluma Resort. When you consider that he actually had to cope with 300 men billeted in his resort, um, often doubling up in rooms, they had to be fed, they had to be looked after, uh, and they had to be catered for, Madam Deputy Speaker, this was an incredible operation. You're on an island where the beaches can only be accessed by two sand roads. The men were taken over in buses on, uh, on very uh, sandy, the bumpy roads every day. I commend the operation expired. and those who now call the member for Barker. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Right now, there are thousands of households and businesses in my electorate trying to get by with unreliable and slow dial-up or impossibly expensive satellite internet. Broadband with high speed and low latency for them has become an impossible dream. It didn't have to be so. It was the Labor government which cancelled the Howard government $2 billion contract with Optus and Elders to deliver metro equivalent broadband services to regional and remote parts of our country, including, of course, in my own electorate. The vast improved services under that Opel contract would be online now if that contract had been upheld. 
families in rural and regional Australia would have been able to compete on an equal footing in business and education communications with those in the cities. Instead, halfway through this government's term, Labor hasn't done anything to improve broadband services in rural and regional Australia. If anything, it has made the situation worse, cancelling Opel and dissolving the $2.4 billion uh, communications fund, which was an in perpetuity fund to provide improved services to regional and rural Australia. As if the collapse of Labor's first national broadband project was not enough. Labor has committed itself to building a fibre to the premise network, which leaves more than two million people outside its latest broadband announcement. These two million uh, people are from rural and regional Australia, and specifically excludes towns and communities across Australia with fewer than 1,000 residents. Towns of my electorate, which we'll miss out, include Beachport, Lanchtown, Cadell, Callaghan, Cobdogla, uh, Canalpin. Kalangadu, Karunda, Lamaru, Lucendale, Meningi, Morgan, Mount Burr, Nangwari, Paringa, Penaru, Port Macdonald, Swan Reach, Tantanula, Tarpina, Tintanara, Truro and others. And we're not talking about outback towns. Some of them are just over an hour from Adelaide. It doesn't have to be so. Last week a young man whose parents live in Canalpin and my electorate wrote to me. He said that Canalpin, and I note that Canalpin is a small town with a population of just over 200 residents in a farming community. This young man put to me that just because a town is excluded by the Labor government from being part of its national broadband network on account of population, it is unacceptable acceptable that they be left to be put up with slow speeds, dial-up or even satellite broadband. And I don't deny that satellite has been a blessing for many farm families and communities. However, satellite broadband users miss out on many of the associated benefits of high-speed, low-latency broadband, including MSN, Skype, ABC, iView, etc. Certainly our young rural people can only envy these services already highly used by their city cousins. He further pointed out to me that private companies, Internode and Agile, have endeavoured to solve this problem by building infrastructure through the Coorong District region with low maintenance solar power transmitters which provide a wide reaching area. This is a great example of a local solution for a local problem. Internode started as a small company in the Coorong Communications Network providing ADSL2 Plus and naked the, uh, DSL access to small towns such as Canalpin, Titanara, Tailandbin and Meningi. These small companies have ensured that these towns can now receive ADSL at 22 megabits per second, a significant improvement. Simply put, the young man stated that there is no reason that the exchanges in the towns uh, I previously listed cannot have fibre to the exchange of similar uh, nature then provide a town-based copper broadband structure or implement a wireless alternative for those for whom that is not possible. I should add that under Opel many exchanges my electorate would have already been upgraded in exactly this matter, a manner. The point is, if a small company with limited resources can identify a problem and then solve it, why can't the Labor government do the same? Instead of denying regional communities the broadband service that they would have been receiving, this year under the Opel contract and then making them pay for the $43 billion uh, network, which won't reach them, why can't Labor come down from their ivory city towers and talk to companies who have made it happen? Who knows? They might learn something about communications for rural and regional Australia. The member for Fremantle. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Fremantle electorate encompasses or touches upon four local government areas. And while the shared name and historical importance of the city of Fremantle reflects the strong connection between the two, it is actually the city of Coburn that contributes the large share of the territory and population of the federal district. The municipal area of Coburn is located within the traditional land of the Noongar people, and it extends 15 kilometres inland from the exquisite coastal waters of Coburn Sound to the lee of the Darling Escarpment. Running north-south through the middle of Coburn, the Biliar Regional Park is comprised of a string of precious wetlands that runs from Lake Banganup to North Lake. I have previously spoken in this place about the community efforts to protect those wetlands, especially in the context of the state government's intention 
to resurrect the Frankenstein's monster that is Roe Highway Stage 8. Madam Deputy Speaker, the city of Coburn is not only one of the fastest developing localities in Western Australia, but in Australia as a whole. The current city population of approximately 80,000 is anticipated to grow to 90,700 by 2011 and to 102,600 by 2016. This growth has received a critical boost from the completion of the Perth to Mandurah rail line by the Gallup Carpenter Labor government. New suburban development and house construction in Coburn has flourished over the last decade as a result of this forward-looking and sustainable urban transport infrastructure. But rapid growth also brings with it the challenge of supporting that growth, and certainly the expansion in Coburn needs to be appropriately met by an expansion in services. As the member for Fremantle, I take it as one of my ongoing priorities to ensure that the growing southern and southeastern parts of my electorate are assisted with growth in services as they develop. To that end, in January, I wrote to the Minister for Human Services in relation to a petition of 10,000 signatures calling for a Medicare office to be established at the Coburn Central Shopping and Services Precinct. I have also argued, and will continue to argue, the case for locating an integrated primary health care centre at a site owned by the city of Coburn within the suburb of Success. Coburn is an area of identified need, with its ratio of GPs per head of population of 1 to 1,613, being significantly behind the national average of 1 to 1,403. The proposed site is well served by private and public transport and it would dovetail well with the new Fiona Stanley Hospital as an important addition to the area's existing and expanding health service needs. It is a greenfield site and I understand that with appropriate government support, the Coburn Central Primary Health Care Centre would be in a position to go ahead quickly towards full operation. Madam Deputy Speaker, as an area of new and rapid growth, it is of course understandable that Coburn is more exposed than other places to the vicissitudes of the current economic downturn. For that reason, I was pleased to be joined last month by the Prime Minister and the Minister for Employment Participation at a community jobs forum that was hosted very professionally by the city of Coburn. The Rudd government recognises that the southern metro region of WA is an area of serious economic impact in the current circumstances and the sighting of a local employment coordinator to cover this area, one of seven key locations identified across Australia is an important part of our response. As I said at the forum in April, this is a strong, resilient community and we will face this challenge together in partnership with government, with business, with employment and support agencies and with our neighbours, families and friends. Of course, the Rudd government's efforts to, grow both, to both grow and underpin employment through nation-building initiatives are taking effect in Coburn as they take effect right across Australia. In addition to the unprecedented local investment investment in school infrastructure, the support for installing installation and photovoltaic cells to households and the direct support for the city of Coburn itself, I am very pleased that $2 million will go to the construction of the Coogee Surf Life Saving Integrated Community Facility under the Regional and Local Community Infrastructure Program. All these measures represent immediate support for jobs and economic activity in Coburn and they take the form of long-term investment in the future of this community. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd like to conclude by noting that in October the City of Coburn will celebrate the 30th anniversary of achieving city status. It is a strong, diverse and dynamic community with a high level of engagement in its development and, I might say, in its governance. As a federal member, I am privileged to represent the people of Coburn and I look forward to celebrating their 30th birthday with them. The member for Calais. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, uh, I rise to uh, talk about a, uh, a very, very real person from the, uh, from the town of Ningen, or the, I should say the, uh, the Shire of Ningen, uh, called Denise Ward, who uh, was killed in a car accident uh, quite recently. Uh, Mrs Ward was a pillar of the, uh, the Ningen community um, and everybody who knew her, and that was certainly most people in the region, uh, was shattered by her loss. Uh, in that car accident, David and her and uh, and the family um, certainly have the sincere condolences of myself and everybody else who who knew them or who didn't know them but knew of them because they certainly uh, have always and I'm sure the family still will work tirelessly on behalf of of uh, the people of the region and uh, that would include. Uh, 
uh, in Denise's case, uh, working for what was used to be called the uh, Rural Lands Protection Board, the Country Women's Association, and indeed many other volunteer uh, groups in, the, uh, in our region. Denise was passionate about the economic and the social development of Ningen and the Bogan Shire, uh, and was one of those people who was always willing to stand up and put a hand up, and it's a funny thing that the people who do that seem to get asked to do it all the time, and Denise was someone who did not, uh, who did not avoid it. She was always willing to help out with her friends, her neighbours, the general community, uh, and she never looked as people like her quite often never do, any kudos, uh, but she always said good things about people rather than bad. Her passing is an incredibly sad loss to not just to the people of the Ningen town and the Ningen Shire, but to Western New South Wales and Australia in general. Deputy Speaker, uh, I also wish to talk about an issue which is um, a, a, of great uh, import to everybody in regional Australia, but it, it particularly uh, in, in some of my country in the West, and that is communications. You know, regional communications uh, have been billeted again. Uh, not long ago, we had uh, we had the then new government uh, renege on a contract with Optus, which uh, would have provided to almost everybody, 98% of Australians, broadband. But uh, just in, uh, during the estimates this week, it, it was revealed that the 400 million interest earned by the former communications fund, which is set up to, uh, to earn interest to be spent on, uh, on maintaining and coming, keeping uh, regional Australia in touch with uh, the latest developments. Uh, and the interest was promised by the Rudd government, just 75 million of that 400 million has been allocated to projects in response to the regional telecommunication review, while the rest has vanished into the entirely unrelated Building Australia Fund, which sometime in Never Neverland uh, is supposed to not uh, just uh, look after uh, Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane, but way beyond that, possibly by uh, 2025, perhaps may give uh, everyone except about 8 per cent of Australians in regional Australia some kind of broadband. Look, uh, Deputy Speaker, you know, we're talking at a time when uh, Kevin Rudd, uh, oh, sorry, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer are quite happy to run up a $315 billion debt. Um, they claim that the remaining $325 million in it that they mentioned in estimates uh, the remainder of that $400 million which was promised to regional communications, they claim that is coming. But it is unbudgeted, and they do not know when it will come, yet we should hold our breath and wait for it. Deputy Speaker, regional Australia has been done over on this like it has been done over on water, like it has been done over on infrastructure generally. The member for Blair. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. On the 15th of May this year, I was pleased to host the Jobs Forum in Ipswich at Ipswich Region Community Church. Present at that occasion was the Prime Minister of Australia, the Honourable Kevin Rudd, uh, the Minister for Employment and Participation, the Honourable Brendan O'Connor, uh, Jason Clare, the Federal Member for Blacksland, the Prime Minister's Special Advisor on Jobs, also the Member for Oxley. Uh, the member for Ford and the member for Rankin, who happens to be also the Minister for Small Business, Independent Contractors and the Service Economy. And it was a jobs forum concerning Ipswich and Logan. There's a lot of parallels between Ipswich and Logan. They're both on the southwest side of, of Brisbane. And the communities are very similar in ethics and ethos and in the experiences they've had in terms of development and infrastructure and in terms of uh, uh, their progress and the challenges they each face at the time. But both of those communities are determined to unite together and work together to combat the challenges we face locally as a result of the global recession. And I'm convinced that the compassion, the commitment and the common sense of the people of Ipswich and Logan will survive and prosper and ensure that the effects 
of the global recession locally will be mitigated. I thank the Prime Minister and also the Treasurer who came to the Ipswich motorway near the Centenary Roundabout. Now, at the Jobs Forum, there were many people, business leaders, union leaders, members of the council, both Logan and Ipswich, and also young people from the various schools. I was pleased that they could come. I was also pleased to see members of the not-for-profit sector and the church and charitable institutions of Ipswich and Logan who make such a vital contribution and are at the front line of dealing with people and families and businesses who are facing difficulties, conflict and challenge in their everyday lives. I want to commend Senior Pastor Mark Edwards and the Ipswich Region Community Church for the wonderful work they do in my community of Ipswich. They, together with other churches, make an important contribution in the lives of people of the city of Ipswich. As I said, uh, Deputy Speaker, the greatest manifestation of the government's commitment to nation building for recovery and the nation building and jobs plan in my local community is the upgrading of the Ipswich motorway. So we're pleased that the Prime Minister has seen fit to employ an interim a local employment coordinator, Samantha Wilson, from Dewa to help in Logan and Ipswich. But I was very pleased that the Prime Minister and the Treasurer came, in fact, to the Ipswich motorway and had a look at the construction that's going on there. The motorway is being upgraded in three stages at the moment. The first stage, of course, was the Goodna to Wacol section, which will be completed by the middle of this year, then the Wacol to Dara by the end of next year and the Dinmore to Goodna, which at the moment is having preliminary construction taking place and activities, but will be formally under construction in a real and serious and determined way by the middle of this year. Now, the Ipswich motorway forms part of the government's network road freight corridor known as Network One. It's an $884 million commitment for additional works this year. That's what we're doing. We're investing money locally and thousands of jobs are being created. It was interesting for me to note yesterday the Queensland Minister for Main Roads, the Honourable Craig Wallace, uh, announced that as part of the motorway upgrade, the area near where the Prime Minister and the Treasurer were that day and, and looking and talking uh, with the workers there and, and the various people who are transforming the Western Corridor, the Centenary Roundabout will be further advanced in terms of the uh, replacement of what could only be described as a very ordinary roundabout that connects Ipswich, Springfield, Forest Lake and Brisbane. We're going to see that whole area replaced by a multi-level free-flowing interchange. And I'm pleased that that's about to take place and the work on that to enable that to happen will really commence on the weekend coming up on the 12th to the 15th of June. I'm sure the member for Oxley, who's campaigned with me for so long on this issue, will be absolutely delighted. I commend all those people involved in the construction, of the course the, uh, the government, federal and state expired. and the companies involved. The question is that the House do now adjourn. All of those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The House stands adjourned until 10 a.m. next Monday in accordance with the resolution agreed to earlier this day.